Manus flat on the canvas. We are ready to rock and roll. Second round of action. There is a cut on Manus. Yeah. It's just My man B Hop got knocked out, dropped out the ring last night. <laughs> <laughs> I need a little judo baby. I need me a little judo baby. And uh, let's, let's do it, Ron. Let's do it. You see what they're doing? That's got face for video. That's got face for video. That's nice. Martial arts. Chat. Martial arts. Chat. Hello and welcome to the Martial Arts Chat Podcast. On today's episode, arts, we're looking ahead to Valor's bare knuckle boxing event and we'll be speaking with all the big fighters from that card and Martial promoter arts, Ken yeah. Shamrock. Before we start the chat, just a quick shout out to our sponsors, A1 Fight Gear. A1 Fight Gear use the latest cutting edge boxing gloves for professional and amateur fighters, gym enthusiasts and kickboxers. Local and national gyms in the UK, do yourselves a favour, check out a1fightgear.com. If you want to get in shape, get back in shape, then go to bscare.co.uk. Use the coupon code Martial Arts Chat to save 15% off your purchases for core sliders, straps, barbell pads, complete strength and conditioning programs to suit your needs at all levels. We're also sponsored by Fuel Supreme. FuelSupreme.co.uk offers CBD oil and natural nutrition. They will assist your progress in diet and lifestyle, natural supplements, and complementary services such as yoga, mind coaching, and weight cutting programs. We're also sponsored by World of Martial Arts Television. Television. Womo.tv produces, finds, acquires, commissions and presents all you ever wanted to know about martial arts. Hi, my name's Chris Allen and this is the Martial Arts Chat Podcast. Today I'm being joined by one of the pioneers of the mixed martial arts world. He is the UFC Hall of Famer, Ken Shamrock. Ken, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. I, I tell you what, Ken, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to talk to you. Um, as every MMA fan out there may as well say, you've heard it a million times, you're one of the first people we saw compete in the sport. So thank you for giving up your time for everyone to listen to what you've got to say. Cool, man. I'm uh, very excited about um, our coming event with Valor. Yeah, so I'll tell you what, um, I know that's obviously one of our main talking points. Let's jump straight into that for it then. So first of all, um, what gave you initially gave you the idea to start a bare knuckle? Uh, let's first of all, just a generally an organization. Well, I remember back in the day when I first started out fighting, um, it was bare knuckle, no holes barred. Um, and I fell in love with it. I mean, it was just so, so pure. And it just being able to see two guys go in there and actually fight, man. And there were no rules. It was bare knuckle. And my adrenaline was through the roof. It was like, nothing that you could ever replace and i just fell in love with that and so competing in it was really uh you know almost a dream uh with the excitement and and the uh and the way that he went in to fight somebody it was so pure and then all of a sudden this guy tank gabbett comes in and puts on these four ounce gloves and starts knocking people out yeah and the organization said hey what a great idea um we'll be able to put gloves on guys and they'll be able to come back and fight the same night. You know, if they win and they knock somebody out, we don't got to worry about replacing them with an alternate because they bruised their hand or they fractured their hand or, or they did something to their hand and um, they can come back and fight that same night or, or a month later. So I just thought that in my mind, I was like, okay, yeah, that's made sense until I actually put the glove on and I started fighting with the glove and then I got it. I was like, this has nothing to do with making it safe for the fighters. It has to do with making it safe for the guys that are winning. Because yeah, right. when I put that glove on, man, I could hit guys everywhere in the head. I mean, just literally start drilling guys, not have to be very accurate, just start throwing bombs. And then um, I wouldn't hurt my hands, so I could actually come back and fight in an hour or a half hour. And so I realized at that time I didn't like it because I felt like it took away the purity of being tough it took away the purity of man against man yeah. whereas you didn't need equipment to make people tough you had to be tough you had to be a tough individual um without being able to put something on you to make you tougher and so for me i just i didn't like it and i always said to myself if i had the opportunity to change that i would and now obviously you've got the opportunity to do it um now you've seen obviously other organisations in are, are getting bigger and it's becoming a lot more you know a lot more watched a lot more appreciated. Does that is that what initially gave you the idea to push forward with Valor and you know start now opposed to a time before? Yeah, you know I've always uh, in my mind said that I wanted to make sure I got back to 
to bring bringing that bare knuckle back because I always felt like that was that was pure that was a rush and in, even in the beginning I always remembered people screaming stand them up stand them up uh, and so I just felt like you know when I started seeing the the direction of the social media sites where there was these street fights happening and you know, getting a million views and and then all of a sudden these different um, other promotions were popping up bare knuckle promotions were popping up over in England also here. And they were actually generating more viewerships than the actual MMA world was. And I said, you know what? It's time. Yeah. It's time to throw our hat over the fence. It's time for us to get involved, and it's time for us to to put on an organization, uh, and not just a bare knuckle organization, but Valor uh, Bare Knuckle, which in our perspective is about being very, very professionally run with great athletes in the ring, guys that belong there guys that are tough and guys that have honor and, uh, and be able to bring it from that dark to the light. I remember in the earlier days when UFC first came out and that no holes barred bare knuckle, it was kind of like that underground feeling. It was a spectacle, which is nothing wrong with that, but sooner or later, you've got to bring it from that spectacle into that respected combat sport. And I felt like in those earlier days, what I, which, which I was a part of, of being that spokesperson during that time, was trying to educate people on what it is they were watching and the understanding of what it was so that we could go ahead and rise above the spectacle and become professional combat sport. And so I think that's where we're at now, right now with the, with the bare knuckle is that it's at that, that, that stage of a spectacle where, where people want to watch it, but we've got to bring some professionalism to it, some respectable um, uh, rules in combat to it. So that we're able to, to launch ourselves uh, into that category of being a respectable combat league. So therefore, um, we put Valor together to do that. And we have a very well uh, professional team uh, from the top to the bottom. We've got the best fighters, I think, that we could have in a tournament. We went back to old school. Where we thought we'd crown our cha- champion in that tournament style type heavyweight yeah. tournament. So, well, I mean, like I said, it was something that we had really thought about. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that if we were getting into the bare knuckle, that we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just something we would throw together and that it would be just a We wanted to bring it to that respectable level, from the dark to the light. And, and the, do you feel like you've gone with the name, going with the name Valor, seeing as all the other organizations are all got the name Bare Knuckle actually in their title? Do you feel the name Valor, like you said, as well as being showing the honor and respect of it all, do you really feel that's going to help you stand out as well with the name? Yeah, I think that it's just no different than anything other sport. I mean, you have the actual event, which is obviously Bare Knuckle. But then at the same time, you've also got to brand your, your league. You can't just say, hey, we're we're bare knuckle fighting because that's just not a name. That's, that's what, that's what we're doing. Yeah. So I felt like we had to have a name that was going to match what we were doing. That would bring some professionalism, some respect to it. And I thought Valor was a great name. No, and I think so as well. It really stands out. And I love the design you've done with the logo for the company and everything like that. And obviously Ken, I'm not trying to blow your, blow your own trumpet here, but having a name such as yourself, you know, behind the organization, so how how's it been? You know, you haven't even had your first event, and how much interest do you get having being shown already? Because over in the UK, you know, we're we're talking about it already. Yeah, it's crazy too, because like um, I think it has to do with the team members we have and the connections that we all have gained over the eighty years of experience that we have combined in our team. There's a lot of connections there, and so therefore, when we when we decided to launch and start doing the the press releases and being able to show the fighters that we have and be able to have the connections to the different people when it comes to the direct TV dish network, all major cable companies. And then of course for, um, you know, digital, we got fight TV. So being able to have all those, that, that much experience on our team, um, we would be able to reach out and get a lot of attention because mm. of all the connections we have within our team. So I really believe that that's a team effort. We've all had our, part in making valor um as popular as it is up to this date without even even putting on a fight i know it's apps it's it's absolutely crazy and obviously in the uk um we're talking about it and we've got obviously some our, our guys going over there we've got mark godby you know the champion of bk the, U, the uk organization um we've got james mcsweeney you know legendary he was in the ufc um, in the ultimate fighter and things as well so it's great to see yeah. that we've got some of our guys going over there to try and make a name for themselves again 
Yeah, that was important too. We want to make sure that we have countries represented because bare knuckle uh, is a uh, universal um, uh, combat. So um, we, it was important for us to be able to showcase just people from different countries, but at the same time, different styles like for MMA, boxing, kickboxing. Um, so we just felt like it's an interesting concept when you look at it, at least for me, and I hope it is for everyone else, but it almost goes back to the earlier days of the UFC when, when uh, especially when I fought in it, um, it was bare knuckle, no rules, but you literally had style against style. Yeah. Well, this has got that same kind of thing to it because you've got a, you know, especially in our, our co-main event, we got a, a former uh, world champion pro boxer in Ishii Smith and Esteban Payne, who has got a uh, MMA, pretty good MMA resume. So when you look at that matchup, you've got really a boxer against an MMA guy. Yeah. Does that, which one is going to transition into bare knuckle? A lot of people say, well, I think it's going to be the boxer. Well, you got to remember this. It's fighting is about being able to not get hit. When you think about boxing, boxing is a, is a sport in which sometimes guys get hit and they just shake it off or they brush it off or they'll slip it. Yeah. Uh, you can't do that in bare knuckle. You can't take a jab in bare knuckle and then throw a combination after you take a jab. Um, it's just not going to happen like that because those jabs count a lot more than they do in boxing. So having those big, you know, eight ounce or, or, or 12 ounce gloves that you have on when you're boxing and you're able to slap punches away or be able to, you know, do the pickaboo with them and not have to move your feet as much when you get tired. Well, you can't do that in bare knuckle. So it's interesting to see whether or not. Uh, MMA translates into bare knuckle or boxing translates into bare knuckle. Yeah. So it's going to be fun to watch, like I said, because it's so new. <clears throat> you got guys that have 27 and four, or 30 and three or whatever, some crazy records in boxing and MMA, right? Yep. But when they walk into our event and they get up on that screen and they put their record up there, it's going to be O and O, or unless you're Mark Garvey, it will be two and O, right? But it's yeah. really, it's so young. It's like the early UFCs when guys were stepping in there. They were 0-0 or they were 2-1 and or they were 3-0. and It is crazy to see this happen over again with as much experience and as far as we've been when it comes to combat sports to now be back at 0-0 and again, starting something that I believe is just its own beast. Yeah. And it must be an amazing feeling for yourself because you were there the early days of, as you said, your bare knuckle fighting and the early days of the UFC. And now you're starting your journey – Again, but being a, a, what am I looking for? a promoter now of another great organization. And like you said, it's like the old days. Instead of karate against a wrestler, now we've got the MMA guy versus the boxer bare knuckle. And what people don't understand is with bare knuckle, like you explained, is you can't just throw anything. Because with bare knuckle, you have to be so pinpoint accurate. Otherwise, you're going to break bones, right? That's exactly right. Or or even if a guy like <clears throat> Ishi Smith, who's used to being able to do the picky boo and, and the glove slips in and it just touches them. It's no big deal, right? They just do the picky yeah. boo. Guys still body shots and they, they kind of sit there and they counter them. Well, in boxing, man, that's okay. But in, in uh, bare knuckle, man, you can't allow them to touch you because they are more, the hands are more effective uh, instantly uh, than they are in boxing because it can cause a cut or it can cause a bruise or you can actually break someone's jaw or break someone's nose or cut them over the eye. And these are all things that people look at instantly as being more dangerous. And mm. to me, it's funny. They're not funny, but it, it, it's just it, it's confusing to me, I guess I would put it, is that showing people that get cuts or broken noses or even broken jaws and all of a sudden people go, man, somebody's going to get killed in this sport. Yeah. It's just so uh, confusing to me that people look at that and all of a sudden they make that judgment. And the reality of it is this. He took 10 shots and he went down or he got cut. Or he got his jaw broke. Yeah. He didn't take 100 shots exactly. before he fell to the mat and got back up and withstood the punishment and then died. So this is a much different sport and event that people have to understand and be educated on what's happening. So I'm really excited, and it is our responsibility as promoters, to be able to educate the fans on what they're watching so that they have a better understanding of what it is so that they don't freak out when something like that happens. They really understand, oh, okay, well, it's a broken jaw. It'll heal, or it's a cut. It'll heal. There's a lot of blood, but it'll heal as yeah. opposed to 
10 years down the road, boxing or MMA, where you're taking 100 to 200 shots per fight, and then 10 years down the road, you can't remember who your kids are. So to me, I think the instant damage and stuff like that, that heals, which is the scar tissue and the bones, I would much rather as a fighter have to deal with rather than deal with brain damage. No, it's true. And what I find is really interesting, if you see the sort of timeline of event, um, timeline of events since the first UFCs, you know, everyone was boycotting UFC. It was banned in 49 states when you were competing in it still, you know, and, um, you know, everyone was like, oh, it's a blood sport. It's just street fighting, blah, blah, blah. Now look how well accepted the sport is, you know, MMA as a whole. People are starting putting their kids in it from an early age now. You know, back in the day, they would look, many people wouldn't think that, would they? No, and, it's, it, and that's where we're at right now with bare knuckles. Exactly. Is that when it happens in the ring, their first statement is going to be, see, I told you somebody's going to get hurt. Well, let me tell you something to all those people that say those things. It is a combat sport. And it will have some sort of accidents or people that happen to get hurt. It is a combat sport. Cool. It's like football or anything else you go into. There is a risk, but you minimize your risks. As a fighter or as a person getting in there, you look to see which ones that you look at and go, okay, which one minimizes my risk for the most damage? And me personally as a fighter, and I've done it all, I would much rather – have a career in bare knuckle than I ever would with a four ounce glove on or a boxing glove on. No, that's fair enough. And we know you're not someone to um we know you're not someone who likes to stop fighting and competing. You know, you're only competing a few years ago. You thought about doing it yourself again, Ken, or are you done with that now, the combat game? Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, like I said, I'm I'm president of uh, yep. Valor. Okay. All that means is that <laughs> I'm the <laughs> I'm the least valuable person when it comes to the knowledge of uh, how everything works. Um, I'm the one that is, uh, they put in front and does all the talking and they tell me what to say. And, uh, you know, and so I'm, I'm the character, but um, yeah, the guys behind me, you know, we've got a great team behind us and I'll tell you what, they're the ones that mastermind of putting the show on, getting every the pieces put together. Like I said, you know, we have gotten the direct TV dish network, all the major cable companies, and then, of course, digital was Fight TV. Man, we, the connections that we have on our team is just second to none. And that's the reason why we are where we are right now to this day. Everybody on our team has something to offer to make us better. Yeah, right. And they're definitely doing the right things because, as you said, you haven't even had one event yet. Um, everyone's already talking about it, you know, and, in, and we're all looking forward to it. And especially, as I said, in the UK, we, love, we can't wait to see our UK guys in there as well. You know, we're really going to be supporting them and definitely can't wait. So as you were talking about educating people about the bare knuckle world, um, for people who don't know about it as much yet, they've just seen the clips on YouTube or whatever, can you explain the rules of it? Like, so the rules of bare knuckle boxing compared to boxing, standard stand-up boxing? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go into the uh, details of it, but I can tell the you basics. what. Yeah. Yeah, our, ours will be this. There will be no tape on the hands, only on the wrist. I know a lot of these other organizations allow them to tape the thumb and up the hand. I feel that that's, that's not fair. I want God-given talent. I want guys to go in there and fight with their God-given ability. And I don't want any tape or anything in there that's going to make them better. You fight with what you got. If your hands are brittle, why are you in bare knuckle? You can't say you're a bare knuckle fighter if you can't fight with bare knuckle. To me, that's the crazy part when I look at guys that saying they fight bare knuckle and they're not fighting bare knuckle. They've got tape on their hands. And to me, that's not the same. So we want to make sure these guys uh, go in there and they fight and we get the toughest guys with the, with the God-given talent that go in there and can say, hey, I am the bare knuckle champion. And, and they are. And, and because of what the, how they're fighting and, and the way they're fighting, they are. So we got three three-minute rounds. Um, you know, We're not going to let them grab or hold or – or hold on to the head, or or to grab anybody. It, it, you, when you're in a clinch, man, you better not be holding on, or you're going to be warned. So we want guys okay. to be able to fight. We don't want them to hold on to them like they did in boxing, where they grab a head or they grab them, try to push them off, and all that other stuff. If you're in a clinch, man, you keep your hands closed, and then you can bump them with shoulders or whatever. Do that, but do not grab them because then that causes fingers to end, to end up in people's eyes, and uh, so your hands got to stay closed. And so that's what we want. We want to be able to make sure that people get to go in and watch a fight. When we say it's bare knuckle, we want it to be bare knuckle. 
and that's what it should be. And you're right, there is a lot of different companies yeah taping up and things like that. And do you, what, what, what's the main what was the main issue with the guys wearing obviously wearing tape? Is it just because you want them to have used their God given talent, or do you feel it just doesn't it gives maybe you know a slightly unfair advantage? What, what do you feel on that? Yeah, I think it gives them support. Um, yeah. And to me, it's we're we're talking about bare knuckle. If it was boxing, okay. If it was MMA, okay. But we're saying this is bare knuckle. And so people want to go, oh yeah, okay. Well, just the knuckles are just exposed, and it's bare knuckle. That's not that's not fair. That's not true. Bare knuckle is about fighting with your bare hand. You don't get to put something on your hand to make it have more support, so you don't hurt your hand. If you can't do it that way then you're not a bare knuckle fighter yep that's it and so it's interesting so you're it's actually quite different from the other organizations we've seen you're not going to allow the clinch i think in the other organization organizations you can hold behind the head and land strikes at the same time maybe a few um but as i said you want to see it as pure stand-up boxing and is it going to be knocked down 10 count and things like that yeah that's stuff that you'd have to get with our rules but i'm pretty sure it is but um, all the details on that is stuff that I don't get into. Okay. Um, but no, this, yeah, there won't be holding. Um, there's no holding and rabbit punching. And man, if you're there, this is fair knuckle fighting. So fight. Don't be holding on or grabbing someone's head to try to punch them. Use your hands. That's what they're used for is to punch. So don't hold on. That's fair enough. And what, what I love about how your passion for bare knuckle boxing as well is, Ken, obviously, because you're very obviously old from the old school days of the bare knuckle style. But if you actually, when people look at your MMA career, they might think, he loves his bare knuckle fighting, but God, he knows how to tap blokes out as well, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but if you knew me before I started in um, into uh, my MMA career and yeah. the no whole bark career, I was known as One Punch Shamrock. And I fought in tough mans, three different tough mans. And of course, I wore gloves, but... I knocked everybody out. I also fought in street fights where I was making money uh, fighting outside of bars. Uh, and that was ba- basic bare knuckle, called it squatting. And uh, so I would fight guys and I'd make money. And and uh, and so I was always known as One Punch Shamrock you know, before I got into the, uh, the MMA world. So that's where my roots came from early on. And people don't know that because I, I when I got into the, the, the no holes barred, just like when I'm talking about analyzing what I would want to get into if I had a choice of the three boxing, MMA, or bare knuckle, I analyzed it and looked and said, you know what? My career in, in being uh, in that more safe environment, I would be bare knuckle. I believe I would have a much safer and, and a better career in bare knuckle just because of what it is. And I did the same thing early on you know, when I was fighting and all that. I did the same thing early on when I was squatting and fighting out there. I made a choice on what I wanted to do early on, and I felt like it was so much safer than when I put a glove on. It was like yeah. unbelievable being able to strike and hit people from wherever I wanted to hit them, and I wouldn't hurt my hand as opposed to how accurate you had to be with the experience that I had in bare knuckle. Um, it took away the, the actual professionalism of guys that really knew how to strike. Well, and what's what's if you don't mind me asking, Ken, what sort of age were you at this time? You were start you started this sort of competing. Oh, I was uh, I was what twenty four. Okay, twenty four. Yeah, twenty four, twenty five. Yeah, were you doing any sort of um, like discipline before that at all? Any sort of combat sport? Any sort of training? And anything else? Well, what I did was boxing, and I did a little kickboxing, and I wrestled. I was a really good wrestler, so I had the understanding of being able to grapple, not the submission stuff, but I knew cross spaces and, you know, chokes and things like that, but not to the level I did when I got into the submissions. But, um, you know, when I analyzed, when I first got into actual no holes barred early on, I analyzed, um, I knew how to strike bare knuckle. That's what I did first. Yeah. But I looked at it and I said, man, being able to take a guy to the ground, there's no lucky punch. You're not going to get a lucky submission. So I weighed the odds of like, well, okay, which one is better for me to be able to do something without somebody getting lucky or taking the most damage? And I knew right away it was taking guys to the ground because I could shoot and learning the submissions so I could submit them. So I learned that right away and understood right away that my chances of succeeding were a lot higher than me standing up and banging with somebody because anybody can get a lucky punch and you go down, but you can't get lucky on a submission. So that's why I end up going into that submission direction rather than the, the striking direction because I I I weighed out the odds on what would be safer for me. 
Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? And um, it's it, yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that back then. Like you actually looked at it because it sounds like every when you talk about all these different sports, you always seem to look at what dangers is it going to give me and what effect is it going to have me long term. You know, and um, it's yeah, also a very good way to look at things. Yeah, and also too, what what how I look at being able to be successful. If there is an opportunity for me to take someone to the yeah. ground and submit them, and it's bare knuckle then I'm going to take him to the ground because I realized the sustain, the damage you would take being able to stand toe to toe with somebody um, as opposed to grabbing, taking the ground and submitting them. Right. Yeah. So, but we can't do that today. Right. I mean, bare knuckle, it's, there's, there's none of that. Right. You, you're either wearing four ounce gloves and, and MMA or you're, or you're not, or you're, or you're not going to do bare knuckle. So now we're starting bare knuckle and stand up to me. It's a much safer in the MMA world that you look at right now with those four ounce gloves on and guys trying to take you down with a four ounce glove on, you're able to hit them in the head any way you want is much more dangerous than being able to stand toe to toe with somebody and fighting with a no gloves on and being able to fight bare knuckle. It is take as let you're taking less damage. So to me, that's just a no brainer. And I've always analyzed everything as I've always gone through my career, trying to figure out which ones would I would be more successful at, in whatever fight it was and what the best direction to go to win those fights and take the less damage. So to me right now, looking at the way MMA is today, looking at the way boxing is and looking at bare knuckle in my mind, and I've done it all, you are much, much more safe for going into bare knuckle than you are any of those other events. Hence why you've started up a bare knuckle organization and not an MMA one, correct? Exactly. That's it, mate. And do you really think that mentality you've had going through and that, being able to analyze and your success and everything. Do you believe that's how you had such a lengthy career? You managed to go on for such, so such a long time in your career. I do. I think that I, I understood how to be aggressive and how to go after people, but how to not take as much damage. No, that's it. And, um, you were, I said, you were fantastic. Take, you had fantastic takedowns, you know, and, um, where was it? Obviously, if people don't know where, where did, where and when did you then learn to adapt your submission game from just the basic wrestling submission to full on, um, submissions? Yeah, I went over to Japan um, with uh, um, Masa Katsufunaki. Um, he really taught me a lot. But Fujiwara uh, helped me a little bit too. And then Carl Gotts had come in and worked with us a little bit. But Sammy's the one that actually found me. Um, Dean Malenko, yeah. who was uh, they were training at uh, Dean Malenko's dad's gym, he brought me in. And I, started, I did a tryout. And um, after that, I did the tryout, um, Sammy liked me and then brought me to Japan and after that I never looked back oh, that's it mate so when was that so because you were doing when you because Dean Malenko wasn't he involved in WWF as well am I thinking the right thing yeah Dean had done a little bit of that shoot style but um, just wasn't something that he really enjoyed but he turned me on to it and I went and tried out next thing I was over in Japan and I was fighting over there um, and so I, I really enjoyed it I enjoyed the style I enjoyed the contact and so I, that's why i succeeded at it because i really did enjoy it so was that when you were fighting um <clears throat> in pride and pancreas was pancreas in japan it was wasn't it yeah but it was before pride pride hadn't come out yet when i first started over there when we had first started our first couple of shows ufc wasn't even around yet so it started in 89 and 90 Okay, because I, yeah, I, I, I know it was, you've been, I knew in the records in MMA, obviously you've been fighting since they've got, since 1993. But it's interesting to learn that, you know, you've been watching someone your whole life and I've learned something myself. So no, so yeah, right. <laughs> a, a long career, as I was saying, even longer than I thought <laughs> initially. Yeah, yeah, I had a long one. Well, for me, Ken, I'm not trying to be a fanboy, but I've, I've watched you from, you know, when I was younger, because when I was younger, I remember watching you in WWF, you know, putting ankle locks on, the world's most dangerous man. You know, and then as I got older, started watching UFC, watching the originals of UFC and things like that. You know, it's it's just such a, it's so, so interesting to now see how you've how you've gone forward now to start your own organization, which is Bare Knuckle, and you've done it all from all your experiences. You say all those experiences of WWF to Bare Knuckle to fighting in Japan to fighting in UFC, as all those experiences just led to this moment, like pushed you to do what you're doing now. Yes, it. Um... It does, and um, I, like I said, I, I fell in love with it early on, and just felt, just didn't feel right that they they had taken away the purity of 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 that that no holds barred sport, that yeah. bare knuckle, 
And that was real. And that's what people really fell in love with when we first came out was that there was no gloves. And people fell in love with that. And then, of course, the, the clubs came on and they actually made them smaller. And and then, you know, it was just basically force fed to everybody that, hey, things were safer. And the reality of it is it wasn't true. Um, but it turned into a four billion dollar business. So, you know, they did something right. But I, yeah. but 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 it wasn't the way they sold. And I promise you, it wasn't because it was safer. It was because they just knew that the guys that were winning needed to come back and fight again, because that's what people wanted to see were the guys winning. That's it. That's it. And um, I said, it's, and it's great. And I said, it's really good seeing back. And how do you feel as well, though? You know, even looking back now at your UFC career, you're still one of the original Hall of Famers. Is that still something you're really proud of? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I know you hear me talk about bare knuckle and my love for, but that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy my MMA career. Oh, yeah, of course. I did. Yeah. I did. It, just, it just wasn't it just didn't have the same effect on me that the bare knuckle did but nevertheless i still enjoyed it and i still had a great career and i enjoyed it all the way so um you know i just want to make people understand that but it wasn't the same uh i didn't have the same effect on me as bare knuckle did where it was just felt more pure and more real that's fair and you know it's you're actually mirroring it's actually quite similar i was talking to james mcsweeney the other day on um chatting to him and he said quite a very similar thing you know he says like bare knuckle you know i'm, I'm undefeated in my own eyes you know but <laughs> in in the mma world it was it said it was slightly different and really felt at home in the bare knuckle world and that must come down to said having to actually really rely on those pre- precision strikes you know because if you can just throw like anything it's a whole different ball game especially with kicks and takedowns and things like that so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the first event goes. I'm sure it's going to go really well. You're getting loads of views already and it hasn't even started. <laughs> so that's always a good thing. But going back to the the organization, did you have a lot, did you, um before you started it, did you have an idea of who you wanted to join your your organization, like fighter-wise? I didn't, no. Um, we've, I mean, I knew the kind of fighter I wanted. I wanted guys that had some courage, um, some guys that were respectable, but guys that had not, uh, they had no quit in them. Like they, they were here to fight and, and uh, they weren't going to complain, you know, that uh, this is bare knuckle, man. And it's just two guys get in there and you fight it out. And, you know, when it's over, you can be upset. Nobody likes to lose, but yeah. but you hold your head high and you, you take it like a man and you move on. Um, so, there, like I said, there were different there were characters that we went after. We wanted guys that didn't cut easy. We wanted guys that we knew that would come out and fight again, that had uh, backgrounds of guys that uh, showed up to fight. They didn't. Um, miss a lot of fights or miss a lot of opportunities to fight because they, whatever down the road, they end up not fighting. So we got guys in here that we know that are going to fight and um, they're going to put on a good show. Um, we got Mark Godbeer versus Jack May. I love that one because yeah. those guys hands. We got Mighty Mo versus Romero Sokuju. Those guys, man, <laughs> if you, we, we know what they can do. I exactly. Mean, they've got a tremendous background in the, in the MMA world. So that's going to be a fun one. But, hey, the one that I always look at that just could might be sneaky, man, is that that James McSweeney. He gets yes. bright. Those guys are sneaky, man. And they could – if somebody – one of these guys actually break a hand or does something like that because they get too wild, man, he could slide in there and, and he could win this thing. So it's fun to watch. I think the two guys here that I look at – I mean, I, I think Mighty Mo and Romero Soldier are really good. Jack May is also good, but – does does the guys that actually have bare knuckle experience are they do, do they have the advantage here? See, that's in my mind what I'm thinking because I know the difference between bare knuckle and and four ounce gloves and and twelve ounce gloves. It's huge. It's it's a whole different world. So if these guys have actually got ex, two guys got some experience in this, being from England, do they have the advantage? That's it. And um, it'd be int- I don't want to answer that question right now because I had a chat with James McSweeney on interview, so I'll let them all hear the answer because he, he can give you a bit of a background on what he's been doing. <laughs> so um, I'm feeling quite positive that McSweeney's going to do quite well, but um, that's not me just being biased. <laughs> I'd like to see what happens. Um, there is a lot of backyard stuff in the UK as well, which isn't, I know it's not official, and it's, you know what I mean? but it's, it's, not, it's just recorded and things like that. But we have had the UK organisation, so there obviously is in the uk there obviously is a large following of it and a lot of people are interested in it so yeah i'm just as interested as you can you know are we going to have the more experienced guys from here or is it going to be the guys in the states or from that part of the world 
that must make it like so more, much more interesting, just like the first day of UFC. Is that guy going to be that disciplined, etc., etc.? It's almost country versus country and style versus style, would you say? I love it, yeah. To me, that's exciting because, um, you know, I talked about my co-main event too, Izzy Smith and Esteban Payan. I mean, you got MMA against boxing. I mean, that's always been like, a rivalry with with boxing and MMA, and they're always saying we we could beat you guys if you didn't take us down. Yeah. You know, so but but maybe in boxing, right? Yeah, okay, I get it. That's what you do. But how about if we change the game up for both of you, like for for MMA and the boxing? How about we do it with no gloves? And now you guys are both O and O, and let's see which one of these transitions into bare knuckle. And yeah, it's just it's just gonna be so interesting to find out. It's literally like myself being able to live through like watching the days of the original M- like, UFC days but we're seeing it in the bare knuckle world and I'm really glad I get to be a part of it and like get to enjoy it as well you know Ken so obviously thank you very much for putting that on but we have seen I don't want to talk about other organizations too much but we have seen obviously a boxer face an MMA guy you know Paulie Malinaji and right. that that didn't quite work out he tried to box him you know it doesn't work in bare knuckle so that was quite a prime example would you say yeah, because I think boxers go in there and they, one, they got the bigger gloves to try to defend a little bit, so they don't have to use their footworks as much. But in in, in in bare knuckle, it's a lot faster. You have to use your footwork, and every punch counts. So not like in boxing where you could take a couple rounds to get warmed up. Man, by that time, the fight's over in bare knuckle. So it's fast. It's really fast. So it is a, it is an adjustment, but it's also an adjustment for any um combat sport because bare knuckle is its own beast so anybody that goes into this coming from whatever discipline that it is bare knuckle is is its own beast people have to learn that this isn't the same or even close to the same of anything they've done well like, it's gonna be amazing it's gonna be so interesting to see the outcome it's just like an experiment you know almost such a thing which has been tried and tested but this is going to be a whole <laughs> different experiment the way you've set things up with the opponents as well Definitely going to be a night of fireworks, and it's going to be incredible. Did you have a lot of applicants as well for this, by the way? Did you have a lot of people applying for your website? Because I see there's an application form on there. Yeah, we've we've uh, it's it's gradually grown and it keeps growing, obviously because of the attention. Because like I said, we want to make sure that people understand who we are. We're Valor BK. We're not an organization that does bare knuckle. We're Valor BK, and we put on bare knuckle fights. Um, and we want to make sure that we're clear on that and that we're separated from that because we want this to people to know that this is very well uh, run. Uh, we've got um, the funding behind us. We're in it for the long haul. We're not going anywhere. And when people get done watching our event, they're going to realize that the things they've been watching in the past, it's not professional. What we're doing is at a very high level with very – very competent people involved in our organization. Like I said, we got over 80 years of experience with the team, the team members uh, that we have on our staff and to be able to put together a card with all of that experience. Uh, Richard Goodman has done a great job of putting this card together along with all the other people we have on our team to chime in on being able to help support what he's doing. So it's really been an awesome journey. I really, really love the direction we're going and I love the, all the connections that we're able to pull from from our team it's just been unbelievable i know it's all just fallen so nicely into place for you and you know you're obviously a very well respected man ken and well rightly you should be you've done a lot for the sport and you obviously understand what you're talking about you're not going out there just to see people brawl you want piece people to be safe and you want them to do it in the the safest way possible because i'm sure you've got enough you've got a a lot of medical team just in case and it sounds like you've got everything set up and ready to go ken so is there much more left to do or are we pretty much done for the um for the, for the event? i just want to, i just want to make sure that we we um, also get to say thank you to the fans um for being able to get involved and actually match our fighters up on the first round that's something we did with forbes where we actually uh had the fans vote on what matchups they wanted in that first round heavyweight tournament so it was fun to watch because I had my own thoughts on it. And I know a lot of other guys did too, Richard Goodman and a few other guys. We all kind of had the same matchups that we wanted to have happen. Yeah. We were a little worried about letting the fans vote on it. But we said, you know what, let's trust it. I think the fans all see the same thing we see. And so the fans voted on it. And so they came up with the exact, <laughs> which, is, which is the exact kind of setup that we would have done in the first place. So 
congratulations. We really appreciate the fans for being involved and being able to come out and vote for us and putting that first round together. It's going to be fun to watch this thing play out. Did you actually get a final number on how many votes came through, by the way? I think we did, but I don't have it on me. Um, okay. I, was... I should get that. That way I can actually tell people. But it was pretty good. We did we did well. That's amazing. I said all this before, again, I repeat myself, before we've even had the first event. And um, it just shows how well your team are doing with advertising and getting the word out there. And I, I, I'm sure as hell doing the same thing as well. You know, I'll be spreading all this around the UK and want people to make sure they know what's going on. Because, Ken, you're a huge name all around the world, especially in the UK. So people are definitely going to be tuning into this. And as I said, in the UK, hopefully you get on some of the UK channels over here. But but we can still watch it on Fight TV, oh, yeah? Yeah, we'll, we'll have it. We'll have it. We'll have it there. I just don't know what it is. Um, if you guys look it up, Valor BK, and it'll be in any of the direct TV and dish networks, all the major cable companies um and then fight for the digital it's fight tv so yeah if you look at i'm sure it's there and, and if people will look it up it's valor bk it, we will have it in uh and i'm not sure because like I said, because we've hired actually an individual person to go out there and make sure that whatever network especially in england because we know it's big over there that they have the network that's going to provide it for the people in england yeah, no, no, I really hope I really hope we get the opportunity to watch it. If not, I will definitely I'll definitely be streaming it um, on the um, on Fight TV as you were saying on the online. But uh, either way, I'll be watching it one way or the other, and I can't wait for it. It'll be a late one though. Obviously, it'll be in the UK. I'm guessing you're starting what what time's your event start? I'm guessing it's around one a.m. in the UK. Yeah, it's uh, I believe it's the doors open at six six thirty, and I think that our pay per view launches at nine. I believe. Yeah. That's fine then. That's not bad then. If we get up at five a.m., then we can we can start watch we can watch the pay per view and then catch up on the prelims before. Perfect. It starts. I'm sorry. I think it starts at seven. Doors open at six thirty. Starts at seven thirty. The first pay per view event. Oh man, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be incredible. And um, can I ask who's who's um, like the, who's headlining the event or the headline be the, obviously the tournament final? Yeah, it's a tournament final, but the co-main event also too. I think that's one to watch. It's Izzy Smith and that's one paying boxer against MMA. But yeah, it will be the heavyweight uh, tournament. The guys that win the first round that will be our main event. But it's a co-main event, so I think that our co-main event is is going to also be very exciting. And have you got any sort of um, obviously having just make sure I'm not getting this wrong. Obviously, in the tournament, they'll be fighting more than once that night, correct? Twice. They'll fight twice. Yes, yeah, sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm getting that out there correctly. They'll be fighting twice. Have you got some sort of backup plan if there is an injury to any of these fighters if they do win and they're injured? Is there any sort of um, contingency? Yes, we got uh, uh, James McSweeney and Brian Heaton, which they'll fight each other. Whoever wins that will be the first alternate up. Okay. Okay, perfect. And obviously, a lot of people will be thinking that, but let's not hope that. Hope everyone, obviously, everyone comes out safe and healthy, you know, and um, they can continue right. to fight. Yeah. And it's been it's been a proven thing, haven't we? We've seen it in the past. It's proven it can be done. You know, how many oh, times have you how many times have you done it, Ken? Like, what's the most you fought in one night before? Oh, four times. Oh, four times. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, yeah. It's and it can be done. That was bare knuckle too, so it can be done if if the fighter goes in and they understand that it's a controlled aggression. Um, and that they're not there to try to knock the guy on the first round or to try to force a knockout. I think that the, once the guy with the mental strength knows um, going in how to fight, uh, you'll get through it and he'll win. But it's the ones that um, panic and and uh, they start throwing those bombs and they catch the head wrong and then they've got a hurt hand and now they're fighting at a very uh, a real bad disadvantage. That. That is it. And, um, you know, um, sorry to go back in time when you were talking a second ago. You know you were talking about when you were fighting in the no-holds bar before everything. They had, what was the nickname they called you? One Punch Shamrock, wasn't it? Yeah, One Punch Shamrock, yep. That's it. Yeah, yeah. See, I never knew that. When did the world's most dangerous man come in? Sorry, I, I forgot to ask you that. Who who gave you that one? Yeah, I think that came in 90, or late 93 or 90, early 94. Yeah. Who, who gave you that? Was that someone who gave it to you? Or did you just hear it? It was it was done with the TV station, well, with the world's most dangerous animal and places and food and person. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's interesting. Though. Yeah, so it's always interesting to see where the nicknames come from. It's one of my favourite things to find out about you guys. So back in that sort of time, then, so back in like the early nineties, you opened up, um, you opened up your own gym as well, didn't you? Was it the Lions Den, if I remember rightly? I did. Yeah, I opened it up. 
because I couldn't find places to train at here in the States. I was always having to stay over in Japan to train. Yeah. And I had to, I had to figure out a way to train here because I spent too much away with my family. So um, I ended up just starting to train guys and start teaching them so that I had guys I could train with. Yeah, so that's why I was actually going to ask that question next. Like, why did you decide to open your own gym and things like that? And you did produce, you produce some great guys from there as well. You know, multiple champions, Roy Nelson, um, you know, Maurice Smith as well. Um, so you and Frank obviously as well. So you had, definitely had some good fights come out of there. So is it nice to see how those guys progressed further on their career later on? Yeah, even Guy Mesger. You know, talk about Guy Mesger too. Sorry, he had Guy. a tremendous Jerry Bolander. I mean, he, oh sorry, I should say there's plenty more. Yeah, there is plenty more. <laughs> there's a lot of guys, man, that that uh, had done very well with the way that we had trained. It was tough, and there was no there was no roadmap on how to train guys. So you know, me just being the kind of the, the, the tough guy that I was, I always just thought, well, let's just let's emulate what we're going to do in the ring, and let's just bring three or four different guys to come in fresh doing it. And, and that's what we did, man. And we get, we were tough, man. Everybody in there got tough. So, and I was just looking, I recommend people, I, I didn't give it enough credit. If you look on online, you can easily see the list goes on of multiple champions in there and different disciplines, you know, and, um, you know, it's fantastic to see, Ken, that people have followed so well in your footsteps. Cause a lot of people probably don't know about these people who are trained in your gym, you know, and, um, it's nice people understand that and where you've come from and where, how you've led all the way to now. I'm sure a lot of people don't need telling, you know, and a lot of people know who you are, but it's really interesting to hear your story, how you got to where you are. And no, I really appreciate you, um, you know, letting it all out there, mate. Thanks very much. Yeah. Listen, I appreciate you. I got another interview here at one. I got about 12 minutes. No, that's right. So what, <laughs> what I was going to say to you is, um, obviously Ken, thank you very much. It's been an absolute honor to speak to you. Um, so seeing as you, you have, you've got another interview soon, is uh, before we leave, is there anyone you obviously you haven't mentioned already that you want to say thank you to who's helped Valor to get where it is today and um, obviously let everyone know where they can watch it when and how to follow you on social networks as well? Yeah, I just like I said, I get a shout out to our team. You know, we got Des Woodruff, who is my business partner. Then we've got um, Todd Middendorf, who is our VP of operations. We've got Richard Goodman who is the matchmaker, has done a great job on the card. And then, of course, um, Jen Wink, who is the PR. Uh, she worked with UFC during the heyday and built them up. Now she's working for us. And we have a great support team around us. There's many more people that are still working. Um, so, but yeah, so th those are the ones I think that um, that I can mention. And can't mention everybody, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes that are also working real hard. So we, like I said, uh, I tend to get all the credit because I'm the one talking and I'm the face, but I'm telling you right now that without the team that I had behind me and the people supporting me and working behind the scenes, uh, we wouldn't be where we're at. So I just want to make sure you shout out to them um, and that um, we've got something special here and we can all be proud of it. Definitely. And I really recommend everyone go out there and make sure you watch the fight and you, and you tune in, pay for the pay-per-view. It'd be very 100% worth it. And also make sure you go online and check out Valor on all their Facebook pages and Instagram. There's a lot of good work being done by their social guy there. So a lot of information of all the fighters. Go and check it out. And Ken, just from me again, I really want to say thank you very much. I really appreciate you're a busy man. There's a lot going on in your life. So thanks very much for taking the time to speak to us today. Hey, appreciate you. Thank you. No worries, Ken, and look forward to speaking to you again in the future. All right, man. Take care. Hello, my name's Chris yeah. Allen, and this is the Martial Arts Chat Podcast. Today, I'm being honoured to speak to a UK legend, even though he's been out of the country for a little while now, but we still think of him as one of our own. It's Mr. James McSweeney. How are you doing, sir? Hey, I'm great. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. No, I really appreciate you coming on. And as I said, even though you don't live with us anymore, you're still one of our own. I said, I'm sure you never forget where you came from, do you? Oh, no, of course not. I'm, no matter where I am, I'm always known to be English. And my family, you know, my whole grew up in England, so my family is still there. I come over at least once a year. And, and even the big events when I fought for the UFC, they had me over there and fight in, in the, uh, the O2 Arena. And then I was with KSW, Wembley Stadium, Wembley Arena so many times. So I'm always reminded, which is great. I never forget where I'm from, so... Uh, I love to come back and fight in England and see everybody. It's always good. Yeah, mate. Obviously, we love to have you back. So, you know, they say, like, you're playing home or away sort of thing. So, do you feel like you're playing at home when you're in America or more when you're in the UK? Um, I think, to be honest, it's it's kind of different now because America's... I, I've lived in America... I, le I left England 14, 15 years ago. 
Yeah. Um, and then I was in America straight for about five years. And then I moved to Thailand for pretty much five years. I was in Australia for a year. And now I've been just come back to America again. So to be honest, I'm fighting in America and I fought here so regularly. And America has very much embraced me and took me on as their own, which is um, my daughter's American. My wife is American. Yeah. But um, – I'm I'm kind of lucky. I'm home from home. When I go to England, I, I get a great rapport from the fans. And when I'm in America, they treat me almost exactly the same. So I'm very lucky that um, I'm home from home. Every time I fight in America, it's like being home and same in England. No, that's fair enough. Because I was actually going to ask that question, um, which you sort of answered now, actually, to be fair. Um, I was going to say, like, do you feel like you're always fighting on foreign ground, like getting the booze from the crowd because you're fighting the local man and stuff like that? Um, well, it, it was different because when I fought for KSW, um, I fought mostly. I fought the Polish guys. Yeah. Um, and then when I fought for UFC, I fought a Brazilian, Fa- uh, Fabio Maldonado. So I was always still the the hometown hero in, in that respect of, and you know, um, especially being an English heavyweight, they were very, you know, the English fans are like they're very they're very supportive and uh, very passionate. So I've never really had. Well, I can't say I've had many booze. I'm, people either love me or they hate me. Yeah, so well, I'm, I'm quite, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm quite opinionated, and you never see fans say, "Oh, James is okay." They always think I'm fantastic, or they hate my guts. So uh, I, 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 you know, it is what it is. Fans are fans, and I appreciate both of them. Well, yeah, and the fans obviously love love your fighting style as well. Like all your wins are by finish. You never, you know what I mean? Never a decision, yeah. and 15 wins, nine by knockouts. That that's just in your MMA career. And if we go even further back to your kickboxing career, well. It gets a bit extreme now, doesn't it? It's 46 wins with 31 finishes. So yeah. you're obviously an exciting man to watch. Yeah, I mean, I've always tried to bring the fight and, and um, do the best I can possibly do. And I always try to think of myself, you know, I don't hold back. I don't try to, you know, ponder out, you know, the points scoring. Even if it goes to a decision, it just happened because it was a tough fight. But um, I'm never trying to look for a points decision. As a fighter and as a, a fan of the sport, I always think about what I want to achieve. I'm always want to achieve the knockout, and I'd always think about what the fans are paying good money to watch. And uh, every fan loves to see a, a stoppage or a knockout, right? So I'm always trying to deliver the best I possibly can. Yeah, no, and I said, you look through your record. You've always, as I said, all your all your wins are always by like savage knockout. And I bet even in one FC, you know, you had a good soccer kick knockout. That must have been an extra one to add to your resume. You haven't been able to do yeah. that in many organisations. <laughs> Yeah, that was really nice because they allowed uh, soccer kicks to a downed opponent and uh, I won knockout of the year that year for 2014 um, for, for, for that knockout and also the one prior to that, I won first and second place. I knocked out uh, Chris Lockter with a jumping knee nice. and I think that actually retired him. He was undefeated until that fight. Uh, it's a shame he never got to fight again. I don't know what, what happened to him. I think it was, it was a bad knockout and um, I think it really affected him from what I've heard, but it's a shame because he's a really cool guy. And then when I fought uh, um, Christian, um, Mal- uh, what's his name? Christian Cominci. Yes, he was another undefeated Brazilian uh, jiu-jitsu guy and um, I soccer kicked him and knocked him out as well. So um, it was good to have those kind of rules set. And to be honest, that's why it's great to fight now for the rule set I'm going to fight under because I've always performed the best. And that sounds probably a bit weird or a bit more violent, but <laughs> the, the least amount of rules possible has always suited my personality of fighting the best. So when I could soccer kick or kick the other down the opponent, it really was just very natural for me to do that. So it, was, it felt um, a lot easier. Well, that's fair enough. You know, it is a natural reaction. You still see the professional guys in the UFC and Bellator accidentally throwing kicks to a downed opponent. It's sort of like an instinct like a fighter has, you know, and you do see that in quite a few other fighters as well. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not sure, because I know in Pride, obviously, they allowed soccer kicks, okay, but they didn't allow elbows because they found elbows were dangerous. Is that the same with 1FC? Yeah, it was kind of it's kind of crazy, right? I don't know who comes up with this bullshit, but it's like <laughs> you can't, you can't, you can soccer kick a guy that's down in the face, but you can't elbow him on the ground or, or knee him on the ground, but you can't, but you can elbow him standing up. It's like... Uh, and then in in pride there was no elbows whatsoever, but you could knee the guy in the, you could be in north south position on the ground, and knee him in the clean in the head. You could knee him in the crown of the head from north south position of a downed opponent, but you couldn't elbow. I mean, I kind of understood it to the point because they didn't want people to get cut so much and the fights be stopped. Yeah. But I mean, a knee to the top of the head from north south position, 
is way more damaging to the spine and the brain than an elbow to the face, which is just superficial cuts. So um, there's some very, very different rule sets. But I, don't, I think 1FC have just, I'm not too sure, I could be wrong, but from what I heard, they've just taken out soccer kicks now. They've stopped soccer kicks, from what I've heard. Well, yeah, because I said in the recent fights, you know, with um, some of the UFC guys going over there, watching a few more of the fights, you're not seeing as much of it. And I say you're not really seeing it anymore from the guys. So you might be right. It might be stopped. That's definitely something you um, should look at. But maybe it's a good thing. You know, if they're going to stop that, it maybe help promote the sport more. And maybe, they, maybe, maybe they're doing it so they can bring the sport to different, like over here. Because over here, that's they won't it, allow it. Yeah, that's what it is. I think it was in the Asian network, it's, it's no problem whatsoever because they're used to it from Pride and China and stuff like that. But um, I think they are looking to. They're, they're now bringing in so many Americans into One FC. Like you know, they, I say he's not American, but he's uh, he's yeah. Brazilian. But they're bringing in some of the other higher level guys, the ex UFC fighters and stuff like that. And um, so I think they're trying to lean on the American crowd and get that more worldwide crowd to watch it. And if some fans are not used to it, they find distasteful. So I think they're trying to make it more appropriate for everyone's taste. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm, it's definitely getting a lot more views um, now. Like people like Demetrius Johnson, and Eddie Alvarez, all went over there. You know, mm. from the UFC, a lot more people are watching it. And you're right, a lot of the people are complaining about how it's too violent. You know, people complain about bare knuckle boxing is too violent, but obviously we'll go into that. And um, and you know, and then people just need to understand. You know, it's a sport. These people are competing. You know, they're professionals. They're being protected by a referee. You know, <laughs> it's um, it's, yeah, it's, and, yeah, it's, and, it's the and, ongoing and... argument. There is, there's always, I mean, there's always going to be that back and forth argument about at the end of the day, you know, it's a fight. And I think um, there's a rule set for a reason. And if the rule states that you can do it, then, of course, the fighters are going to do it. Like when you, if you watch my fight against Kaminsky, I don't know if you noticed, but the first time I passed his guard and I soccer kicked him in the head and I saw he was unconscious. And then I was just about to make the second kick and I stopped it like two inches from his head. <laughs> and I didn't follow through because he was already unconscious. Yeah. And the referee said to me, thank you for not making that kick. We would have had our first fatality. And I said, no, it's not. It's, it's just to win the fight. It's not personal. And that's what the fans have to understand as well. If the rule set says we can soccer kick or we can knee the head or we can elbow or, like you said, bare knuckle boxing or whatever it may be, we're fighters. We're going to play to that rule set because that's what we both agree to do in our contracts. And that's what we're all trained to do. Uh, we don't want anyone to get seriously hurt. I mean, that affects not just the opponent and the families, but that affects the sport in general and yeah. damages it. We don't want that. We lose sponsors. We lose money. Somebody gets severely hurt, which is, uh, you know, not, it's not personal. This is just a, this is just a business and no one wants, we just play to the rule set we're given. And, um, and that's, and that's our job. Uh, and, that, and that's the end of it. And it's not, I think sometimes fans that see soccer kicks and stuff that are turned off by it, they, they relate it to like the street fight or a bar fight or something that's horrific with no rule set. And, and that's not the case. But um, I understand it's very, it's very natural to feel that way. And so they should because, I mean, to be honest, if you think about it, hmm. fighting, fighting itself is probably, it's not natural, right? Even though people like to watch it, 98% it, of, the, of the population do everything to get away from it, to yeah. not be put in that situation. And they'll... They, any confrontation, they'll back down from it. They don't want to fight. They, so it's very natural to see a, a big percentage of the, pop, uh, of the population be nervous about watching that style of aggression or violence. So it's, it's very natural. So I understand. And you know, and you're completely right. You know, it's a good way to put it. But so with this whole elbows being not allowed or allowed or whatever, you know, down opponents with the head kicks. Do you think it might have anything to do with you know the current ruling we've got an MMA now, the twelve six elbow? Like the point of the elbow I, and all that. Do you well, maybe that had something I, to do with it as well? Well, I, I understand the 12 to 6 because that down point elbow, basically it came from uh, people that watch karate. Mm -hmm. They were watching people break blocks and bricks and slates with a down 12 to 6 elbow. So yeah. they were saying if enough blunt force was to create it for that to break, uh, you know, a concrete block, for example, or a big lump of wood, yeah. what would that do to the spine or the top of the head? impacting down so i understand uh, the 12 to 6 to a degree because it's not a surface excuse me it's not a surface damaged um elbow it's more of an internal damage there's a chance there where you can it's going to push the if you if you elbowed on top of the head it could push the spine low and compress the vertebrae and all these kind of other issues it can create and also deep internal to the brain so i understand that 
uh, to a degree because it's a vicious elbow. Um, other elbows, I think normal elbows, it's surface. It's about making cuts. If, it, if it's an elbow, it's just going to cut the person. And yeah. that's why K1 got created because they took Muay Thai, they took the clinching away from it, they took the elbows away from it because not always the best person won technically. If someone just got, you could be beating the guy to pieces for three rounds, you took a bad elbow and then of course the fight was stopped. Um, for a cut so it was leaving a lot of people un- unhappy about the decisions of who was the best kickboxer in the world or the best Muay Thai fighter in the world so that's why K1 got designed and created mm. years ago back in 1990 um, because they were ha- unhappy yeah they were unhappy with elbows when it, when K1 first got created they wanted to find out who was the what was the very best stand up martial art in the world and all they all had the letter K Taekwondo karate um, it, the list went on and um, so they created K1. People of the spectators that wasn't overly educated about uh, striking didn't like clinching because they felt like when people first saw MMA, they thought jiu-jitsu was, oh, two guys just hugging each other on the floor, right? So that's mm-hmm. why people were frowning upon MMA when it first came around. Same in kickboxing when K1 was designed. People would just frown upon Muay Thai and say, oh, they're just hugging each other. It's boring. They're hugging each other. It's just boring. So then K1 got created by Ishii, the K1 director, and um, he created K1. And that's why they said no elbows because they didn't want people to get cut and find a, and just pull a decision win out of a stoppage. And they didn't want to clinch in. So K1 first come around, there was no clinching whatsoever. Then, so you saw everyone was dominating. And then they changed the rules and they said clinch and one knee upon impact. So when your hand touched the back of the head, the knee must land exactly the same time. Mm-hmm. So that allowed then a small degree of clinching. And then now it's changed again where you can clinch, make one knee, but you must break straight away. Yeah. So it's evolved over time, you know, and it's evolved with people's education. So people have started to realize watching K1 that, oh, okay, then, and kickboxing now has become so big and, the, and Muay Thai has become much more big because of MMA. The people's knowledge for the sport has, has obviously gone up. So now people do, don't mind seeing a little bit of clinching as long as it's just not a pure clinch battle. So that's how martial arts has evolved over the years, and I think MMA took a massive, a massive help in that. And that's why I think bare-knuckle boxing now has become so fashionable or become so popular because it, bare knuckle boxing 20 years ago was highly illegal and banned. It was yeah. it was only taking places, you know, in garages or underground, and you YouTube know, YouTube and stuff like that. Well, background, whatever, backfield, well, YouTube backyard stuff. Didn't, YouTube didn't exist 20 years ago, my of friend. Course. Yeah, so, yeah, of course, of <laughs> course. So it's only happening when you know people had a real problem and they would meet somewhere to have a straightener and get this shit sorted out. And that's where. But now, because of the education that MMA's brought in and opened up so many varieties, now they're seeing people boxing with small gloves. Don't forget when MMA first came around, it was very, very frowned upon as well because people were used to boxing with big gloves. Yeah. So they saw these tiny little fingerless gloves, and it was like one step closer to the real thing. Well, now people got used to that and people are, and it's now a, the fastest growing sport in the world. Sponsors are on board, worldwide television, even people that don't like fights watch MMA. So now it's more acceptable to do bare knuckle boxing because mm-hmm. it's that, it's that now it's pushing towards that even more extreme yet again. So that's why I think now it's been made legal and it's been made more acceptable because if you'd have done bare knuckle boxing 10 years ago, it would have been shut down off the belt. They wouldn't have made it onto TV whatsoever. No, it would just got seen as brutality and all this sort of stuff. But that's exactly yeah. what they thought about UFC when and May when it came out. Exactly, but what I mean is because because of that transition that you that MMA has done, it's it's made it's made K one more appropriate to watch now. Glory is doing really well. Yeah. Um, you had to be a real martial arts enthusiast to know what K one even was to watch it in Japan for all those years. You know, normal people weren't watching that kind of stuff. It was on at midnight, one o'clock in the morning on satellite TV that nobody really had back then, fifteen years ago. So you had to be a real enthusiast of martial arts to know what K one even was. Where now. K1 is very popular and everyone knows about it. Martial arts, MMA has been very popular. Look how many uh, shows there are now in the world compared to where there was 10 years ago. Yeah. There was so only a couple of Pride. There was UFC, WEC, Strike Force. That was about it. You know what I mean? Whereas now you've got Bellator, you've got 1FC, you've got so many big companies out there, KSW. They're, they're all coming through because they've, they've opened their eyes to the everyday public. 
no, I, I could, and because of the popularity and, and you said the excitement of it, it's just making everything. And what I like about it as well is that more people are watching it now because of this, and it's nice to have more educated conversations with people about martial arts now, which is nice because before you go in a pub and talk about martial arts, and they wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. Yeah, you know, or, so. or or they would just be the old, you know, be the old some old timer there that used to do a bit of boxing back in the day and just you know yeah. put down and say, ah, oh, that's a load, that's what that's a load of shit, and this what that's not real fighting, and this is this, you know, you couldn't you couldn't be ten years ago or fifteen years ago, you couldn't be a boxing fan and a martial arts fan. You had to choose your side. There was a battle between the two, and that's why I think when McGregor fought Mayweather, forget about the outcome. That was a, a clear standpoint that brought a lot of boxers into the MMA world, fans, the old timers, and it brought a lot of martial arts fans into the boxing world. Yeah. Not the boxing world needed it, but it was just a good transition to show, hey, you can you can support both here. You don't have to be one or the other. Um, and I think that did really good for both uh, aspects of the sports. I know, and what I like about that is because boxing, as you know, in the UK is our bread and butter in the UK, and the Americans yeah. made their bread and butter is wrestling. With MMA being introduced more, we we're able to, we're able to adapt now better. It, so we've got so many more better wrestlers coming out of the UK now, which is such a huge influence, which is great. Well, I that... think if you, look, if you look at MMA, I think the three biggest successful countries to do MMA is America, England, and Brazil, right? So you've yeah. got box, boxing and striking from England, which they've come over to. We've we've adapted and we've. We, we picked up jiu-jitsu pretty quick, but wrestling was always a problem that England had because we didn't have it in high school or whatever, like the Americans. And then, of course, the Americans had a problem with striking. They weren't ever the level of ours. And then jiu-jitsu, of course, is, is from Brazil. Brazil yeah. adapted far easier to wrestling than they did striking, but, of course, they have a great background in, in jiu-jitsu. So it just, it, now it's all blended. Now you've got some of the best strikers in the world. In, in Brazil and in America, and then vice versa, some some amazing grapplers in England, as wrestlers in England as well. So it's the whole world has evolved because of it. So it's, it's fantastic. I know it's great, and um, as well as like in more recent times as well, as long as lot of, as well as a lot of people don't maybe not like the guy much or dislike or like whenever the McGregor era, like you were talking about a second ago with the Mayweather thing, just the whole McGregor thing just brought so many made the sport just explode overnight, sort of thing. Well, that's no, the thing is that at the end of the day, we've always had – that's what I think fans have a problem with is that they take, they are, they're very passionate and they take it very personal, which is fantastic. Yeah. But, I mean, we've had it – let's go back to British boxing. People can, they can never stay on Chris Eubank, but they, they fell in love with Nigel Benn and people like that and, yeah. you know, and, and uh, Frank Bruno, but then they, they couldn't stand Lennox Lewis, even though he was English but Canadian. So there's always been – but the fact of the matter is the fans don't even know them. <laughs> Do you no. know what I mean? The same as Conor McGregor. They don't know him. They don't. They they only know what he allows them to know. They only know the persona that he allows to portray. Um, and, and that's all well and good, you know. So to say they don't like somebody, I think that's okay. But I, you don't know the person. Yeah. Uh, for me, people ask me all the time, "What do you think about this guy?" Oh, he's a piece of shit. And I say, "Well, actually, you don't know him. Where, no, when did exactly. you meet? When did when did you meet him?" And I, when I, I saw him, I think I said, yeah, but when did you go around his house and sit there with him and his family? Because that's when you really know somebody. You know yeah. what I mean? You know the character. You know the personality on TV. And that's what I, That's why I never took it personal about anyone who said they didn't like me and when I fought or if I won a fight and I got abuse on social media. Oh, I hate this happens. I, I, I never really give a shit because, to be honest, I'm, if, if you love me or you hate me, I don't give a fuck. The point of the matter is you, you bought tickets. You come to watch me lose, or you come to watch me win. The price is the same, right? <laughs> my, my value, my value as an athlete, is the same to promote whether someone likes me or they hate me. You know, you know what I mean. If they come to see Chris Eubank lose against Nigel Benn, they still bought the same seat as the person that bought the ticket to watch Nigel Benn win and Chris Eubank lose. It's the same price, so it doesn't really matter. But that's that's it's the same as soccer and other sports and so forth. It's all about your own personal taste, that's fine. I just never took it that personal where I had a distaste for, you know, other athletes or people that I saw on TV because I, I didn't really know them, you know. Um, and it's funny, you always see, like, I know some some high-level fighters pretty well and I've been friends with them or I've trained them or I know them personally. And uh, you always see someone who's very good at something. People most think that, like, he's like a – He's the best thing since sliced bread. Like he's a yeah. great, but actually he's a piece of shit. I know the guy. Like he's really a dick. But <laughs> you know, but because they see greatness in something they do, they they almost automatically believe that they're they're, they're they must be the most 
you know, the most best personality, nicest family guy in the world, but it's not always the case. No, and some of these guys are obviously um, playing up as well because they know how to make money and sell tickets. Colby Covington's a perfect example of it. He's probably the that's nicest where, guy going. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way the sport's gone. I mean, it goes yeah, back. Yeah, shame. Uh, it goes back m- many years. I think then my problem with it, now, I never minded it before, but I feel like now it's gone to a new level. Um, yeah. I'm kind of, I, I'm, I'm glad. Well, I'm not glad really because I hate, I hate being a, an older guy in the sport now. But I'm glad I'm not a young kid coming through the sport now because the direction it's going um, is it, distasteful for me. I don't like it's got it's just got too personal. Like the old Muhammad Ali days, and everyone goes back to these times where he was talking trash or whatever. But it was done with, with it was done in in a way of, of um, real intelligence, and it was done yeah. in a way where he was doing it to just get over the mental aspect of the opponent, trying to break the opponent down mentally and making him believe that he was better than he was or whatever he may want him to do. Whereas now it's got very personal. Now, people are talking about wives and kids and money and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's just got too personal. And I think that when you cross that line, there's no going back. And uh, whether, I mean, I don't know Colby personally whatsoever. I think as an athlete, he's absolutely fantastic. He's an amazing fighter. Um, I think some things he said a little bit too far. I wouldn't say it. But, hey, I'm no one to judge him. I don't care. You know, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, um, But there's just... I don't know. It's just there's a few now that have coming through that are trying to copy or or, or 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 use the blueprint of others, but they're doing it in a distasteful manner. And I just think you get once it goes personal, that it takes. You think about martial arts is always meant to be about respect, right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure there's times where I haven't res- always respected my opponent, and he's pissed me off. Or there's only a couple of guys that I could say after out of all of these fights I've ever had that I personally didn't like them, and I personally there's only a couple. I say, yeah, I really wanted to. I really wanted to fight him back, you know. The rest was yeah. just a, a plastic cover for business. But there was a couple that I really had distaste for. But I mean, that's that's just human nature. I mean, I fought over two hundred people, so to oh, have no, a couple, that's that's only like, you know, that's one percent. <laughs> it's under one percent, right? It's point zero zero five percent. So it's it's very small, you know. So when they go that when they go that distastefulness or that that personal wise, I think it just creates a whole new level. I'm just not a fan of it. No, and I don't. I just don't like how people nowadays. Um, you know, the right. I feel some people aren't getting matchmates properly. You know, you can get a fight on nowadays. It's called getting fights on social media. If you give someone enough shit on social media nowadays, you tend to talk your way into a fight. Yeah, which, but that's the. This is the. This is the, the problem. problem. Yeah, this is the problem. What's happening? It's like when the fuck does social media run the? I know social media now apparently runs the world. It's like, but when when the fuck that transition happened? I was doing this shit before internet was even existed. I was doing this before social media existed. Like hmm. nowadays, you can't have a training session unless the guy's posted on social media. He didn't even fucking train. You know what I mean? So that's what it makes me die is that these guys are doing this shit, matching people on social media to fight when either they have no background or any business even doing this. And okay, if two people want to fight, who am I to judge? But the problem is, is the backlash of that. If someone gets seriously hurt, it doesn't. It doesn't affect social media. It no. affects. The martial arts. It affects your job as a as 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 a media outlet. It affects my job as a fighter. It affects my sponsors. They don't want to be involved in this kind of sport because someone just got hurt. But they shouldn't have been doing it in the fucking first place. They had no right to be there. You know what I mean? It, it's not yeah. like oh two idiots got into a fight. It's oh two idiots had an MMA fight. And that's not how it should. Be. And that's not how it should be portrayed. That's where the damage is done, in my opinion. Yeah, and that's what makes the sport makes it. They try to say as inverted commas bloodthirsty. They say. So, what would be yeah. your sort of what would be your message though? Do you know what I mean to say a younger generation like sixteen year old starting to do May? What would be the sort of first message you give him that that or I've, her? I've I've got I own my I own I've I've had several gyms over the years, but I, I've just bought a new gym just recently a month ago, and I opened oh, it cool. you know, in in Dallas, Texas, nice. um, and I'm there every day, and I've got some young fighters now actually that are coming through, and we were just sitting around having a chat the other day, and. The, uh, one is already a professional and two of the other two are amateur turning professional and they asked me a similar question like if you had your time again coach what what's the best advice you would give me and I just say the fact is you've got to do what's best for you you've got to train and push yourself to your limit don't get caught up in all the other bullshit all the other bullshit to be honest even myself when I first come to America 
you know, I, I was like, oh, wow, I'm in America, this dream, all this social media was coming through. And you know, it does, it all goes to your head. And I made some mistakes and I, my ego got the better of me. And I left gyms that I shouldn't have left. And I stayed at gyms that I should have left. Do you know what I mean? Because I was, <laughs> and I was hanging around with people that I shouldn't have hang around with. Because to be honest, when I look back now as an older, more experienced person, they were dickheads. You know, they were good people, but because of who they was, I was hanging around with them, you know, and it's like you get caught up in that fake persona world. But when the when the when when push came to shove, they were you you think they're your friends and they're really not. You can only rely on real people and, and I think with social media nowadays we just I think if in the martial arts world we're we're growing a load of insecure fake people. And and that's right. And you, the world's worst thing you can be as a fighter is an insecure fake person, <laughs> because you can persona you did twenty rounds on the bag and you did all this sparring and you did all of this, but you can lie to social media as much as you want. But the fact of the matter is, you know what you did, you know the work you put, you really did, and you know the effort you really put in, and uh, what you're portraying is fake. So. You can lie to everyone else, but you can't lie to yourself. So I, my advice to my guys is that, you know what? Take, take a backward step from all that stuff. Just put in the hard work. Stay humble. Um, learn the craft. Give it the time it deserves. And success will come your way. Don't be too eager for something that you're not prepared for. No, because the last thing you want to do is get yourself in there with someone who is a lot more prepared, a lot more experienced, and... You end up either getting as yourself, and like you said, sorry, injured, or you know, you just you're just not having your best start to your career mentally. That's not going to do you any favors at all. No, because it, because when 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 times get tough, and they will get tough at some point. Yeah. You, you know, you're not going to be able to deliver what you said you could deliver. You haven't put the time in. You haven't put the effort in. And you know, you're you're more you're more concerned about what what people think, more followers you've got, what the comments were, and all this shit, than really actually putting in the hard work, right? And, you know, that's that's really what it boils down to. And listen, I'm not saying like I'm holy and holy and, I, and I'm never on social media. I, I have been on it and I've got I've got a, a company that does my social media for me and, and I'm happy and very lucky that I've got them because unfortunately without them at some point, it does help you earn more money. It does help you with sponsors. I just think it's that in itself is a shame because when I started this shit, sponsors – saw you as an athlete or an up-and-coming fighter or whatever you want to wear, they saw an opportunity where they can get some promotion and they believed in your potential and they invested in you. They invested in you and they supported you financially so you could reach your goal. Sponsors nowadays is just how many likes and fucking followers you have on social media <laughs> and how much exposure can you get me. It's nothing to do with do you think this young kid's going to be something one day and can I give him X amount of money per month to support him so he can reach his potential? And also when he does fight, I'm going to get my, my promotion and I'm going to get, you know, but also it's a good tax write off. And it's also, I'm doing something good by someone else. I'm giving back to somebody else. It's nothing to do with that anymore. I'm sure there's a small percentage out there that are investing in young lads. I'm not saying this never happens, but the majority the majority of sponsors that I see out there now, I've got a young kid said to me the other day, he said, coach, I've got this fight come up, but the promoter told me I can only have $500. He says, but I've had five more fights than my opponent and he's given him $1,000. And I said, how does that work? He said, because he's got 5,000 more followers than me on social media, oh. on Instagram. I said, are you fucking serious? He said, yes, coach. Look, he showed me the email. The promoter said to him, your opponent, even though he has less fights, has 5,000 more followers on Instagram. So he gets 1,000 and you get $500. It's a joke. Can, you believe, can you believe that? What a joke. I've never heard of that. I've never Instagram heard. followers counted more than five extra fights to the opponent. And I said to the, I said to the kid, I said, listen, pull out. Don't even take the fight. Don't even bother. And he said, what? I said, don't do it. Don't take the fight. Because if you take the fight, you're supporting promoters like this and you're going to support their method of thought process and you cannot do that. Even if you go out there and you fight and you get paid your money, whatever, you're making him a success. And people that have that mentality don't deserve to be in this sport. 
and uh, he pulled out. He didn't take the fight. He didn't take it. And that's just just goes oh, to show you him. very. Yeah, I'm very glad he's a good kid. But I'm just you know it just goes to show you the mentality that's out there, unfortunately nowadays towards that kind of stuff. It's a shame. It is a shame, mate. It is, but unfortunately, as you said, it is the way the world's going. And I said I'm from the um, I'm from the days of watching Pride and everything as well. Like, I remember having to, as you said, this is when we actually had internet to stream stuff, and before MMA was even shown on UK TV, or you might have been lucky to get it on Bravo and stuff like that, you know, back in the day. But but as you said, it's amazing how it's evolved, and um, it's amazing how many more countries it's becoming legal in, like France at the end of the year, which is great. Um, yep. And now we've got MMA show. We've got um, shows on now with K1 and MMA fights on the same yep. card. Bellator are doing it. So that's yep. great, isn't it, how it's mixing together? It's fantastic. That's really what martial arts should be about, in my opinion. Like I went to an event um, called... It's a very local event in the UK called Fusion Fighting Championship, which I covered as just a little press for them. And they had all the way from, you know, um, grap- like submission grappling to um, gi jiu-jitsu, no gi jiu-jitsu... MMA and K1, amateur and pro level. And it's just such a great evening to sit there and watch all these different disciplines, you know? Yeah, but that's the thing is if you're if you're a martial arts enthusiast, which obviously you are, mm. I mean, why would you not want to see martial arts across the board? You you know, you do. So it's, it's fantastic to go out for an evening and enjoy a night of martial arts, even though, okay, MMA is martial arts, Thai boxing is martial arts, boxing, whatever. And it's great to have... To watch a different style because it is like oh wow well, okay these guys are going to come out and do this in a moment oh that's great i've seen you know you get to experience that yet again and that's that's fantastic i fought on a show in germany called mixed fight they have yep. boxing they have bare knuckle tie boxing on the event and they have k1 so um they they really do a whole, a whole literally mixed fight they usually put on i mean if you remember back in the day it was called uh, free fights MMA was called Free Fight, and then uh, then they brought it on to Mixed Fight. So now this company is called Mixed Fight, and they just put on all different style of fights on the card. They have ten or twelve different um, different fights on that card, and they have different fights, different styles. It's great. It's a great night of fights. That's I'm all for it. it. That's why I love that. And this is in the UK, by the way, because um, if they didn't know this, loads of this is happening in the UK at the moment. We've yeah. got so many guys, so many British champ- open championships now for um, for jiu-jitsu in the UK and everything. It's great. So many of these, so many guys now are actually coming through the MMA gyms, and obviously they're learning MMA as a whole now, opposed to just individual disciplines. And they're coming through better jiu-jitsu guys, grappling guys, and strikers, which is obviously the opposite of twenty odd years ago. Well, I'm still I'm still a fan of traditional martial arts. I still like to see a Thai boxing event. I still like to see an MMA event. But I just don't. It, it's not necessary just to have this only. I'm just glad yeah. the mentality is changing where people are open up their their boundaries to what they perceive. You know, martial arts is martial arts across the board. Yeah, I think and I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad there's events that are doing it. One fight, one one championship is doing it. They're having K1 fights. They got mixed fight in Germany. They're doing it. Shows in England doing it. It's fantastic. It's how it should be. And uh, I'm all for it. I'm happy for them. And it sounds like, and people like Bellator as well, they've got like a kickboxing division in their organisation. Yep, like sure in, in Italy, they'll have some kickboxing. It's, uh, very, it's, very, it's a very strong division as well. There's a lot of good fighters in there too, a lot. And, and that's it. And it'd be nice to see, because Bellator is at just as big, people say now, as the UFC. Be nice to see UFC maybe start to introduce something like that as well. No, I don't think they will. I don't no. think they ever will. But I, I, know, I, know what, I know the reasons probably why, but... It, 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 I see it, but it's just not necessary. But I just don't think they will because I think UFC yeah, is to. always not just that, but they've always just just. I've spoke to Dana personally and the Fatidas when they was involved in the UFC as well, um, and they've always set the standard in the fact of if we do something, we do it first. Like, do you, do you know how many fighters have tried to get into boxing? Like, um, uh, Anderson Silva was meant to fight. Um, Jeez, what was his name? Um, something junior. What's it? I'm terrible. I'm terrible with names. Junior. Um, uh, middleweight. One of the best middleweights of the world. He was going to fight Roy Jones Jr. Uh, Anderson Silva was trying to set that fight up. They, they The UFC would never have it. Um, there was a few people trying to get into boxing when they were under the UFC stamp. They never yeah. allowed they only wanted MMA, and they, only, they didn't want to ever cross promotion. As soon as the UFC or the Fatidas sold the UFC to China... They allowed Connor to fight <laughs> Connor to fight uh, Mayweather, right? 
That fight yeah. would have never happened if it was under Fatida's banner. They would never have allowed it. And I understand why they wouldn't allow it as well, because it was they just wanted the MMA, and it would have damaged, or had a possibility of damaging or whatever, in their opinion. They always want to be first in what they do. And I get it. I understand. Um, I, I love the fact that other promotions are doing it as well, but uh, I don't think the UFC will ever do it. No. If I'm, I'm not going to argue with the Fatitas. They did something pretty incredible in the, what, 20 years they had the company. Yeah, between them and Dana, they did it. They did. It, they did a very well. It's a, people can say what they want about Dana and the UFC and all the rest of it, but uh, usually it's because of hard eggs. Like they've fought for them and then, then they've got fired or they had to leave or whatever reason it is, and they talk shit about them. But I can't. I can't say that Dana's only ever been very good to me. Um, even since I saw him after my stint in the UFC, I just recently saw him out in Thailand and had a chat with him. Went out for dinner with him, and um, he's been nothing but a a gentleman to me and always been good to me and my family. So um, I understand his job and I understand the way he does it. Some people, I think, take it more personally or think that he's their friend and then that's when they get bit. But um, I never saw it that way. Well, you can't complain. Like the Fatihas openly stated, like they took a step when they brought Dana White on. They said, look, we're going to bring you on with us. We're going to step back and we want you to run the show. And they were, and look what he's done, and it's it's pretty obvious why the new owners have kept him on as the the lead man. If you lose Dana White, a, you know what I mean. What's going to happen? That's that's the big question that a lot of people say, well, don't they? The fact is, if they if if they did do it, it would be a risk. Whether yeah. they would lose it all or not, it's a risk. And to be honest, when you bought a company for X amount of billion dollars, it's not worth that risk, is it? No, definitely not. <laughs> if they and... broke, don't fix it. So just keep it as it is for now. Yeah, and I like I said I, like you said earlier. I can't say if I like or hate him. I, I like him as I see him. Obviously, I haven't met him, you know. But from what you're saying, he sounds like a decent bloke, and he was a boxing promoter himself, as everyone, most people know. And he came over to the sport, and you know, really followed it through. And you've got to love the bloke, really. When he sees something he wants, they they definitely did they did the right thing. And with the Ultimate Fighter series as well, which I'm sure you feel quite lucky to be a part of, you know, that that just really created the sport well. Like, how did that feel for you going into the Ultimate Fighter? Like, how does that all come around? You well, know, it, get... it, it, I was I was um, I was training in England, and yeah. uh, I, I'd fought a guy called Roman Weber in London for Cage Rage, and um, I had a fast knockout. I think it was like eleven seconds or something, and so it was on a lot of TV around the world, um, and it was like a big, it was a jumpy knee and stuff like that. To so see a heavyweight do that, they, it got a lot of publicity in the MMA world, and then I was training at a gym, and I just got a phone call and. And um, it was Greg Jackson, and um, and I did. I thought it was a joke at first. I thought someone yeah. was messing with me, and he just invited me to come out to Albuquerque. And it was a friend of a friend contacted me and said, "Oh, you know, oh yeah, you should go out to Jackson's." Blah blah. And then Greg contacted me and invited me out. And uh, Rashad was preparing to fight Forrest Griffin for the world uh, light heavyweight <laughs> champ title. So yeah. then I, he, he said, "Ask me my size and so forth." And I said, "Yeah, I'm six four. Uh, I was like 220 pounds back then. Um, and um, he said, oh, that's perfect. You're the same size as Forrest. You'll be a sparring partner for Rashad. So I was like, okay, great. So I went out there and then within a week of helping them spar and stuff, they, uh, Rashad asked me to help him be striking and, and I, I was brought on and we became friends. Um, and uh, I was a part of the whole training camp and I cornered him for the fight against, um, against Forrest. And of course, he, he won the fight and won the belt. And yeah. it was about three or four weeks later, I was preparing to go home and I, met, I got a phone call from Joe Silver and said to me, there was this show coming up called The Ultimate Fire and did I want to be on it? And I never knew anything about it. I'd, I'd only been doing MMA for like, I don't know, about a year or something. Uh, I had no jiu-jitsu experience. Like, I thought I had a couple of months, but I, looking back to what I know now as a black belt, I knew nothing. And... Uh, I um, he said, "Oh, Rashad's going to be one of the coaches. I know you and Rashad are friends. If you pass the medical, you don't have to try out. You're just on." And I was like, "Okay, well, fuck it. Okay, I'll do it." So then I called Rashad. I said, "What's this old my fighter thing?" He said, "Oh yeah, I'm going to be one of the coaches. You should try and get on it." I said, "Well, Joe just called me and offered me a spot." And he's like, "Oh, fantastic. Yes, yeah, me and Rampage he explained it to me." And uh, you know, sixteen of the of the fighters that are in the world are going to go into this house and blah blah. And I was like, oh, this sounds fucking terrible. I don't even want to do this. And I remember yeah. calling back to my family, like, I'm not doing this. I'm not staying in the house with fucking big brother, big 15 brother stuff. guys and a fucking camera joking. And then, um, of course, once I got talking to everyone, I saw the opportunity in it. 
And um, to be honest, I never really thought I deserved to be there. I, I said, look, I haven't done MMA long enough. You know, these guys have been doing it. They've all got these records. So when when I got the chance to go in there, I just really went in there with my, I just went in there with my, my, my balls, really, and just a, just a, a personality and, and, and my ego and my, just my, my own aspect to fight. So I think that's why looking back when I was on there, um, I didn't take no shit from anybody. Um, I didn't want to show any weakness because I wasn't an MMA fighter. In my opinion, I was a, I was a striker. And so when I was sparring with people, I was really giving them a hard time because I thought, fuck, if I have to fight this guy on this show, I want him to already think that I'm, I'm better than I am or I'm better than him, you know? So yeah. um, I was training hard as I could. And even in the house, I didn't take much shit from anybody on the house. And I'd always stuck out like a sore thumb being the only non-American. Everyone else was American. I'm the only guy that was English. And so I already <laughs> stuck out. And, uh, and I at was very didn't sub, At least they didn't subtitle you like Bisping. <laughs> uh, they, actually, they did. I think it, the show started off and I had no subtitles, but towards the end, I was covering them. So, did it? I yeah, the bastards. <laughs> I don't know if I got more uh, mumbly as I went on, but I was very lucky. I went through, I, I won I won a couple of fights on there. I lost to, to Roy Nelson, and, and uh, which, yeah, man, to be honest, Matt which, was, him, you know, man. Which was, yeah, thing. which was a bit of a fuck up. I, it was my own problem, even myself. It was my own ego to lost to Roy, because to be honest, in the house training, I used to beat the shit out of Roy a lot in training. I really didn't know who Roy Nelson even was. And um, I didn't really have much respect for him as an athlete in the house. I knew he was very good at jiu-jitsu and so forth. Um, and I knew he was a tough guy. But I wasn't really that worried about it. So when they gave me the fight against him, I thought, I'm going to light this guy up. Like, this is, I mean, I'm in the final. This is, not, this is nothing. And then um, stupid me, you know, I, I didn't take the fight overly serious. And I showboated a little bit. And I got caught. He took me down. And crucifix and took me out but um i still got through to the final and i still got my contract so it worked out okay and it was a massive introduction i mean it was the most popular um show i think to this day to ever go on on spike tv for ultimate fighter show so series 10 was the most popular season um all the characters that we had on there and so forth so it was a great it was a great experience and it really lit me up in america and let everyone know who i was and even to this day, I still get people recognize me and talk to me about the Elmer Fire show. So that's quite funny. Yeah, man, that's like such a quality. But especially back then, the Ultimate Fight was a lot more, a lot more popular. Like they haven't had one for a while now, you know. But Dana White has said they are bringing it back again. But um, you know, they got them everywhere: Ultimate Fight of Brazil, Ultimate Fight of Philippines. I think even one was, I think, <laughs> and something like that. So they're everywhere now. And I'm sure for yourself, it's nice to nice to be part of something like that, especially one of the most watched ones. Seeing how far it's come. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky, and I do feel that um, a part of a little bit a part of MMA history there, being a part of the show, and it led to good things to me. And of course, I still live in America, and um, um, it was just a great, great way for me to get introduced into the UFC and so forth. It's just if I had my time again, um, I, I just I didn't know enough about MMA at the time. Like if it was to happen now, being much more experienced in MMA and much more experienced in wrestling and jiu-jitsu and so forth, it'd be a much different story. Um, but back then it just it was what it was I was just a, a young kid with a young kid from London or outside London just fighting my way trying to get somewhere in the world you know what I mean so, so it was just um, opportunity came and I, and I jumped at it no, that's it man that's it and that's exactly what you've got to do you said if the UFC call up the answer is yes not I'll think about it as you said so no fair play to you and um, you know you've definitely made your name on the scene and in the UK you're one of our first you know like one, you're one of the first main ones to really go in there because we haven't got too many anymore they're all retiring at the moment so um, yeah, no, you're still, definitely you're, you're definitely still, being remembered I'm still fighting so I've got I've got four fights by the end of the year this year so I've got I'm a busy uh, I've got a busy four months ahead of me I'm pretty much fighting almost every month um, from September onwards as you guys know I'm fighting September 21st in the bare knuckle for Ken Shamrock um, in America how does that feel got, by the way for Ken Shamrock the pioneer of the UFC yeah I mean it, I've been everyone thinks of Ken but I always remember him from the original UFC days when there was no gloves and so forth which is yeah. I think kind of kind of cool when he wore shoes but, as well yeah. yeah which is kind of cool now that he's gone into the bare knuckle boxing world with value his new show his new promotion because it just kind of you think of Ken Shamrock you think of the bare knuckle days and Hoist Gracie and them guys and um, they really paved the way for everybody, you know. So um, to be a part of, of that and also another new company coming to America 
um, I'm excited about this opportunity. Yeah, I bet. And, you know, he's he's been there and done it, you know, old Ken Shamrock. So he obviously appreciates everything that you guys are doing and he knows exactly what you're going through, you know, between every fight. So he knows, I'm sure he'll look after you well. I'm not saying other promoters don't, but he's obviously got a lot of experience in that department. So I'm sure it's great to have him on board. And he was, he hasn't been that, he was active not that long ago, you know. <laughs> so he's yeah, still, no, like, still no, getting no, there. Listen, I think, I think about Ken, I think he's always going to be that guy that, no matter how old he is, if you piss him off, I think he's 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 gonna still want to fight you. <laughs> he's yeah, he's exactly. not gonna take. He's got a temper and he's and he's very passionate about what he does. Um, I had opportunity to talk to him uh, about a month or so ago uh, when I got when I first got the phone call, the message to get involved with them. Um, me and Ken spoke on the phone and we actually fought on the same show in England years ago in Cage Rage. Um, so I knew him from back then as well. We have some mutual friends like Alistair Overeem and stuff like that, uh, mutual friends of ours. And uh, so we've been around each other. So we had a, just a, a just a general chat, and um, it, it was all guns guns blazing. Once we had a phone, uh, a chance to talk on the phone about moving forward with the show, having me on, and uh, yeah, I got the I got a great feeling straight away that he was looking after the fight as well because, as you said. He's been there and done it. He knows the feelings. He knows how fighters should be treated. And I think a lot of promoters out there do know how fighters should be treated. And some treat you right and some don't don't always treat you how they should. Do you know what I mean? They say they're going to do yeah. the right thing. They don't always do the right thing. They, at the end of the day, they're always going to look after themselves first, which is understandable. But it doesn't mean the fighter should be last. It just means they should be, you know, just below the first place. I understand people looking after themselves first because that's business and you've always got to look after yourself first, just as the fighter needs a promoter, a promoter needs a fighter. But um, it's just sometimes because people out there now will sell their souls to, to the devil just to go out there to fight or to say they want to be a part of something um, or to say they're on a poster or whatever, they'll, they'll undercut themselves by a huge amount. You know, they don't value themselves. Therefore, that makes everyone else's value come down, right? I mean, if you look at the old numbers, even some UFC fighters out there, there's some guys fighting for two or $3,000. High-level high level yeah. shows. High-level shows. You know? That's um, crazy. Fuck, I haven't earned that. I haven't earned that in 20 years. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's, you know, and that's when no one knew about the sport. So, but the fact is, because there's promoters out there that just don't give a shit what kind of fighter they have, they just have any fighter to be on the card. If you go out there and say, yeah, I want X amount of figures, and they say, well, no way. That's not in our budget. It's in their budget. It's just they know there's some punk around the corner that will just do it for 500 bucks. Yeah, that's the problem. Because, yeah, so many people out there just... He pre- he's probably got 10,000 more likes on Facebook, so he'd probably get more money. Well, that, but look, but th- there you go. <laughs> Just that on itself. Yeah. That fucking stupidity of mentality itself goes to show you out there about some some people. I've been very fortunate. I've fought some of the biggest promotions in the world from 1FC to KSW. And listen, it's never always it's never always smooth. Like, you know what I mean? But I've got to be honest, I... I've been I, I, I've experienced a lot with a lot of different promotions. There's no one out there that's ever really done me really bad. There's no one out there that's ever really fucked me over in the in the in the, in the promotional world. There isn't. But I know I hear stories. I've seen it. I've seen it happen, and I know it goes on. But I think if you if you leave room for error and you leave people the the room to fuck you over, then you know what? Sometimes it happens. So for me, I try not to leave as little wiggle room as possible. And all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and I do what I can do. And also, like just recently, I was off for the fight in um, Croatia uh, three weeks ago. Would I take a fight on a week's notice against the K1 champion of Croatia? I said, yes, no no problem. (laughs) No, I said, yes, no problem. And they said, okay, well, how much do you want? And I I told them my price. And they said, well, we're not going to pay that. And I said, okay. And then they said, well, how much do you want? And I said, I just told you. That's how, that's how much I want, exactly. We're not, we're not going to. I say it's not negotiable. I'm just saying to you, for me to take a fight, a high-level fight, uh, against this guy, I'm coming to win. You're calling me because you think that maybe I'm going to put on a good fight or whatever. But I'm telling you, I'm going to come and knock the guy out. I'm going to beat the guy. I know him, and I'm always in shape. I train every day, twice a day. I don't take days off. I'm coming. But this is how much I want. <laughs> This is how much I deserve. This is what I warrant. This is how much my worth is. 
if you don't see that, then no problem. Don't call me. I never called you. You call, but because they're so used to people saying, okay, I want X amount. And the guy says, no, I'm not paying that. Okay, give me Y amount. I'm not paying that. Okay, well, give you W amount. No, I'm not paying. They, they got them down to A, Bs, and Cs by the end of the conversation. I've just never done that. This is how much I'm worth. And if you don't want to pay it, then don't pay it. Um, and that's just how I've always been. So I don't allow myself to get ripped off in that respect or not paid what I feel I deserve or I know what I bring to the table. So in my opinion, I know, you know what, what my worth is and I, won't, and I won't take second. I'm not that desperate for it. Do you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that's the mentality, as you said, hope people listen to this and as you feed back to people, that's the mentality you need to be having. You know, and that is the way you'll become the best you can. That's the way you'll fight over 200 fights, you know, and keep going, keep training, keep feeling great. You know what I mean? And well, I think you're I th- obviously just, you're a prime think, example. I just think for myself is that I've had a lot of fights and I have, uh, you know, and uh, I've been around the world and it's all fantastic and great. But the reason why I've had a lot of fights is because I deliver what I'm saying I'm going to deliver. A lot of people like to have me on their shows or when I come, I, I do talk the fight. I do sell the fight. I do deliver the fight. Whether I won, lost or drawed, I've had a war out there. I've always brought the fight like I was out there to win. And um, so I know what I'm worth. I know what I bring to the table and I, and I, and I just won't take – having over 200 fights, it's not like that hasn't worked for me. <laughs> so – so it's it's worked for me. If my value is X amount, I deserve X, and, and that's and that's it. I'm not going to do it for Y, Z, or anything else. I'm going to do it for what I, I'm, I, I'm what I deserve, in my opinion. Yeah, and why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't you ask what you deserve? And you know, good for you, mate. Good for you, staying your ground, obviously not folding. Because the more people fold, the more they're going to do it. You know what I mean? So that's it. So as long, if they think they can do it, if the problem is if people are folding, like you said, there's some around the corner that would do it for a cheaper price. Well, put it this way: I've never said. I want 10 grand and someone's offered me 20. <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? That's never happened. So at the end of the day, if you know how much you're worth, you're going to get it eventually. Or you're not. Then you know what? Then that's the day that I, that I walk away from the sport because this is a very expensive sport. It's a very toxic sport. It puts a lot of pressure on me and my family and, and the training camps are not cheap. And um, I know what my worth is. And if I don't get it then, and I can't get it anymore, then it's the day that I say, okay, then it's time to walk away. Um, but so far, I'm nowhere near that. Like, as I said, I've, I fought once already this year. I've got four fights by the end of the year. Um, that's five fights this year. I've been pretty much having five fights every year for the last eight or nine years. Um, so I'm not, I'm not short of fights. And um, hopefully everyone's always happy when they've had me on. They've always brought me back. So I'm very, I'm very fortunate. Hey man, Randy Couture retired at what, 47, 48, 49, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, I, so... I, I, won't, I won't be 47. There's... <laughs> I'm, sure you that. I'm 38 right now. Um, I reckon I've got a good another three or four years left in me. I'm healthy. I don't smoke. I don't drink. Um, I don't do any drugs or nothing. I've always been a healthy guy. I train. I love to train. Um, I never put a date on it. I've always just said when I'm not doing the sport justice, so I feel like I, I don't want to be there. And it's time for me to hang the gloves up and, and push more into my gyms and more into my fighters. But at the moment, I enjoy what I do and, and, and I, I, I do want to be there. I'm hungry to fight. Yeah, man. And, and we can't wait to keep seeing you fight, mate. And that's the attitude, you know. And people think they have to retire when they do and things, but they really don't. Age is just a number. If you keep, if you keep training and you keep active and just keep in good shape, like you're saying, there's no reason why you should fall out of shape. You see blooming 70-year-olds doing marathons and stuff nowadays, you know. So it's, it's all a mindset. And obviously you've got the right mindset. But what I want to know is that what put you in the mindset then? Like, So you've done, you've been K1, you've done MMA, you're a black belt in jiu-jitsu. So, and what's, what's now brought you into the bare knuckle boxing world? What attracted you to that? Well, years ago, um, I, I go even back even further. When I, I used to run a security company for years before, before yeah. while I was subsidizing before I could be a full-time fighter. From the age of about 18 to 23, before I moved to America, I sold my, 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 my security company. So about from about 18 to 24, so like five, six years, I was always working security and doors and clubs, and I had a security company. And to subsidize that, I managed just to get into – I was doing bare-knuckle boxing illegally back then. Um, it's a bit of a funny story, I guess, on how I got into it. But uh, I ended up knocking a guy out on the on the door at a club, and 
pretty much every week these guys come back to fight me again with somebody new and somebody new and somebody new. And I didn't realize, but they were uh, Irish tinkers, gypsies. And um, I, I had knocked out one of the head of the family of the boxing, and I didn't realize. And they just kept coming back for me to challenge me to get the name back. Well, after three weeks of this happening and me fighting three weeks in a row, I, on the fourth time they turned up with about five or six freaking Land Rovers and all the rest of it, I put a stop to it and said, look, what's going on? Like, I'm not going to keep doing this every fucking week. This is ridiculous. And they, then they explained to me, yes, this is going to keep happening until I go down, until they get their name back and they we've called the name. So I said, well, if you guys are all bare knuckle boxers, you must, you must gamble, you must bet on it. And they said, yeah, fuck we do. So I said, okay, then we'll come into my work. I'll come to you and let's do it real. Let's earn some money. So that's what I started to do. I started to go to different campsites and different places and have bare knuckle fights. And in the old days, they were called straighteners, which was just boxing or all yeah. in, which means obviously all in. You could do anything, head, butt, bite. You could do anything you wanted to do. So I used to always go for the all in because I was a kickboxer, right? <laughs> so I could head, butt, kick, punch and do knees and all kinds of elbows and all sorts. So these guys, most of the time, were just security or boxers or little tough guys from the pubs and bars and stuff like that so they couldn't really hang with us so my, my I, I would take some of my friends with me to make sure that you know nothing really went bad and i would fight once or twice a month to just earn some extra few thousand pound and this is 20 years ago that was a lot of money back then <laughs> so whenever we were a little bit short of cash we'd organize a couple of the guys from we, me and one of my very good friends, uh, Chris Ballard, who used to go and we used to go down there and fight. And um, we would put, we would exchange money. I'd give the bet money to someone I trusted and tell them to leave because I didn't trust that the money wouldn't get out of there. And uh, once I knew they had left and they would call me to say they were home safe, then we would fight. And so I was always involved in that kind of world a little bit. And then um, I got opportunities in, um, to fight in a bare knuckle Muay Thai in Thailand, so I did that, and I won the world title in bare knuckle Muay Thai, um, which isn't really bare knuckle. You fight in the old days with like this uh, rope on your hands. Yeah. So I, I'll become a world champion in bare knuckle Muay Thai, and then of course I got more into K1, and it got more legal, and I could actually subsidize my training by not doing it. There was something quite horrific happened in the bare knuckle one of the bare knuckle fights. Someone got really badly hurt, and um, when we all left. Even my friend said to me, like, we ain't doing that again, are we? And I was like, nah, this is it's time to just step away from it. It's just getting too it's just getting too much, you know? And uh, it was very dangerous back then, you know, you never knew. They pulled guns on us and all kinds of stuff at certain times and you know, they were betting a lot of money back then. So there was a lot of money exchanging taking place. So it was quite a dangerous world. So I got away from it and I concentrated back on my professional career. Fortunately, of course, I started to take off as a professional fighter and uh, I didn't need to do it anymore. So it's kind of come not full circle, but I was already very comfortable with bare knuckle fighting. I've always still trained bare knuckle at certain times because I've always believed if you can punch bare knuckle hard, you can punch hard with gloves on because sometimes people have bad technique with the gloves because the gloves are so padded and protective of their hands. Whereas bare knuckle, you can't make that mistake. You've got to be very accurate with those two front yeah, knuckles man. and you've got to be very penetrative with those knuckles. So I've still always trained bare knuckle. And of course, with martial arts being an enthusiast, I've learned how to do breaks and stuff like that through breaking blocks and wood and all this kind of stuff. So it's always been a part of my training camp. And then, of course, now when bare knuckle went over to England um, and became now an actual legalized sport, and then it come into America would be a legalized sport in certain states and so forth. When I, I, it's funny because before signing with Valio, I had numerous different companies contact me about stepping in. Would I be interested in doing it? And I said, yes, no problem. Let's start negotiations. And we did. Uh, it was getting dragged out a little bit. Um, and then now Valio was the first one to actually meet what I wanted financially, and they were the first ones to put a contract on board. But even with that, they weren't looking to do a multiple fight deal. They said, this is our first show. We're going to do one show at a time. We'll sign a one fight deal. And I said, yes, no problem, because there was another company in England had offered me a fight too. 
but it wasn't till later in the year or another part of the year or so forth. But it didn't really, it didn't matter. I, I just was, okay, I'm interested in doing it. Let's have a go. So now Valio has pushed forward and we signed the contract. So I was very excited about doing it. And to be honest, my last K1 fight, I fought um, Daniel Longa. Daniel Longa is ranked number two in the world under glory. Um, and I knocked him out. I knocked him down two or three times in the fight and I knocked him out in the third round. Prior to that, I knocked out another K1 champion early part of that year. I, I know I know for a fact there's no one of my striking caliber in the, in the bare knuckle world, in the heavyweight division. There's no one that can stand on me whatsoever. I can't wait, especially after hearing what you were telling me then about all the um, when you travel around to sites and things like that. I'm not saying, do you remember? I'm not saying you're saying you're overly proud of it, obviously, that sort of thing. You're earning your money, that's the most important thing, but you know, it, you, would it learned, you would learn a lot. Nothing that I'm proud of. It's not so I'm proud of it, I'm not proud of it. To be honest, when I look back on my life, there's, there's things I'm I'm not proud of, or I am proud, or I have no feelings for whatsoever. Bare knuckle boxing back in those days, I had no feelings towards it whatsoever. It was just something that I needed to do to subsidize my lifestyle. It fed my family and it fed me and and it allowed me to earn money to subsidize my training and my business. So, um, and sometimes, you know, things went wrong on the door and you had an argument and rather than get arrested for it, we organized a, a real straight fight, you know. And then when you saw like Kimbo and stuff like that doing it on YouTube, of course, you saw how much popularity it came and in the back of my mind I was like shit man we were doing that in the UK and it was funny because when I was in the Ultimate Firehouse Kimbo was on the show and he was one of the people that I honestly thought that I wouldn't like you know when he came in and the way he came into the house they put a massive target on his back and of course everyone had seen these fights on YouTube and so forth and I really didn't want to like him but when I actually after a couple of days of being around him you couldn't help but gravitate towards the guy. He was such a likable, nice character and so humble and so open to honest about his abilities and, and, and you know, shared stories. He was a, one of the most likable people on the show. He was such a, such a nice guy. Um, I familiarized with him. I mean, him actually got quite close and I felt that we had a lot of some of the stories that he was telling. I didn't say to anybody because I like, oh, yeah, me too. You, you want to be that kind of guy, right? But there were certain things he would say, and I thought, oh, fuck me. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> yeah, that's happened to me. <laughs> so, um, you know, of course, he's not here with us anymore. Bless him, man. Uh, rest, uh, rest in peace. And um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a shame. But now the world's come full circle, and, and it is apparent. I'm very excited to get in the bare knuckle ring. Yeah, man. Yeah, and good shout out to obviously Kimbo Slice there, rest his soul. You know what I mean? The original backyard brawler of the states, as they say. You know, how many views has that guy got on YouTube? You know, <laughs> I know, I know that's not, I know that's not the point, but you know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> yeah, but it's <laughs> so, not about the views. It's more about yeah. the interest in what was happening. That's yeah, what of course. Seen. That's what I see in views. Like, so you can talk about the views. It's not about its popularity. It's just about what they were doing. There's people interested in watching it, and that's yeah. why it's amazing now that there is these companies out there that have got it and they're getting millions of views you know on pay-per-view or millions of views after on youtube and so forth and it and that's what athletes deserve and bare knuckle boxing i mean boxing has been around for a historic amount of years and i've always been yeah. a boxing enthusiast my father was a boxing enthusiast i've watched fights that have gone back into the early 1900s and i've watched so and that's how boxing began so um, to see it get it come back and get a bit of recognition, I think it's fantastic. I'm, I'm honoured yet again to be a part of it. Um, I think it's a part of history and, and it's always going to be out there. So um, I'm very excited. I just know, to be honest, that uh, I'm going to bring a level that this, the heavyweights in the bare knuckle world is not used to. They're not, they just think that I'm going to be some kind of kickboxing guy or, or MMA guy getting into bare knuckle boxing. But I'm undefeated in bare knuckle boxing. I've never lost one. And I've had a lot, <laughs> and I do mean and those a lot. boys. Yeah. And those boys aren't <laughs> soft either that you were fighting. No, these these weren't the most um, these weren't the most technical, high striking guys in the world. Let's get something straight. But I can tell you now, these guys were tough as fucking nails. These guys were losing teeth, and, and they weren't stopping. These guys were getting their ears pulled off and headbutt and nose bites and all kinds of stuff on the all in fights, kicked in the bollocks and knee and and arms broken and still trying to fight. Like these guys were tough as nails. And I do mean tough. Not, I've seen some of the guys in this, I can't talk about everybody. Of course, I'm not, I'm not here to put everyone down, but I'm just trying to say, I've seen some of the fights. I don't know 
how some of these fights are taking place where they go in the distance. I've never had a bare knuckle fight ever in my life go the distance. How the fuck is there a point scoring thing on this? It's just ridiculous to me. I've seen, I, I can name two heavyweights right now that have been involved in it and they went the distance twice. Heavyweight boxers, heavyweight fighters with no gloves go the distance. You should be ashamed of yourself. It's terrible. Yeah, if you ever want to put a bet on UFC, put a, put a bet on heavyweights <laughs> going three rounds or five rounds. So you'll yes. win some money on that. Yes, because it's so unlikely. Now take their gloves off and, and imagine, like, imagine Mike Tyson with no gloves on. Would you, bet kill someone. Gonna, would you bet he's going to go the distance? Exactly. Say that again. He would he kill someone. Kills someone. Why would yeah. he probably kill someone? Because his striking was over the elite level of boxing, right? Yeah. Where if he hit you with no gloves, he'd knock you out. Now, if you took a high-level K1 fighter with no gloves, he's the most elite-level striker in the world. Right now, as it stands, I'm ranked number seven in the world in K1. I've been out of K1 for over 10, 15 years, and I'm still ranked number seven. After knocking out, I knocked out Daniel Longo, who's ranked number three in the world. And I'd only be back in the sport six months after 15 years of being out of K1. Yeah. And I knocked out the guy who's number three. There's no one in this, there's no one in this bare knuckle boxing game. I've just saw the lineup for the heavyweight thing and value. There's no one in there that uh, would last a round with me. And it's not down, oh, I'm this and I'm the best and I'm not. It's just a fact. It's just a yeah. fact of level of striking. It's it, they, they they won't and and if they, they would not last. It's just it's not even about like oh, me talking through ego. I'm putting me out of it. I'm looking at the last. If I look at your last two striking fights against my last two striking fights, no betting man in the world would take that fight. Do you know what? This is going to be absolutely epic. I'm getting hyped up just listening to you. Definitely, you can definitely sell the fight. <laughs> yeah, but it's, <laughs> I know, not, I know, it's not even I know that's not what you're trying I'm, to do. I'm talking as, as it stands. Forget me. Take me out of it and put you in it. And I'm talking about you uh, who has my striking background and you performed the way I performed in my last two striking fights. And now if I was uh, looking onto you, uh, I can't say that. I can't say that those guys would beat you. I mean... Uh, they, they got a heavyweight tournament, right? Now we're the reserve yeah. fight for the heavyweight tournament. I'm fighting uh, another guy for the. So if whoever wins out of me and him, if someone gets hurt between now and the tournament, I'm I'm the one who's going to be stepping in. Hello, my name's Chris Allen, and this is the Martial Arts Chat Podcast. Today I'm being joined by another member of the Valor Fight Series that's coming up soon, which Ken Shamrock has um, brought uh, brought to us all. Mighty Mo, a legend of the sport, well, many sports actually. He's been a kickboxer, an MMA fighter, a boxer, and now it's bare knuckle boxing. So, Mo, thank you very much for joining us. I oh, appreciate you guys for having me on. No, so I really appreciate you coming on. Um, as I know, you're quite a time difference behind us, so it's quite early in the morning. I'm sure you're doing a lot of preparation. Yeah. So, where are you right now? You're at the train. You're at the gym right now, aren't you? Yes, I'm at the I'm at the Doge Hill. So, what's um? Sorry. Yakuza Dojo. Yakuza Dojo, nice man. Where's that base? Is that in California? Yes, sir, in San Bernardino, California. Nice man. So, how, how long have you been training there for? Uh, for about up and on for for about a year. And about what year. what? Okay, so what what sort of training do you do there? Like, is it more aimed at the MMA world or K one, or is it a mixture of everything? A uh, mixture of everything, but yeah, a mixture of everything. But and, when, I, when I get ready to spar boxing, and I, I go to the local gyms, boxing gyms. Okay, why 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 is that? Do you find you um you coming up against guys of obviously who've been doing boxing more predominantly than the MMA guys? Is that something you just prefer to do? Uh, well, no, <clears throat> not just at the at the moment. That's the opportunity right now for me, and I like to, like to stay busy. No, that's it. So what have you been up to then recently? I think you had a fight, your last matchup, um, competitive matchup was last December. So what have you been up to between then, that time? Uh, just, man, just healing up and getting ready for the next fight. Ready. Yeah, but I can't wait for the next fight. You know, it's um, it's going to be interesting, obviously, seeing you in the bare knuckle world. And So but talking about where you are now in the gym, what, what training have you got planned for today? Uh, just about cardio, swimming, and... Uh, Technique, just going over um, basic um, technique of strength, strength and conditioning. Oh, fair play to you. Yeah. 
more you more you than me sir to be fair i'm 32 and i don't think i could go longer than five minutes nowadays <laughs> so good for you sir and and you know obviously you've been fighting for a long time now mo haven't you like a long time so what, what's what's the secret you know what's the secret to your to your longevity of your fight career oh shoot man i don't know man the man upstairs <laughs> good man i keep going man because obviously the way the way you fight, we know you're quite you train really hard for your fights. You come in really like well well fit and ready to go. Do you find you just get yourself ready to them and you put and you put yourself in the correct situations, which has sort of led to where you are now? Um, yeah, most of the time, you know, when you ain't dealing with the uh, the outside struggles of uh of the fight world, you know what I mean? Oh, just dealing with every <clears throat> the normal life, it gets it gets. It gets a little complicated when you try to focus on fighting and <clears throat> dealing with the, you know, the everyday life. The real world, as they say. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> getting in that, getting that cage or that ring must feel like the easy part of the job for you, doesn't it? Sometimes. Uh, a thousand times easier. <laughs> well we definitely like watching you doing it anyway obviously i don't know what your home life's about but i'm sure it's very i'm sure it's great home life you've got but i'm sure it's very busy Have you got yourself a family mo and everything as well yeah i got i got my family i got my kids and uh you know I got a, uh yeah i got a bundle of kids <laughs> sometimes uh, well. they're, they're another another job right there to deal with but you know that's life for you man yeah, but it must be so cool having your dad as like one of the biggest superstars in combat sports. You know, they must be proud of that with you. Like, how old's the youngest and how old's the oldest? Well, I got, I, I got two different marriages. My, I'm on my second one, and um, my youngest is five, and my oldest for my first marriage is twenty-six. Okay, cool, man. So you've almost started that journey again with the young, young, young one again, eh? How does? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, going through it all over again. <laughs> so what do they think about sorry, carry on. Oh it's um I don't know, man, it's normal for me. I I enjoy my kids and um raising them. It's always been something I've Do they compete yeah. at all? Do they do anything at all, like martial arts wise or anything like that? Follows in your footsteps yeah. at all? Yeah, all, all of them trained uh, 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 as self defense, but um, my oldest right now, he's competing right now. But all my younger ones, they're all uh, they all come to the school. And they take a kid's class and they compete. I, I try to keep them um, active in the sport, just for you know health reasons and self defense. And do you think it's important as well? Kids of a young age nowadays aren't just hanging around on the streets or just playing computer games all the time. It's important they get into some sort of sport where they can feel some sense of achievement as such. Yeah, of course, man. Uh, at the same token, I got to be as uh, as a parent. I, I, main thing I want to stay in their head, you know. Let them know that you know. What I mean, there's this, there's that, <laughs> you know. There's more to life as such. Yeah, yeah. There's more to life than just. Uh, I mean, training and one thing it, it helps with your mental um, and your health. Keeps and, you out you know, of trouble. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, keeping out of trouble. I mean, you know, I, you teach that at home with with the, the rights and the wrongs. You know what I mean? And just staying in their ear all the time. It must be nice for you though to see that they've they're interested in something you've been interested. Um, you've obviously dedicated your whole whole life to, you know. And um, would you would you see would you see them compete one that, like you say your eldest competes at the moment. Um, what does he compete in? If you mind me asking. Oh yeah, he's competing in football. Uh, my oldest he he's competing in MMA when he was like 12, 13 years old. Oh wow. He's also fighting on the same K one card as me in uh, Hawaii. Really. Where, yeah, they actually put him in. A, the guys that organized it sort of played played some funny business with me where they, they sort of put him in with a guy that was way more experienced than he was, where he actually got hurt. That's where I knocked out everybody. <laughs> I, that, that tournament in Hawaii where I sort of, uh, sort of knocked everybody out. 
Yeah, that was the 2007, wasn't yeah. it, Grand Prix? Yeah, 2007. So, yeah, what was that yeah. like then? What that First of all, before the fights even started sort of thing, um, how did that feel, you know, fighting on the same card as your son, you know? This it, was group... a wonderful, it was a wonderful thing. I mean, I was, I, was a, I was a proud father. But when the, his opponent, they said, was 17 years old, the day of the fight, the guy takes off his robe and he's got tattooed. He's got Muay Thai tattooed on his back. And I said, this guy, he's 17 years old. How old was <laughs> so your boy at the time? Out. Huh? How old was your boy at the time? He just turned 14. Oh. The guy I heard was 21. But they, they said he was 17. And he was he was green. That's, yeah. Oh, that's disgusting, man. Yeah. Very disgusting, man. And I was... I couldn't believe these guys did it. And they said, if they swore up and down, this guy's only 17 and he's green. He's never had no fights, but they made him an exhibition fight. And, That's... um, yeah. But, well, so what happened then when you saw this? Did you, obviously, did you let the fight go on or what, what happened? Oh, well, when I seen him, I grabbed the towel. But my son was, you know, he's being aggressive. He's, he's got, he's been boxing ever since he was like four or five, but he's been kickboxing less than a month but he was willing to take it just to be on the same card with me and i and, and k1 the k1 guys promised me they would put in somebody that he could beat on that wouldn't be that serious of a fighter come to find out the guy was 21 and had a record already of fighting and he and, and he wasn't 17. the guys who organized him uh yeah yeah it seemed like they're trying to sell the show by having father and son on the same card sort of thing you know yeah, and they didn't really care about what happened to my son. But he still went in there and did his best, I'm sure. Yeah, of course. He got hurt, and he was like, well, where are we going? But, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe these guys did that. So yeah, I man. eventually uh, showed them what a father's rage is, you know what I mean? Yeah, I've, I've seen the highlights, and I recommend anyone to watch the highlights as well of that of that Grand Prix. <laughs> yeah. If you're honest, yeah. This is why you don't upset Mighty Mo. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That was crazy. Oh, yeah. just... uh, Go on. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say that's what happens, man. If, if that's just if that's if if that's you're upset, you know, generally like upsetting a family member, cough, that must have been beast mode, you know, Hulk mode. Oh, bro, man, I, I KO'd everybody. <laughs> Alexander Piskunov. <laughs> yeah, I I remember, and um, obviously doing in Hawaii must have been nice as well. Um, and that was that that was your second one as well, wasn't it? Your second Grand Prix you won. Yeah, yeah, that, that was my second one. Yeah, man, you had a, such a great... Had, I say, if you look through your career... Obviously, I don't need to tell you, but the people that are listening, you know, we're talking about a guy as a kickboxer who had 42 fights, 18 MMA fights, you know. You had three fights in professional boxing as well, like a couple of knockouts. Yeah. It's just... You really yeah. have you really have done it all, and not to, rem and to remind everyone, in MMA, you had 12 wins, all by finishes as well. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? You won a competition, so you spent... <laughs> sorry. I mean, I could have did better, but, you know, just like I was saying, man, just dealing with a lot of the outside um, uh, struggles, man. I, I lost focus a few times, as you can tell by my weight. <clears throat> and, um, but um, I think that's another reason why I never really retired and because I felt I've always been cheesed out of, um, you know, who I, who, what, what my real potential was. Yeah. Just by dealing with a lot of outside um, um, well, you had a great run in Road FC, though. You know, you you won all their open weight tournaments and everything, didn't you? It was a fantastic run. Yeah, I was. Yeah, like I said, man, going into that last fight where I lost, man, it was. Uh, I was going. I was going through a lot of outside issues, and I, I I didn't even sleep that whole night before that fight. Oh man, and Gilbert Ravel's no like, there's no yeah. no walkover. <laughs> yeah, but he knew what it was, and but. Oh, man, you know, I was disappointed. Yeah, you shouldn't be, though. What what a great run you're home beforehand, though, and he was a solid fighter, you know. I, I wouldn't, I'd hold your head higher, you know. You're thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away, from, well, not thousands of thousands of miles, but you're a long way from home, you know. And, um, but that's, that's what I want to talk about, really, is what actually took you to, um, you know, took you abroad, because obviously you went to fight for, I think it was Heroes 8, then you went to Dream and places like that. Like what, what what made you decide, you know, you're going to move to Japan and fight over there? Uh, in Japan? What do you mean? 
far as K1. Well, yeah, yeah. So sorry, and K1 as well. Sorry, yeah. All, all your fighting career. Oh, in Korea, uh, no, no, just the opportunity was there, you know, um, uh, I would, UFC wouldn't, wouldn't give me what I wanted, and they, they wouldn't give me no offer or nothing, so I just went, the next opportunity I had, and the you UFC know, had, had um, opportunity right there, and I took it. Well, you had a stint in, um, also you had a stint in Bellator as well, didn't you? You had a good stint there. Yes, I, 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 t I took a loss in the Bellator. Uh, fighting um, uh, what's his name again? Russian Volkov. Kid. Yeah, Volkov. Uh, uh, once again, man, lost focus, dealing with too much outside pressure, and paid the price. Yeah, man. But again, that guy's tearing through the UFC at the moment as well. So it just shows you're still hanging in there with with the best. You know, yeah. just if you if yeah. as you said, if you had your complete focus there, completely yeah. different story. Yes, no, you're absolutely. Well, yeah, that's what it is, boss. You, I mean, you, you get. I mean, I, I've made it look. Uh, when I'm on top of my game, I make it look easy. Yeah, well, we can tell with the amount of finish. Obviously, you finish everyone, don't you? And there's no yeah. decision wins. And even in boxing, you know, the only loss you had was on points. The other two guys, you knocked out. Yeah. So that's what I mean. You could, you, anyone who looks, who's, who knows who you are, obviously properly, watched your career and seen everything you've done. It has been. You can't really deny it's not been a successful career. <laughs> you know, you've done really well. You've done a lot of experience, travelled all around the world. And was there anywhere in particular in the world where you really felt you learnt the most about about yourself in the sport? Um, I would say. Um... Uh, just I, I I knew who I was when I was uh, at the top of my game. Yeah, man. And just you know, I fought everywhere, and and I and I understood where where a lot of the times I, I went in and um, just dealing with a lot of a lot of negativity going into these fights and come from the closest ones to me. But you know, um, and at the end of the day, man, you're a fighter and you got to be able to focus. And, that's it. And uh, cut all that stuff out, you know. But uh, I was at an older age now. I see that now, and, and and I think that's one of the main reasons why I ain't retired. Because I have a lot to prove to myself. That I, if I stay focused, no matter what, I can I can finish strong. Yeah, man. Age is just a number, mate. That's all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. you know, at Randy Couture, forty he was forty nine years old. He probably could have carried on. To be fair to him. Um, oh, right. I'm right now at this moment I'm destroying everybody exactly I feel, I feel the strongest right now that's it and um, I stay I watched uh, just watching some of your more recent fights as well it's just the the spark hasn't gone you've still got the same explosiveness but it seems like now you are a lot more focused on your fights would you say and focused on what's going on yes yeah, sir yeah man it's really really showing through so obviously you've had such this great career for all these different sports different countries you know different disciplines how did you find though tran um, transitioning between all these disciplines through your career, like from the K1 rules to MA rules, just to boxing rules? How did you find like moving between all the different rules and things like that? It's funny. It's funny you say that because uh, my life was growing up doing all that in one package. Um, we wrestled, we we fist fight, we box, we kick. Ever since I was a youngster. I did everything, and I played American football, and I, I just, you know, I was, I was, a, 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 at my age now, I still, I still do a lot of those things, basketball, football, you know, sometimes I, I play with my kids, and those, those sports, and it's uh, never ending, I mean, to me, it's normal, it's like an everyday thing, but I grew up with Boxing and wrestling, man. Yeah. So is that what you were doing then before combats, before you entered the world of like MMA or kickboxing? It was just mainly yes. wrestling, yeah? Yes, sir. Boxing was that like, and wrestling. Was and wrestling, I was, was it a school you were doing wrestling, like high school and things like that? Yeah, American football, uh, American wrestling, collegiate wrestling. Yeah, man, that's the thing. You guys over there, I know it's getting better in the UK and Europe, but you guys have the, the such fantastic collegiate wrestling skills over there. 
and um, yeah. it proves that a lot of our UK fighters and European fighters heading over to the States and, you know, spending training camps with guys like yourself, you know. Yeah. So, obviously, now then, you've gone between all these disciplines, you've grown up, you've grown up, obviously, fighting them all. It's sort of like driving a car then, yeah? So, going into bare knuckle now, what, what sort of changes have you made for this? Because, obviously, with bare knuckle, it's more precise punching. You can't just, obviously, punch anywhere in the head. How have you, yeah. prepared, have you, have you prepared for this, wearing gloves your whole career? Uh, well, just, uh, just a lot of shadow boxing and... You know, shut a box with, with an opponent in front of you, barefisted. And uh, it's a lot of sparring. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I don't need to give too much away. I don't need to give it <laughs> to your opponent sort of thing, you know. Um, I don't need to know your game plan sort of thing. Yeah. But what But what interested you with Bare Knuckle? Why, why, did you, why did you approach them or they approach you? Like, What made you want to do this sport? Uh, just the opportunity to compete still because a lot of the, right now, I mean, for me, that, that, that that's the next thing available for me. Uh, but uh, I, I'm I'm ready for whatever. I've, I've been competing my whole life. <laughs> and bare knuckle is, is actually something I, you know, as a, as a street fighter, is uh, something I started off with. And I was very dominant. Before I even turned pro, or even thought about going pro. <laughs> <laughs> so you're confident going in. You so say you are conf you're confident going into this fight, and obviously after the fight, if, if you win the fight, or should I say when you win the fight, is it something you'd like to keep on doing and competing in that, or would you just wait until any opportunity comes your way? Yeah, I would wait till any opportunity come, or I would keep on doing it if if, if nothing else comes, because I, I you know. I just I just want to compete, and I mean I, I I can't stop competing until I mean until the good man upstairs tells me I can't. As far as he know, as far as I know, um, I'm I'm healthy. I'm as healthy as a horse, and strong as ever. Well, no, and you've, I said as I said in your one one of your like more previous fights, like more recent fights, you can tell there's there's you still got the same spring in your step you did back in back in the day sort of thing, you know. Back in the Road FC yeah. days, back in the Bellator days, yeah. so um, I feel way better. Trust me, you're gonna see some, you're gonna see some fireworks this one, and this. <laughs> I, I, hey, like I said, like I told him, like he's already talking smack. I said, hey, make sure you don't blink. <laughs> that's, that's how fast my hands are coming. I'm powerful. <laughs> So, do you know much about your opponent? Like, tell us, tell us who your opponent is. Obviously, people who don't know, and um, yeah, obviously, Soko tell us Joe, a bit about him. Or Soko, Soko Ju, whatever his name is. Yep, uh, Thierry Chokoju, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I see him. He's active, lighter, lighter weight class, but he's messing with a lot more, more muscle and power now, and speed. So, I see the way he moves. I see, I think, but you know. Everybody knows how I, I, I can adjust uh, different styles, especially now that I'm more, more focused, um, training very hard, nonstop. But, um, yeah, he's messing yeah. with a lot of power right now, a lot of power. So how much bigger than him are you, and like, like, what weight class does he usually fight at, for people who don't know? And, you know, is he coming up, is he having to put on quite a lot of weight for this, or are you going to be oh, weighing no, no. Well, right now I'm at uh, 264. What's the limit? Right. I, I'm at 264 right now. Okay. And what soccer do you actually reckon? Uh, about 235 or 240, I think, or something. And you and you feel the, you've got the speed on him still as well. Oh yes, I see the way he moves. Okay. I see, I see and, and and me at 265 is very light. I mean. <laughs> Last time I was 265, 264, when I fought Raymond Bonyanski, or when I was in Bellator, and I KO'd the guy. Hence the open weight tournaments. What were you, what were you, do you want me asking, what were you weighing in Road FC in some of those fights? Uh, up, up in the 290s. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. No, no, no wonder you're knocking everyone no, no wonder you're knocking everyone out, but some of those guys you were knocking out were bigger than you, taller than you. It's crazy. Uh, Brother man, 
I am a lot faster and stronger now and quicker. Well, you've proved all you need to do is touch their chin, really, don't you? The way people just crumple, especially in in the in the Hawaiian Grand Prix as well. Oh my God! So, oh, yeah. what's going to happen without the gloves on now? Exactly. Devastation. <laughs> hey, my hands are going to be a lot faster. And my hands, I'll, my hands yep. will be a lot faster. A lot faster, more focused, you know, and and you finally get comfortable sitting at the weight you are now. Because you've still got a while, haven't you? So you must be comfortable now. Oh, yeah. I'm, 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 man, I'm way lighter now. I'm way lighter now and I'm faster and stronger. Footwork is... We'll see. Yeah, man. Okay, it's not give, I don't want to give him too much away. <laughs> oh, well, well, you know... <laughs> It's going to be, uh, I feel good, fast, strong, and powerful. <clears throat> no, that's it. And this, I spoke to Ken Shamrock on an interview like I'm doing with yourself yesterday, and he was explaining how I was asking, like, what's the difference between your bare knuckle and other organizations? And um, he's very adamant. It's all about he's going to have no ham wraps. Did you know about that? Oh, uh, uh... So there'll be no oh, wraps. It'll be purely, it'll, it'll, so I was speaking to Ken Shamrock yesterday and we were talking about the difference between his bare knuckle organization compared to other ones. And he says the diff, his main difference is he doesn't want any ham wraps on the fighters. It's just going to be pure bare knuckle. You know, what do you think uh, about that? Oh, man, like I told you, I grew up doing that first. <laughs> That's but, it. <laughs> bro, relentlessly, undefeated. I'm undefeated on the streets. That's what made me go into pro fighting because when I was younger, uh, I, I was relentless. What people fail to realize that I went pro in kickboxing with no amateur background. That's what people fail to realize. That's what all my fans fail to realize. Every fighter out there. I went pro in the professional world of kickboxing, KOing guys with just my hands and learning how to defend the kick. See, it was the like the genius of New Day Mike Tyson, it felt like. Just coming in oh, and yeah. knocking neck and knocking everyone out. Oh yeah. Come on, boss. You can look it up <laughs> if you want. I don't have no amateur background going into the kickboxing world. <laughs> My it must be like... <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I see again, so I've learned something myself, you know, and I've I've known you for a while. Now it's really interesting to know straight in that's probably why they probably underestimated you and they probably thought, Jesus, this guy. Who's this guy? <laughs> Exactly. I mean, even though I took some some kicks to the face and the legs, you know what I mean. But it's still, I was I was like, I was, I was built like a tank. Yeah. What doesn't what only what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and it obviously yeah. makes sense with you. So, and also, it must be some sort of Samoan power that you guys have. You know, you got the, you got Mark Hunt, the Super Samoan. He knocks people out when he touches people on the chin. And the same yeah. thing with you as well. What is it? What, what's over there in the water or the food you're eating, guys? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, you know, man, I just know that, that I was able to, do, I was blessed to be able to do do what I did. Um, you know what I mean? Coming in and uh, dominating like I did. But, and like I said, one of my main issues was that I, I couldn't, I didn't understand how to stay focused enough to, to stay on top of the game, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and no matter how strong you are, how much, you know, how hard you can hit, if you don't stay focused, you, you, I mean, you know the deal. Yeah, man. And you know what, I'm not trying to have a dig, and it does reflect in your career, because you have your winning streaks, you know, and then you're on focus, and then you have these tiny yeah. little spells you know we have one or two losses and then again a winning streak you know and is yeah. that is that is that due is that really showing like when in your life this sort of stuff was going on and like really affecting you oh, oh, without well, making man, excuses yeah. obviously we hit it right on the nail i mean but um i mean we all go through our struggles but i, I, I me as a, as a fighter um i i, I didn't um you, didn't know how to deal with a lot of that issues, you know, and, and not too many guys that that were ahead of me in the fight game that I could uh, that that would mentor me or or, or uh, you know you know keep me above water. 
and uh, I sort of had to learn everything on my own at the time. But you know, that's life. You know, can't complain. But that's just what it was for me. When when you were fighting in Japan and China and Korea and things, were you did you move over there or were you over there? Were you did you go with like family or were you literally on your own? Uh, I was I was eventually on my own. Uh, my family was too used to the American life, and they didn't want to go out there. And but uh, I wish I would have took them. But um, yeah, man. But you know, your family supports you. Yeah, I mean, they, they supported me. I always wanted to take them, but it was it was it was, it was a lot. It was it, it's complicated. Yeah, and with kids as well and stuff, you know, moving them around, it's never easy, yeah. is it? Yeah, and we also had family members too that were, I mean, extended family members that we had to deal with, and it was, it was always complicated. Oh, yeah, man, you sound like you've got a lot of things to deal with outside of the cage as well as in, and as as and I hope you hope it's I hope now you're nice you're focused and things are looking nice and clearer you sound like it's good you've got yourself a five year old boy you know when your your eldest is competing which you're very proud of of course yeah so, and you're bare knuckle we'll fighting see, soon we'll, and, yeah. uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes you know what I mean our kids are man one minute they want it the next minute they don't you know what I mean? uh, they'll always will it, I'm 32 right and I, I still always call my mother most days and my father you know <coughs> if there's ever a problem, trust me, we're the first people you ring. <laughs> yeah. Trust me, it always comes down to that in the end. I always find that anyway. <laughs> but Mo, yeah. man, you, you, you've, you've obviously you set a good example, though, you know, with your career, by, you know, taking opportunities when they come at you, you know, and uh, making the most of everything. And, you know, you, if anything, it's inspiring to a lot of people out there to see what you've done. And it's also to see that you've come back at, obviously not say not come back, you're still fighting later on in your fighting career and you're still, and you're faster and stronger than ever. You know, that must be, a, that must feel good in yourself as well as to show other people that they can still do it as well. Oh yeah. I, I hope so. You know, man, it's always good to, to, to hear people say, man, you know, that, wow, man, you're still doing it. And, I, and I've run across a lot of my friends and people that know me, man. And, and they tell me that, that, that I motivate them. And I say, man, you know what I mean? It's, um, it's a good thing then, you know what I'm saying? Just to yeah, see man. you guys take care of your health and cut the weight down and, you know? Yeah, man. It's per and I said, you're sitting at 264 now. You're not cutting weight in the last week, you know? So you're definitely keeping yourself healthy. And you definitely sound very focused from what you've been talking to me about, you know, having to deal with things. You sound very focused now, and I'm sure it's going to be a very good evening for you. I'm personally looking forward to the fight. Um, it's, it's going to be a very, very good fight, but I'm speaking to, I'm going to be speaking to your opponent as well. But it's very interesting to learn what I've learned about you, Mo, because now I'm sort of looking at you in a whole completely different light to what I've watched you in the last decade. <laughs> I you know. too, man. I appreciate you, man. Thanks. No, it's interesting. That's 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 that. <coughs> excuse me. That's what's most interesting about chatting to you guys. It's like we've I've watched you. Most of us watched you your whole lives, you know. And it's you talk to you guys, and it's it just puts everything into perspective, you know. It's your normal people, you know, and you do have your normal struggles outside the cage or the ring, as well as in, you know, as well as inside. Oh yeah, without a doubt. That's it. I tell you what's cool though. With my I mean, like without saying like a like a giddy little schoolboy thing it must be cool that you're fighting for someone like under Ken Shamrock a name like that oh yeah I remember Ken Shamrock way back in the days in my early days 2000 when um when he used to come to uh, to the Shark Tank uh, one of the gyms uh way back then that I used to go to um and he used to come train there I met him a couple of times but him and Chemo and all the old school guys Man, those guys were beasts as well back in the day, Chemo and Shamrock. Yeah. Yeah, man. That must have been pretty cool, though. And obviously, Hall of Famer in the UFC. He's done it all. He's done, even gone to WWF, the guy, you know? And then he's yeah. still fighting in the cage. It's incredible what he's done. So, yeah. And um, how well, how, how does it feel, you know, fighting in their debut event? You know, their, their, their first ever event they're putting on. It's having so much interest already. Like, look at like I'm calling you all the way from the United Kingdom. It shows you how far this is spreading, and you haven't even had an event yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was surprised. Um, it's uh, it's an honor, and but you know, just for me to compete at, at uh, in great shape and to represent this organization is, uh, 
uh, an honor for me. Um, I mean, you know, I, I'm a fighter. I just want to go in there and represent who I am <laughs> in a real way. That's it. And um, you got you got lots of support for you going 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 along with this as well. Oh yes, I got people in my city and family, you know, close family members, and I'll, I'll have my brother and my coach um, Joji from Ikusa Dojo, and and two of my young uh, two of my younger boys there uh, with me. Have they any of the have your boys younger boys ever seen you fight before? Oh yeah, they have all seen me fight. They always watch my videos. No, but have they ever gone to the arena to see you fight before? Oh yeah, at, at a venue. Uh, yes. My, my two younger ones that will be there. This will be their first time. I actually Oof. got three out. My, my bad. I got my oldest, the one that's competing now, he'll be there. Well, that's nice then, mate. You can have all the family there. And it's going to be a nice moment, you know, when you win. So, no, no, oh, I look yeah. forward to it. Yeah, man, it's going to be great. And, um, again, another great opportunity comes your way. So, yeah, man. Yes. Grab it with both hands. I'll tell you what, though, uh, Mo, I know you're sitting at the gym at the moment, and I will let you get on to training. But before I let you go, um, I just want to ask the question, which I know a lot of people will. Obviously, your real name isn't Mighty Mo. So, um, what, no. what's the what's the backstory on Mighty Mo? Oh, uh, well, no, Mo, Mo is something I've always uh, went by ever since I was a youngin. But my, my, I have a first name. I'm, I'm a junior named after my dad. But Mo is, I'm, Mo was only when I had to go to school and the teacher would call my name. They'll call Ciala. Ciala is my first name. That's my dad's, uh, I'm, I'm a junior after my dad. But Mo, yeah. has been, Mo has been my name ever since I was, I can remember. And uh, going into the fight game. Uh, um, Mighty Mo came from from a lot of things. Um, for me, being a dominant American football player, my defensive line coach gave me that, and uh, a lot of the things I did in my life that normal people wouldn't go to, and it was like I can't believe you made it, <laughs> you know. So, but it was mainly because my 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 defensive line coach gave me that name. Because I would, I would just rip through that D line, defense alignment like nothing. And if you know anything about American football, those guys are three fifty plus. Everybody yeah, in that line. And I, I'm a two ninety pound defense alignment, six two, six one, and a half, uh, just crushing through there. I know, man. It's actually probably a safer sport, bare knuckle boxing, than going head on with these guys. Well, I honestly say you could actually break your neck, <laughs> break your, tear your kneecap out, uh, or back in football. I mean, fighting is brutal, but you get cut here and there or concussion. But football is very – you get major concussions in football too. Major. I would, major. Yeah. I always wanted to have a go at American football because, I mean, in England I played rugby myself. And, oh yeah. Um, yeah, you should have a go at that one day, Mo. I think I reckon you'd be brutal at rugby. Oh, oh, I was. I played rugby before. <laughs> oh, I you really did. Loved, yeah, I was a prop. I really oh, loved. so was I, mate. I was a prop as well, second row. Me too, man. Yeah, I like I like rugby. Rugby, rugby was fun. But which I got one did? That. Which one did you find more? Um, I want to hear from the Americans' point of view. Um, which which one did you find was more brutal? Like more, more like I don't know, brutal. More like hard work and more enduring. Oh man, uh, American football by far. It's, oh. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> oh man, I'm for real. I'm for real. American football, they, they deal with a lot of angles, attacking in angles. So your vision's got to be sharp, like real sharp, because a guy that could be standing right beside you could rip your kneecap the other way. If you ain't smart. Yeah, because the difference between obviously American football and rugby is rugby you can only pass backwards and you can't do off the tackle, off ball tackles. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and there's a certain range where you got to, you can't just come from the side and, and tackle somebody. You got to sort of give them a certain uh, distance before you yeah. make it. Yeah. 
it's more safer. <laughs> yeah, but well, I, I, it was more funner to me. I, 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 rugby, I, I, I like rugby. Yeah, rugby is good ball. fun. I get to run the ball. <laughs> yeah, just give just give you the ball. And we'll just we'll just go behind you and just uh, make a ruck uh, and just push. I was I was a fullback slash running back in high school. So yeah, yeah, and I was known as a juggernaut when I when I when as soon as they give me the ball, I'm I'm crushing through anybody. Yeah, and that's just three hundred pounds of speed and actually, muscle. Actually, I was only two thirty. Oh, okay. Two twenty, two twenty-five, two thirty, but I, I was a I could I could run and hit hard. It's a beast. Yeah, I bet you a big guy, big guy as well. I was just man, I was just built. You know, I was, I was able to run and hit hard. That's it. And I, I, helmet to helmet. Oh, brutal, man. That can't feel good. Yeah, man. Well, fair props to you. You obviously know how to take a shot then if you need to. <laughs> so I'm sure you're not worried about pushing the fight forward and putting on the pressure. Oh, good. All right, I'll tell you what, um, also before I let you go, do you want to give a shout out, if you haven't already, to any of your training partners, coaches, you know, sponsors, anything like that before I let you go? Yeah, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to, uh, to uh, my coach, uh, Joji from Martial Arts Ikuza Dojo in San Bernardino, California, <laughs> and uh, my sparring partners, Brandon and Finau. Uh, these guys have been helping me out to uh, get my time in and um, target right. I appreciate you guys. And also to uh, uh, my wife and kids uh, for giving me the strength uh, to keep pushing forward. Sit, mate. All all starts... Sorry, mate. I was going to say it all starts at home, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Of course, man. That's, uh, that's, that's where it all starts from. Yeah, man. Well, I tell you what, Mo, it's been an honour to speak to you. Again, someone I've watched for a while and it's been really, really honoured to speak to yourself and I honestly can't wait to see you fight again. I love that you're still fighting. I love that you're feeling stronger and better than ever and I can't wait to, I can't wait to see you have that fight in, um, in Valor, man. It's going, to be, it's going to be incredible and see what you do after that as well. I appreciate you, bro. No worries. Well, have a good, have a good session and um, it'll be good to catch up again after your fight. Anytime, brother. All right. Take care. Cool. Mo, you still there? Yeah. Hi, man. Just want to say, um, before I let you go, obviously it's the recording's off now. Um, was that okay? Everything all right with that? Yeah, yeah. With uh, with, with the interview? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was cool, bro. Whatever you need, man. I, I'm, I'm whatever, man. As long as it, it works for you guys, I'm good. Of course, mate. Yeah, I just didn't want to keep you for too long. That's all. Because I knew you had to train. Okay, no worries. Whenever you want to call, just send me a text and let me know if you uh, yeah, mate. Um, all right. Okay, cool. And as soon as um, the video, as soon as the interview's out, because we're interviewing about six of the fighters and we've interviewed Ken Shamrock, we're going to put it out as one long show. So once it's out, I'll send you the link and you can have a listen to it with the family or whatever. Okay? I appreciate, I appreciate you, brother. Cool. Have a good training session, man. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye, mate. Bye. Hello, my name's Chris Allen and this is the Martial Arts Chat Podcast. Today, I'm being joined by a veteran of the martial arts world. He's done it all, he's fought everywhere and now he's taking, and now he's coming back to the US to fight in Ken Shamrock's new Valor Bare Knuckle Fighting. It's one and only Mike the Marine Richmond. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic, man. Uh, thanks for having me. No, I really appreciate you taking the time out your busy schedule. There's um, quite exciting times coming up for you at the moment, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, definitely some exciting times, especially, uh, you know, with this new promotion uh, making their debut. They look like they're kind of, uh, you know, making this a big thing, you know, a big type of event. You know, their first event's going to have that direct TV dish network, that big, you know, that big cable satellite, you know, I should say that big satellite pay-per-view type of viewership, yeah. not only their internet viewership, but they have that. They have that satellite TV viewership, which is huge, I think. Um, so, you know, they're kind of all in on this promotion. So I'm kind of pretty excited about that. How does it feel? Um, in, in my eyes, as a, as a fan of the sport, Ken Shamrock's a legend to me. In my eyes, iconic to the sport. How does it feel fighting for something, um, going on to an organization which is run by himself, especially someone who's been in the cage and done the experience, experience, sorry, experienced it all himself? 
Yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty badass. You know, you have a legend like him that's getting into the bare knuckle fighting, the bare knuckle boxing scene. I mean, he did fucking you know, sorry for swearing. He did. Uh, that's right. Yeah, he did. Uh, you know, bare, I mean, he was he was fighting bare knuckle in the UFC, and bare knuckle MMA. You know, so uh, you know him getting into this and 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 being all about it is a pretty cool thing. And also to work under someone like him, great, must be fantastic. Um, gives you the opportunity to carry on a career. It's um. Because obviously you started after you finished your MMA, you went to um, BKB in the, um, mm-hmm. in the in the land I'm talking to you from now in the UK. Yep. Um, first of all, I'd ask you the question probably everyone's ever probably asked you a million times: What made you decide to take the gloves off and just keep it stand up, opposed to full MMA? Um, you know, I've always been a fan of boxing. I, I really enjoyed boxing. Like I said, I have two pro boxing belts as well. My my MMA style is kind of based on stand up and I'm just always the most comfortable standing and in, in exchanging punches. And I'm just was super intrigued about the whole bare knuckle thing. I just uh I love the aspect of bare knuckle. I mean, you it, it, you got to play the style of bare knuckle is different than mm-hmm. boxing. You can't have a you can't have a big high punch count. Uh, I mean, if you, you punch the wrong area, you punch your elbow wrong, you punch something wrong, you're messing up your hand. You got to have a little bit more sniper, precise style, punching style. And I think that kind of fits into my style of striking as well, my style of punching. And uh, it's just, I, I don't know, that type of that type of like pugilist combat, you know, yeah. that gentleman's, pu- gentleman's pugilism. Uh, I just, I, the, 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 I love it. You know, I just knew, I knew my style. I knew my mindset. I knew I would, uh, be able to, to go into it very comfortably. I know the guys over there with BKB, you know, they're always like, Oh, you know, you really don't know. You really don't know if you can handle bare knuckle to your handle. You know, we always, you know, MMA fighters coming in, blah, blah, blah. But I do say, I think a lot of MMA fighters can transition to bare knuckle easily because they're, they're used to throwing with little tiny little gloves on. So I think, I think they have a good transition. I mean, I'm not saying boxers don't won't have a good transition when we're starting to see more and more of them do that. But yeah. um, I think that helps them with the smaller gloves transitioning to, to bare knuckle. Now, as you said, because bare knuckle isn't just your standard boxing rules as such. People might say you knock someone down, they get like a potential 10 count, you know. Yeah. But there's a lot more to it. Like, because um, just explain to everyone out there, you might not understand. You can actually clinch your opponent, can't you? As in stand clinching and dirty boxing for three seconds, is it, the rule? I can't uh, well, I know, see, I, you know, I'm still unsure how Valor bare knuckle is going to operate if they're going to be more of the american style how bare knuckle fighting championship is where they allow like i don't know if they they allow just continued clinching and clinching until they just stop the punching where uh bkb uh over there in the uk they were more it was much more like traditional it's essentially boxing without gloves on so they didn't really allow much dirty boxing they you know they might let a punch or two slip and then i was like hey hey, hey you know kind of like you wouldn't allow it in an actual uh, glove match so uh i'm not sure which way the valor is gonna go but yeah. i mean i'm i'm comfortable with both with both what both styles whether the clinching dirty boxing style or just you know your traditional gloved style boxing well you would have trained dirty boxing quite a lot anyway for your ma career Oh, for afraid. sure. Yeah. So, do you reckon that helps a lot? Being is that something as an MMA fighter you can really take into um, the sport if they allow that rule? Yeah, I think I, I definitely can take in the sport. I mean, utilizing the clinch, but also kind of getting out of the clinch, staying away from the clinch. I mean, I didn't really throw. I would throw a couple of. I wasn't big into dirty boxing clinch style, but I knew how to do it if I needed to. So it's one of those things where the capabilities there. Um, I definitely like the more traditional style of just straight boxing, slipping, rolling, you know, staying in the pocket. Um, I, I do like that traditional style, but I definitely have the ability with the MMA experience of grappling, clinching and all that to dirty box as well. So did you actually ask to like be involved in this in BKB or was it something? It was something yeah, you yeah. To do? I did remember, you ask to do it or do they approach you? Uh, you know, I hit them up because I saw it and I was, I told them I was interested Mm-hmm. Um, and I had communications with Jim, uh, for a little bit and he was like, all right, cool. And I knew I was still kind of dealing with, you know, my MMA stuff. 
And then he finally got a hold of me. He's like, "Hey, you still interested in, in doing this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I am. You know, I wanted I wanted to get on. I saw they were doing big things over there. It was word that it was going to start happening over here. You know, I wanted to be a part of that. I didn't want to miss my opportunity um, to really get into this scene and, and and make a name for myself in the scene. You know, while I still have some years of good competitive fighting left in me. So he hit me up, and." Uh, you know, then they scheduled a we scheduled the match, and then we made it. And we made it happen. I was originally supposed to fight Cody McKenzie, that fell through, and then I ended up fighting that Marcus Gaines, and um, I fought him at 185 pounds. Now they do it a little differently. They do kind of like a day of weigh-ins. Yeah, they don't do uh, so. I fought at 185 day of, and like I didn't really cut any weight. It was fantastic. I actually enjoyed it. I felt confident being bigger and not having to worry about cutting water weight. 185. Um, just sorry to yeah, interrupt yeah, you. Yeah. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong. You fought at 135 before, haven't I, you? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't check that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but here, you know, this would be your traditional boxing or MMA, you know, day before weigh-in type of deal. So I'm gonna drop down to 175 for that. I do enjoy being bigger. I my days of cutting down to 45 and 35 are definitely done. 45 is definitely done. Even 50, even. 55 I, I might not even consider going jumping going back down to that i mean maybe um i enjoy being kind of like bigger thicker now you know being 34 years old uh my days of cutting the big the big weight cuts are kind of over um so we'll see yeah well i'm glad you didn't cut too much weight in that last fight because your opponents your opponent you fought has actually fought a 205 before yeah, well. yeah 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 he fought and- a light heavyweight yeah yeah, so I'm looking at you on the on the when you um, were squared off, and I'm thinking, blimey, I, was, I wasn't <laughs> thinking he's going to dominate. I thought he's got the reach advantage like anything in a bare knuckle fight. But mm-hmm. you did really well to get on the inside, you know, land that uppercut because he kept leaning forward with his punches quite a lot. And um, yeah, I saw you were catching him with the uppercut. And one thing that wasn't pointed out enough was those body shots were, oh, they were savage. They were landing. He wasn't liking them, was he? No, 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 not at all. Yeah, he, uh, I, I definitely. I definitely was picking up that he wasn't utilizing his reach good enough. Um, you know, he was still unsure of how I was going to approach the fight. I think he probably thought I would be on my on my bike and kind of moving, 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 which is never really my style. I kind of like to sit inside the pocket, stay within range, slip counter, slip counter, approach, approach, you know, kind of press, press. Um, and I think that kind of threw him off that. Because I'm, I'm sure he saw me, you know, he knows that I fought at Bantamweight, so he's like, this little fucking guy isn't going to be fucking getting in, you know, getting up in my face, which I, I was I was really comfortable to go in there and, and and just let it and let it fly because I just knew my skill set. I knew I knew the size wouldn't really matter unless he just has some dynamite punching power that I wasn't aware of. You know, I, I knew I knew my my size wasn't going to be that big of a disadvantage. Yeah, man. And you dropped him three times, obviously, in the, th- in the second round. Referee stopped the fight. Um, so, yeah, you must be thinking to yourself, what are you thinking going through your head then? Are you thinking, oh, I've had my... So I've finally done what I wanted to do. I wanted to try this bare-knuckle fighting out. Mm-hmm. I've got in against a guy who's, who's been changed last minute. He's massive. He's fought a light heavyweight. What were you thinking after you won that fight, apart from the fact, obviously, fantastic? Like, what was Were you thinking, what's next? Or, right, this is what I want to do going forward? Yeah, yeah. I was, like, I was super amped up. I'm like, hell yeah. Like, I wanted to be a part of... You know, I wanted to be a part of their little movement they had going. I, w- I was excited to get back in there. I wanted to keep, you know, going after, start going after their quality talent and just keep fighting in the bare knuckles scene. And then it was just kind of like I kind of got pushed back and pushed back. And it wasn't really, to me, it didn't seem like I wasn't that much of a priority. And I understand, like, I understand it costs a lot of money to, to fly over an American fighter. And then you got to pay for the American fighters, corner man, you all their stay. Like it costs a lot yeah. of money, especially if you don't have that big financial backing. I'm not saying they don't, but it, it didn't seem, it, I just felt like, you know, I was, a I felt like I was a good, a good product for them to, to put out there. But I don't mean, maybe they didn't see it that way or it, it was just kind of like a, it seemed like a one and done type of thing. And then I got offered a fight against Barry Jones after a year. Like it's been, I would have been rolled up on a year of me not fighting for them. And then there was like, all right, we're going to get you November. All right, we're going to get you next week. And then, then I got to the point where I'm like, all right, these dudes are never going to like, these never do. They're going to never sign me a fight. So it's like, and I'm a manager of a, 
the biggest chain. I'm a manager of a strip club, the Spearman Rhino Gentlemen's Club in Pittsburgh. Like, I'm a busy schedule. Like, I can't be grinding and training all day, every day long, waiting for that fight opportunity. So I like to lift weights, and I like to uh, I like to do those type of things. So I, I got big, and I got, like, up to, like, 210 pounds. Wow. 210 plus pounds, and... And then they offered me the Barry Jones fight at like 168 pounds with like four and a half weeks. I'm like, dude, I can't, I can't fucking drop, I can't drop down to 168 pounds at that time. So and then it turned into, oh, see, we offered you a fight. You didn't take it. It was kind of one of those moves where I'm like, really? Yeah. Like, oh, it was, it was one of those, like you offered me a fight, but I turned it down. Like, all right, well, let's, let's, you could have been like, all right, let's meet at 185. Let's meet at 190. You know, I might take a short notice fight like that, but I'm not going to spend four and a half, five weeks trying to lose all that weight. That's what I'll be focused on is losing weight instead of really fighting. And Barry Jones, he's a tough fucking, you know, he's a tough dude. He's a, he's a quality opponent. It was just, I just wish, I wish I would have got, you know, your traditional eight weeks. And I was a fill-in guy. So, like, I wasn't even the first choice. It, I, I, I was the American, like, oh, shit, we need an opponent his guy dropped off i asked mike richmond and it just it just didn't work out i'm like dude i'm like i'm over 210 pounds right now oh okay and then and then when i had a little you know getting frustrated with them not booking me um then we kind of had a little spat and then it was just you know i have nothing but respect for the guys i what they're doing out there is fantastic and uh but it just i just wasn't a i just wasn't a part of their cards as far as moving forward yeah, and what you said, it could be because of obviously the long distance traveling and everything like that as well. <clears throat> Smaller organization. But right. again, look at someone, um, this is no disrespect to them either, but one of their biggest names was Mark Godbeer, you know, at the organization. Mm -hmm. and, for, and now he's joining you at the same organization as well. Right, yeah, for sure. So, like, and I, he, he, he Mark fought with them, you know, again, several months ago. And uh, now he's over here. So it's like, uh, you know, those things happen. You know, I just figured. The, the the disappointing part of me back to the original question was after after finishing Marcus and feeling super comfortable in there. I know he had a you know a very you know nearly 500. I don't know below 500 or above 500 MMA record. So like oh yeah well he, he was a shitty MMA fighter. It's like okay yeah I understand that but like I fought a dude who fought at 205 185. I fought at bantamweight. I went in there comfortably, not even blinking an eye, batting an eye. Like whatever, let's let's throw it out. I just uh, I was jacked up to be like all right, I'm gonna be fighting bare knuckle every five months. Like I'm gonna be part of this freaking thing out here. I hope I can fight for one of their titles. You know I can make a make a name. And it just really didn't happen. And I waited and waited because I still want to do mixed martial arts. I mean, after coming back, um, my first featherweight back fight with MMA, you know, that was a disappointing time in my career. I was in a shitty spot. I was cutting way too much weight. I just, those fights for, the, the second LFA fight, I, I got robbed. I did. The first one at 45, it just was a shitty time. I fought a, a, a great opponent and I cut way too much weight and I mentally just wasn't in the game. So like, I wanted to stay in MMA and do bare knuckle, but then I was so jacked up about the bare knuckle scene that I'm like, all right, let, for, let's keep, and then I was like, all right, man, we'll get you on the next card. Oh, sorry, we'll get you on the next card. So then I didn't book any MMA fights. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And then I just kind of just wasted a year of competition. Like I didn't, I didn't fight for anybody for a year, and that was kind of really frustrating thing for me. But whatever. Well, yeah, because obviously you're a guy who likes to keep active as such. And you know what? When you're in the MMA world, as many people wouldn't debate it, you did dominate that world because you had eight. You look at your career, man. Eighteen wins, sixteen of them were finishes. You know what I mean? First of all, that's something not a lot of people can say. You know, fifteen of those sixteen were first round stoppages. You know, and you were never submitted. Yeah in a game no, where no. you're a great stand-up fighter, but you were never submitted. So yeah. it just goes to show. So that's definitely, yeah, yeah, I mean, you've I fought, definitely left your mark in the MMA world. Yeah, I fought a definitely a, a lot of good. I mean, I fought a handful of black belts, fought a lot of tough dudes, a, a lot of tough quality opponents. And, you know, there was a hope that I was going to get back into the scene, you know, stringing some wins, get my mind right, get my life kind of in order, get the weight resituated find a good comfortable weight class i would you know either go try to try to rally back to bellator for one more run or see if i can get to the ufc do you know one more run and just kind of the whole waiting on bkb see if they're gonna still like it was just kind of like you know in hindsight i should have just kind of been like all right cool 
I'll just fo- refocus on MMA. If they ask me for a fight, they ask me for a fight. But like you said, it was one of those things. After the fight, I'm like, oh fuck yeah, this is it. Like I, I'm gonna be one of the a bare. I can be one of these bare knuckle stars. I'm just. I, I feel comfortable in here. I feel so comfortable. Like I feel this is my style of fighting. Like I was born and bred to fight like this. Uh, it just didn't. It didn't play out that way. So it, it is what it is. I'm. I'm not mad about it now. So. Fair enough. No, fair enough, man. It's good stuff. And what what I was interested in is um, we all know the other. I don't want to talk about too much. The obviously the other bare knuckle fighting organization, BKFC, which is obviously very popular as well at the moment yeah. in the states. Did they approach you at all? Is that something you're interested in? Like, don't get me wrong, Ken Shamrock. I, I I think both companies going to be are just are gonna be just as fantastic as each other. But uh, I actually believe. Do you believe is it the Ken Shamrock thing or what was it? Uh, well, I mean, I know a lot of. Uh... It was the BKFC did. I was kind of in touch with them a little bit, but then originally, originally Sean Wheelock was a, he's one of the commentators. He was an old Bellator commentator. I know Sean Wheelock's an amazing guy, and he commentates for BKFC. So he kind of originally put in a word to David Feldman and when they were getting started, like, "Hey, this is one of the guys you should sign. He's perfect for this styles of fighting. He's perfect for this." Well, then I already ended up signing with BKB. So then David was like, all right, well, he's already signed to the, the UK promotion. Like, I can't I can't go after him now. So then I was signed for a year with them. And then when I got out, I was kind of in contact, which I thought I was in contact with David. I thought he ran the Instagram account, but it wasn't. Apparently, it was some guy who doesn't even work for him anymore. Then I kind of talked with Sean, and then he re-talked with – he kind of reached out to David again. And then with the funny part is, right when I was in contact with Valor BK – um, and I was getting ready to post about that. Then I got a message from David, like, "Hey, so you still interested in, you still interested in in fighting for BKFC?" And I'm like, "Well, yeah, I am." But now, like, it was kind of one of those things where there's some Bellator guy, there's some Bellator guys that are working with Valor BK, and I and I like him and I know him, and I was kind of like, almost kind of gave him my word, like, "Hey, I'm interested." And it, 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 interested in fighting for their organization and it wasn't something where i'm like oh shit bkfc is calling me now all right fuck you guys uh you know i was kind of like you know i'm committed to seeing where this thing goes with you guys um and it's it wasn't so much a it was it honestly wasn't so much a ken shamrock thing it was uh you know one of the guys who still works with bellator and you know i think he's helping with the valor bk i was talking with him and he's one of my guys i like to do it a lot and I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm all, I'm all about that. So uh, then I heard that, you know, they were, they were kind of really kind of pushing. I like the whole, I love the whole Dish Network Direct TV thing. I, I think that, I think that pay per view landscape is still, is still good. I mean, it's not been completely taken over yet by all the streaming and whatnot, but yeah. So that was exciting. And then the Ken Shamrock was just an extra element on top of it, like him, he, you know, him putting together a promotion. So. No, it was no, a number sorry. of things. Yeah, man, and it's great. You know, I've spoken to um, I've spoken to someone else who's fighting that evening as well with you guys, um, that S- S- Esteban Payan as well. And yeah, you, know, you, you both sound very pumped, ready to get into this sport and get into this um, organization. And hey, why not? You know, you're you're fighting all over the place. You know, and right. is there anywhere is there anywhere in particular you felt you like out of all the organizations you've worked for? I know you haven't worked for Valor yet, obviously, but out of all the organizations, is there anyone in particular which you felt you'd learned the most from or, you know, benefited the most from? Like including MMA? And yeah, everything? Including, including everything. Yeah, yeah. I think, obviously, Bellator MMA. I mean, I fought for them 12 times, and and they were all big fights. You know, they were all... They were all TV fights, so, you know, they were all... That was a huge, that was a huge experience for me, you know, was that high-level... The, the production and TV, the aspect, that whole high-level promotion aspect of it was, I think it was probably the most overall learning, you know, understanding the game and the fight business and all of that, just kind of being comfortable with it all, the whole process and whatnot. I think that, would, I mean, that was definitely still the most valuable, uh, no, look, you know, the most valuable. Yeah, look how well, look, look at Bellator now as well. Yeah, look, I mean, I well thought... Three fights under the Scott. Three of the twelve fights are under the Scott Coker era. So like, and now that he's taking it to you know even another whole level. So, yeah, I mean, good for them. That that's awesome. 
No, but it's good. But you just say you're almost like you could say you're one of the veterans of um, Bellator. You know, not many people can say they've had twelve fights in such a large organization. Yeah. You know, so and, and as I said you were on the featherweight tournament as well and all that sort of stuff. So you know, you've had some great experiences um, with all these different organizations. And and how long have you been going for now? You think your first pro fight was back? I think I'm reading it, two thousand eight. Is that correct? Yeah, my first professional MMA fight was two thousand eight. I got out. I want to say April 2008. I, and it was that one of those right. things. It is April. <laughs> I got out of the Marine Corps in January of 2008. I was just like one of the Marine, one of the main reasons I got out. I wanted to pursue the MMA thing, and I was like, I want to get out, find a gym. I want to train. Like I want to get into fighting. And I, look, in hindsight, looking back, I'm like, holy shit! Like I've got out in the Marine Corps in January, and I fought my first pro debut was in April. I'm like, the beginning of my career could have been a desert. It could have been a disaster. Like looking back, I'm like, I didn't. There were so many things I didn't even know. It was one of those things where i mean it just kind of worked out thankfully you know i didn't you know matching was good and and all that and it was kind of helped built up a good way but even still i mean i i didn't take any amateur fights i didn't have a big huge background in really any aspect of fighting i you know grew up boxing i wrestled but i wasn't i wasn't a collegiate wrestler i wasn't you know nothing like that i got out of high school and joined the marine corps so it was like uh and then i got out of the marine corps and i just wanted to fight you know i thought i thought i had what it took to do it so i was like get out let's find a gym all right let's find a promoter all right and then i'm booking a fight and then next thing you know i'm fighting and you know several months later and then the you know my career just kind of started from there so we're going over 10 years Blow, man. what a great story though so what what was it that initially caught your eye to do combat sports like before everything I mean, even before you started boxing and stuff what was it that you thought did you see ufc or something on the like, early days of ufc or pride or something like that honestly i was a big boxing fan before mixed martial arts i, I was a huge boxing fan growing up um and then you know i then obviously a mixed martial arts came out you know, even even when it first came out in 93, I mean, I wasn't really watching it in 93. I was still super young. Um, I mean, we're talking about third grade. Yeah. And, you know, I, want, I really, I mean, I remember going back and then watching old videos of the beginning UFCs. Um, but I was growing up, I mean, watching boxing. And then I love, I love the aspect of boxing. I wish, like... And looking back, I'm like, I wish I would have started boxing at a really young age. I wish I would have got into boxing early. And, I mean, I've had a handful of people in the boxing community be like, dude, you know, you kind of you missed your calling there. I'm like, yeah, it is what it is. Um, you know, I wish I would have kept boxing when I did start pro boxing. And I wish I would have got more fights and more experience. Um, but I do love uh, watching mixed martial arts. Once I, once that really started picking up and gaining steam, um I was probably in high school at that time when I was really getting into it. Like I'm like, oh, like I'm like, I can do this. Like, and it wasn't like an arrogant like, like like every dude like I can fucking do that. It was more like I, I, I you know, I believe I have. I just my mindset. I just that type of guy. And then it really kicked in in the Marine Corps. You know, that just added that extra, you know, that attack, that aggressive mindset. Um, and that was kind of one of the reasons I got out of the Marine Corps. I was going to re-enlist. I had my re-enlistment package. I was getting ready to stay in the Marine Corps. I was on my third deployment in Iraq, almost going to stay in, teetering about getting out. And and I told my platoon sergeant, uh, at the time his name was Staff Sergeant Blanco, he ended up retiring just recently, uh, first sergeant. Um and I remember telling him, I'm like, dude, I'm getting, I, you know, so I was a sergeant at the time. I'm like, I'm getting out. Uh, I'm gonna, I don't want to pursue fighting. I want to get into mixed martial arts. He's like, dude, you're fucking crazy. You're not getting out. I'm like, yeah, I am. I, I'm, I'm going to get out and try this. Like, I don't want to look back. and I don't want to be like 10 more years down the road, fucking drinking a beer, watching a, a UFC and be like, yeah, I could fucking do that. Like, I wanted to actually do it. I'm like, what's the worst case? Like, worst case scenario, I get out. I'm nowhere near as good as I think I could have accomplished. And I, you know, I go back to the Marine Corps. I, you know, I read, you know, I re, I re enlist and I ended up getting out. And that same platoon sergeant, he actually, I had him in my corner for a couple of my fights. Whenever I fought in California, he was there. Uh, he was still, he was in my corner for, um, 
my fight against Nam Fan in San Diego. And I remember, I remember when he was in my car, he's like, "Fucking, remember when you told me you were gonna get out? And I remember when you told me you were gonna get out and you're gonna do MMA. And I thought you were fucking crazy. He's like, dude, I'm so proud of you, man. You get out, you got out, and you just like went after it in your dreams, and you and you and you accomplished it. And I was like, yeah, that was pretty cool hearing that from him. So, yeah, especially with someone you've had so much respect for for so long, you know? Right, right. Such a high stature in the army as well, you know. Someone who's been there, they, they were your second family. Now, your second family are your guys in the gym, you know. Like, do you mm-hmm. train anywhere in particular at all? Any particular gym? Oh, uh, well, my biggest, my big gym in uh, Minnesota was the academy, you know, under Greg Nelson. A lot of he's had a lot of names under him, you know. Most notably, he, you know, trained Brock Lesnar for all his fights, but you know, and then he had, you know, Sean Shirk. Yeah, man. you know the big the lightweight beast, champ the, the, the big, muscle shark the, yeah, muscle sh- right. the muscle shark shark you know, watch yeah, that guy's circuit on YouTube anyone by the way God, scary <laughs> he's 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 the greatest guy ever too like you meet Sean and he's just like the freaking coolest dude and now he's just in the business of buying houses and flipping houses he used his money and he invest in a business and he's like and he's doing great so like he had a plan and like he's he's a very successful businessman now and it's awesome to see that he's as nice as dude ever um, and then now out here, I just train at a boxing gym out here in Pittsburgh called Jack's Boxing. I think uh, when if I look to do MMA fights, I've been looking at some MMA gyms out here, but we'll see. Right now, I'm focused. Like I said, right now, I'm really I'm all in on the bare knuckle thing, and hopefully, they stay active. They keep me active, and it, and it's kind of it. Hopefully, it plays out how I wanted it to play out before. You know, with the UK promotion, where you know I'm in there. You know, I'm getting after it. I'm one of the guys. I'm getting fights, and and I'm and I'm putting on good shows on on TV. So, well, the way the be- one way I think the best way to look at it is, bare knuckle fighting is only just really taking off properly. I'd say at the moment, especially in yeah. the states, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like when UFC took off properly. Everyone now talks about the Forrest Griffin fights with um, Stephen Bonner. Talks about Hoist Grace's of the world and things like that. Yeah, you're actually starting this sport really in that time. So, mm-hmm. you stick in this sport. You keep doing what you're doing. You're, you become one of the pioneers of the sport, and is that something you know would be you'd love to happen, love to happen and pursue? Yeah, you, I mean that's You've got the kind opportunity. of like yeah. you, that's kind of like my you know what I was saying before. Like I wanted to be a part of this big movement with the rise of it. You know, I wanted to be kind of like you said, one of the pioneers to take it to another level. And, you know, there's the old school classic underground pioneers that people talk about, like what whatever. Like I'm talking about, like the you take it to the mainstream, the mainstream level of pioneers. Like you know, I want to be a part of that movement. I want to be like. You know, I would love for people to be like, yeah, you know, the bare knuckle boxing, bare knuckle fighting scene, like Mike Richmond, he was a freaking beast. Like, you know, he, you know, he was the he was the champ. Like, I, I want, I, I absolutely want that. So, the foundations are there, fighting under a great name. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd be fantastic to see how well he does. You know, he really will. And I think just with the name and everything, as well as getting guys like yourself, ex Bedator, uh, Mark Godbeer coming over, as well as others, and mm-hmm. then so- soccer Jews, I think, is on it as well, isn't he? Remember rightly. Yeah, yeah, he's in it as well. Tiger's was in it, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, big names still coming out, you know, and it's great to see that even after your MMA, MMA career, I'm not saying it's finished, you've found something you love, and it's good that we can still see you perform on TV, you know, which is great. Yeah, for sure. You, yeah, I think... You, sorry, Carol. No, I think, with the like you said, with the big names coming along, it's just going to make this sport grow and grow, you know, the and it, it's going to be... I, I can't wait to see where it goes in the next couple of years, so... Well, then, it's only getting bigger and bigger, you know, so we'll have to wait and see, like, organizations signing Bigfoot Silver now, BKFC, did you know, and things like that. So it's yeah, only going to get bigger and bigger, you know, and that's what people want to see, and that's what's going to attract people, and I know so many people that are talking about this Vanna thing already, you know, saying, oh, do you know about this Vanna thing? And I was like, oh, funny you say that, actually, because I'm actually going to talk to a few of their guys, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, mate, so people know what's going on, and that's why right. we're doing this show, you know, we want to get when the word out there. Right, and the and the great thing about having these big former MMA stars and and you know, bringing these box former boxy stars, you know, brings you know, people like oh you know they're MMA former MMA guys or former boxing guys. Well, it brings eyes to the TV, and then you can help build you can help build your homegrown bare knuckle stars, whoever you want to build, you know. And uh, obviously, the UK 
you know, the BKB promotion is they're doing a good job. They kind of really kind of want to build their UK stars and they're doing their thing. I'm sure BKFC has the, you know, they got some of their stars that they have in mind that they're trying to build and they're obviously signing new quality talent. You know, they, they like, they like those UFC Bellator veterans as well, but I'm sure they have some homegrown purebred bare knuckle guys. They want to build up, um, you know, just brings eyes to the, to this new sport and it's just going to grow and grow. Yeah, man, we need different organizations, you know, to find so more people can get in there. Like, MMA wouldn't be, if it was just UFC, it wouldn't be what it is. It's because you've got UFC, Cage Warriors, Bellator, even the smaller mm-hmm. fight cards like Ring of Combat, you've got CFFC, all these different ones, you know. And that's what yeah. makes this sport popular, because if it wasn't for those and those smaller cards, I'm not saying Bellator's small, people wouldn't get the opportunity to ever show no. what they're doing. So that's why it's important that all these different bare knuckle fighting things open up. And I think this is the third like officially legal, legit, you know, yeah. like legit, you know, thing. So Yeah, there was that know, one there was that one show that I guess was just a big you know, the big debacle where they didn't pay all their fighters. It's a shame that that happened. Um, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, it was a disaster. But um, these, this, this is, seems you know, like legit. They got legit people behind it. It's, it's, it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to be one of those things where you look back and you'll be like, you're going to look at Jim and Joe over there in the, you know, in the UK with BKB, and you might look at David and you'll be like, all right, these are the guys that kind of freaking help bring this to the mainstream and get other promotions started. And it kind of, you know, you'll look back at those, you know, those guys as the guys that kind of, whether they, you know, have their little rivalry, which they do, um, it's, they help kind of, you know, rise other future promotions and future stars. So. That's what it is, man. That's what, and it's, it's it's great as well. You're you're getting into the sport with still plenty of time left in your career as well. It's yeah. you're, it's obvious you're not doing this, you know, as a last minute paycheck for a few fights, which is great. No, you know, and um, you're really showing. And I, I said I can't wait for this event. It's going to be so good. And um, yeah, again, I can't wait for this sport to keep growing. It is a big debate at the moment in the in the world if it should happen or shouldn't. But at the end of the day, it's being made legal. People are watching it. People are willing to fight on it. So I think they're going to have to get over it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be one of those things where one state at a time, you know, it's just like one commission is going to be like, all right, we're in. And then it was just kind of, I think more and more commissions will start, yeah. will we'll start, you know, getting involved and in, in, in allowing it to happen. So it's, it's going to happen. Banned. UFC was banned in 49 states when it first came right. out. Right, right, right. It's just, uh, it's going to happen. There's not, it's only it's just not, like, being it's made. going to happen. It's only just been made legal in France at the end of this year. Um, it's still illegal in Norway. You know what I mean? They've only just legalized boxing in Norway. You know what <laughs> right. I mean? So right. it just shows you. this is the, All sports are still growing, and it's good that it's in the UK as well. So it's already got a base for the European scene, which is good as well, which opens up people like Valor and BKFC to actually come over to the UK and put performance on here. Is that right. you like? To, is that something? Like, would you like to come back here? Because I'm sure the fans well, still remember I would, you. I would. I would definitely love to come back there. I would definitely love to put put a show on for the UK fans. You know, I was I got none but respect for them guys. I got nothing. The, the the fans showed class to me. I had a lot of people hit me up on the social media platforms like, "Oh shit, great fight! That was awesome. Hope to see you back here." So like, I would love to go back there. So like, if they ever threw a show, you know, Valor goes over there. You know, if they ever start doing, you know, cross promotion, I don't know if they'll go the MMA route where like, oh, we can't let our fighters fight their fighters. You know, maybe they'll go the boxing route where, you know, we'll have cross promotion fights. You know, Valor guy faces BKB guy or Valor faces BKFC champ. You know, maybe there'll be something like that. Who knows? I'm not saying it can happen, but, you know, I just think, like you said, with these other promotions and it's you know a rising tide raises all ships it's just going to be it's 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 better for everybody it's just going to get it gets the visibility out everywhere more and more you know what? And I can't wait for it to keep growing and keep developing fighters like yourselves. Well, you're a developed fighter, but you know what I mean, don't you? Right. No, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I got you. Give, giving us the opportunity to keep watching your fights and watching you perform. And as I said, I'm sure if if MMA, you fancy doing that again, you go back to that. But for now, this looks like it's where you want to be. You seem very motivated, very positive about what you want to do. And, mate, good luck to you. I really, really hope you do well in this, and I'm sure you will. I appreciate it. And one thing I want to ask, like before, before I let you go, is um, you said you're a big boxing fan, yeah? Was yeah. There any, was there any particular boxer, and there, there is there is a reason for this question. Is there um, a particular boxer you like to um, particularly watch growing up? Oh uh, man, 
I would have to say I have like a couple. Yeah. Um, but top if three I, or something. Top five. three. <laughs> uh, it's so tough. Top three would have to be Prince Nassim Hamed. That's what I was waiting for. Uh, <laughs> a a Tur a Gaddy and um I would have to say probably Mike Tyson. Yeah, that's it. I was the reason yeah. um, all fantastic. The reason I was waiting for you to say Prince Nassim is you like to sport the old leopard print, don't you? Oh I do I, I do. I love it. <laughs> so What was it? What we yeah, talk us through that. No, uh as far as I, I just love his style. I love that he was so unorthodox. He kinda brought his unorthodox style into um into boxing and he made it success like he would be a fucking outstanding bare knuckle fighter like in his prime like his sniper style of boxing his he you know he was he was definitely very patient and he was precise with his shots oh he would be a nasty bare knuckle fighter like he was a nasty fighter because he's just he was just he was so super entertaining yeah, you know, I love Prince Seam. was all from, well, but that's probably why, but as a, when I was younger, I was born, what, 87? And I can always remember seeing him on the TV flipping over the ropes and stuff. Yeah, know, that's fair. the cage. And, you know, he was representing the UK at the end of the day, wasn't he? So I, I just was. would just go on YouTube and I would watch his fights over and over again and his highlight videos and his movement. I mean, there's certain stuff, there's certain punches from the style that I even emulated. I try to like mimic those type of like that type of hip movement, type of explosion, <laughs> those type of uppercuts and hooks. Uh, I was, I don't know. I was just, a, I don't know what it was. I was. Just a big fan of his, just fluidity, just everything about his style. It wasn't even really the arrogance. It was just he was just so fluid and explosive, and he's just like his pound for pound, just such a little guy packing so much punch. It was just fucking great. Yeah, it's like when Amir Khan, the other UK prospect, came on the scene. I thought he was quite similar, and he was going to be like that, but unfortunately, right. it didn't end as well. No, <laughs> so, no, it did not. No, unfortunately not. No, but uh, we got we got a few good guys coming through. Well, we thought we had Joshua coming through, but obviously after that incredible win from Louise, do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's that, crazy. That, that fight's rescheduled again though in Saudi Arabia, I think. Now it's all going over there, Middle East now. Yeah, it's crazy. They had it out there coming in. I think if they're having it in December, but yeah. uh, it's a weird, it's a weird place to have it. But I mean, I'm sure they offered a shit ton of money. Oh God, yeah, you know those. Um, mm -hmm. You yeah, know, the Saudi things. princes and kings and yeah. all of them are, yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, they, they find a million dollars just sitting down the back of the couch. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Just... <laughs> I mean, you hear, I don't know if you're a big pro wrestling guy, I watch you here and there. I got a buddy of mine who's a diehard pro wrestling fan, but like the WWE will go to Saudi, or uh, they'll go to Saudi and like the money that they're paid, like, hey, we want a certain wrestler to come out here and wrestle for the show. Give him five million, like for one for one event. It's just like crazy. Yeah, that's madness, isn't it? You know, like, yeah. Oh. And like I we want we yeah. want HBK to perform. Give him ten million dollars. <laughs> Yeah, but do you know what? I don't watch pro wrestling anymore. I used to watch it a lot when I was um, younger and stuff. And right. I, I flicked it on not that long ago. I'm thinking, they're still in this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. still fighting? Yeah, I was thinking, good. like, uh. when you see people like Triple H, I'm thinking, what happened to him? I thought, what happened to DX? Do you know what I mean? Like, you've, got, you've aged. Right. You know, and, there's all, and there's and Ric Flair, I think. And I was thinking, oh, my God, what's going on? You're all still yeah. there. Rick, Ric Flair was old and I used to watch it back in, like, the Royal Rumble 1990s. I know. He was, he was old back then, right. <laughs> so it's just, interesting to see that they just love the business they just love it I mean a lot of them get paid very very well I hope so if being thrown off a hell in a cell through a table like old Mick Foley used to <laughs> yeah, that was crazy <laughs> <laughs> you watch them yeah, it's funny it might be fake but the pain's not fake that way. no 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 I mean they're definitely entertainers they're definitely it's, it's definitely sports entertainment they definitely are they're putting their body through some strain no doubt yeah, don't get me wrong, you are as well, you know. But right, yeah, I definitely <laughs> am. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you don't look like you are when you come out your fights half the time. So that's the no, most right. important thing, you know. But right. even after your, back, your, your last bare knuckle fight, I think he caught you once. I don't think he even left a mark, really, did he? So, um, you know, it's yeah, so going funny, to your next fight. Sorry. Yeah, the, no, yeah, you're like, you, you mentioned that. It was like, I remember he caught me with his lead left to, he caught me with lead left to kind of like my brow area. And that was, and I, it was one of those moments. Where I was like, ah, oh, fucking so stupid. Why would I just keep my head there, waiting for him to punch me, like not slip? And then another part of me was like going through my brain really fast. I'm like, okay, I'm like that wasn't too bad. I'm like, better not go. Then I remember the first time I landed clean on him with my fist. I'm like, okay, that's different. <laughs> like that's not an MMA glove. I'm like, all right, I can. I mean, I can handle this. Adrenaline's kicking in. I can let these hands rip. They're gonna be sore after this fight, but 
<laughs> that was funny. <laughs> yeah, man, quality. I'll tell you what, man. That's it's been really good talking to you, you know, and I must say I could talk to you for hours with a few beers and stuff, a few pints yeah, of no beer. Shit. Next I'll time you're in England, man, we'll get get a few pints, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want to give you the opportunity just to give a shout out to any, you know, anyone who's helped you to get to where you are, sponsors, people on social net um, social networks where they can watch all your stuff. Just let give everyone a shout, mate. I mean, as far as giving a, a shout to help me, like there's so many people I'd be here going going on for days and days from the beginning you know starting in 2008 so it's just i mean i definitely want to thank everyone that i've ever trained with all my coaches um and then as far as uh, social media you can find me i'm trying to even think about my my instagram handle is the marine richmond my twitter handle is mike usmc richmond uh got a facebook fan page i mean i don't use it as much as i should but you know hit me up on those social medias i, I try to i try to stay active i try to comment comment back on people that hit me up i do appreciate all the fan support for sure and um yeah man i just uh, i'm looking forward to this oh that's so we mate so we you, at the end of the day you started your career in this bare knuckle scene on home soil for me you know for us right. in the uk and um so we look forward to seeing you progress your career out there in the states and best of luck to you and again really really enjoyed talking to you and i hope we can talk again in the future yeah i appreciate it man thank you cool have a good evening mate yeah, you too. Bye. Hello, my name's Chris Allen, and this is the Martial Arts Chat Podcast. Today, I'm being joined by a brand new organization's fighter called Valor, owned by Ken Shamrock, the legend. He's um, opened up a new bare knuckle fighting competition, and we have such a veteran and legend himself in Estevan Payan. He's fought in multiple organizations, you know, fought some of the best fighters in the world, and I'm honored to be joined by him today. Estevan, thank you very much for joining us. What's going on? Just see what goes on today with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. Cool. What what sort of what what you've been up to recently? Ah, uh, no, just I have a typical life, you know. I run my gym, train people, then I do those side jobs on the side, and I have this, this fight coming up. But I think people don't realize like it doesn't matter when if I have a fight or not. I'm always training, you know, trying to learn new things. Like I say, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you can teach him better ones, better ways to do those tricks. <laughs> <laughs> and are you, are you? And do you feel like even though you know you've been you've been competing for such a long time, you're still actually learning new things? Uh yeah. The, I, the biggest change with me was when I started going to school. Like, I figured, you know, working out, it's there's a lot of science in working out. People just think, oh, well, you lift this way and this and. When I went back to school, I was like, oh, my God, like, who are showing me all this shit are idiots? Like, they're doing it all wrong. Took a couple exercise science classes, some health and nutrition, and just like, man, I've been taught by a bunch of dummies. That's it. So, you just, as you said, just as you get older and wiser, as they say, would say you're still well in your, well in your fighting career. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Definitely. So, would you say? Um, so, you're, so, you've got your own gyms now. Do you mind me asking what's the name of your gym? Oh, I just got the sign that says boxing and fitness. You know, I teach teach kids to work out, and like I've got a kid who's uh, he's got like an undeveloped arm, and then all of a sudden, like it's tripled in size, like his whole body's changing again. And I have another kid who's just skin and bone, same thing. He's all they're like the kids are all ripped up. Like they started school this this last week, and all these kids are trying to figure out how they got so ripped and muscular. <laughs> And it's, it's hard, but I, I'm not a believer in genetics and anything. I'm like, I, you can alter your genetics. Like, a lot of people tell them, say that I'm a genetic monster, that's why I'm all cut up. And it's like, no, I was a fat kid, <laughs> but I had this drive that kept telling me, you know what, I, I, you can do better, you can do better, keep training, keep working out, you know, just keep pushing yourself. It's a, that, that no-quit attitude. And Everyone you find... likes listening to the naysayers. Like, the naysayer says, oh, well, you're, you're going to be fat. Well, okay, if you give into that, you're going to be. And do you think it's really important as well that, you know, kids are learning this at such a young age, like now while they're still sponges taking in everything? Well, you were, we're a sponge no matter what. It just sometimes it's just the mentality. You think, like, okay, I know it all. But like I said, especially not only like the kids, like one of the kids I teach, his grandma actually got him to start training with me because his grandma started training with me first, and she's 67 years old. She's like 65 at the time. The lady came in hobbling in, barely walk. <laughs> she's got rheumatoid arthritis. And since she's been training with me, the lady's lost like 15 pant sizes. She, she can box now. And like I said, now her grandson is training with me too, and he's loving it. 
Uh, so it must be nice as well, like like seeing like all sort of families getting involved. And it's the first time I've actually spoke to a fire who had a, a 65 year old come in their gym and start training. Yeah. And they, it's usually get yeah, their parents or their brother, cousins. But no, this time he followed his grandmother. That's yeah, interesting. That's followed an, his grandmother. That's an interesting story in itself. Like, what was his grandmother? What was what was sort of thing she doing in the gym with you? Ah, uh, same thing. Always we we would cool, do man. four rounds on the mitts, like. Well, I let that. I have a warm up. You know, what I mean, you gotta get the, that bone, the body moving, and loosened up, so you don't pull anything or strain anything. And then, uh, then I start working minutes with her, and then do four rounds of minutes, and then, uh, then we lift for like 15, 15 minutes afterwards. No, and she, like the lady, she's like, her size, her size improved, her her overall health has improved. Like the doctors are like asking her what she's doing because. She doesn't need all this medication. And it's one of the things I learned in, in going to school, too, is the body is a self-healing organism. But we don't look for freaking uh, – we, we just want that easy antidote that's going to make us forget about things instead of putting in the work to actually fix ourselves. Well, that's what a mentality that everyone should have. And it's great, yep. that, it's great that people like yourself are trying to really push that message and as a teacher yourself. Well, that, that, that's the too with, the, with her, the, the grandson. The grandson had asthma. Like yeah. he'd been running, yet really good at running, and I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, like he's good to run. And then like one day I'm like, okay, let's go on a run together. And I took him for a run, and freaking about uh, like halfway through the running, he started his asthma started killing him, and I was like, oh shit. He's like, what's wrong? I was like, I just realized I'm like, in your matrix, I'm like, yeah, you're the man. You can show up all the other little kids that that I train, but it's like in my matrix, I'm like, I'm the fucking man. And then, uh, but then I, I helped him improve his breathing because I figured out what was wrong, like why he was having problems with his breathing. And like the kid hasn't had used use an inhaler in like months. He no longer even uses it. Oh, that's fantastic. And it must be great for you as well, like you said, with this vast knowledge of wealth, the vast, vast amount of wealth that you have, you've gained over such a period of time to be able to actually give back and physically see the, the actual differences you're making. Oh, yeah. Like I said, you, if you looked at these kids, like, they talk crap to each other like we we well, like it's not it's not bullying or anything. We all just joke around, you know. It's locker room talk. Like you got America where they talk about oh bullying, bullying. I'm like, no, it's fucking kids bullshitting, talking crap, you know. Being kids. And that that's one of the things like with me, like the kids we like they'll talk crap with me and I just talk it back and they're like, dude, you're really good at talking crap. I was like, Well yeah, I was like I gotta deal with a lot of people on the internet. I was like I can't I was in the army, you know, I have dealt with <laughs> talking crap all the time. That's well, amazing. It's actually amazing just to hear that first part of your story. To be fair, you know, it's um, what you're giving back at such at the at this part of your career. And what's great about it is that you can you obviously feel like you're not working as well. I'm sure it doesn't feel like work, does it? Oh yeah, it's not really when I train kids. Like, it's not even work because I enjoy doing it. Like even sometimes like I'll get done sparring and <laughs> the kids are just like, "Are we sparring today?" I'm like, "All right, let's go." Like because like I don't let them spar each other. You know, the only person they're allowed to spar with is me. Yeah. Like and that's like tell everyone because the first few times I fought for like the first month that they spar, all they gotta do is try to hit me for four rounds. Just try to hit me. That's it. Follow me around trying to hit me. You know what I mean? And then after that, uh, I build it up to them. Then I'm gonna start hitting them to the belly a little bit. Like I'm gonna let them. You know, I'm not gonna break the ribs or anything, but I'm gonna show them what it's like to get hit. And then they start to catch that rhythm, and it's like, okay, now I'm gonna hit you in your head a little. Then they catch that rhythm, and then okay, now the punches get harder and harder. And the better they get, the more I improve. You know what I mean? Instead of just putting two kids, oh, well, they're the same level. They don't know what they're doing. I'm like, okay, they don't know what they're doing. But now they got this big error, of, error of a margin that he got because all oh, they can get away with this with this guy. But it's like, well, of course you get away with that. He's another dummy. And it yeah. basically turns into the blind leading the blind. And it's great that you you um, notice that straight away and you you sorry you identify that straight away in your guys that you're teaching at such a young age. And you, to be fair, and you've got to obviously make sure they understand that the reason you're you're saying you're only with me is to protect them. Is that correct from any injury? Oh well, it's just protecting them. And even even some of the kids like I tell them I just don't, I don't want them to get hurt. And at the same time, too, like one of the kids like he goes to spar with his friend. I'm like, dude, don't be doing that. He's like, why not? I was like. Because then you hurt one of them, guess what? Your parents are getting sued, and you guys aren't rich. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, they, they gotta understand. Like, I tell them it's a game, but it's a game you play for keeps. Like, you know, you're trying to hurt each other. No, that's it. At the end of the day, and it's teaching them good discipline as well. At the end of the day, which is great. Um, well, that's the thing. Like with discipline, like, I teach help people discipline. Like, I don't, I'm not one of those fucking dicks. Like, all oh, about a sensei. I'm like, they call me Esteban. They don't call me fucking coach or whatever. I'm like, my name is Esteban. I don't fucking need to pound my chest, call me master or sensei. Like, 
my name's Stevan. That, that's it. You know what I mean? Like that. That most of those guys that that want all that shit. It's just it's an ego. Uh, I tell everybody I don't have a fucking ego. I, I fight because I like doing it, and I work with the kids because I enjoy working with them. Well, that's fair enough. I said you go. It's not. I said you obviously enjoy doing it. What you started? Oh yeah. You started fighting your pro career. What we're talking about now, like well over ten years. It was like twelve years ago now, or something like that. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm sure it's something you enjoy. <laughs> I said. Oh yeah. You, when was the last day you actually felt like you went to work? That's it, isn't it? Well, no, I fucking work the weekends. Like I have long weekends because I do security. And oh man, it's it's just a, it's a headache. It can be a headache sometimes in the security job. And yeah, but I, so I, I go to that security job and I work from freaking, I, I leave home at eight and then I work there till about four in the morning and I get home about five in the morning. Wow, man. Crazy. Well, you got to do what you got to do, haven't you? You've got fans, oh, yeah. support, things like that. So what, Monday to Friday, is it just solid training for you still then and running your own gym? Yeah, that's basically what I do. Like, And then I got to try and maintain you know, running. I got to maintain my weightlifting, my bag work. Oh, yes, everybody would call it my still beam work. <laughs> <laughs> Are you training at any other gyms at all, like, in regards to your uh, upcoming fight? You... No, like I said, a lot of people, like, out here in Arizona, a lot of people think I'm an asshole because, like, when we're sparring, I, I'm going to hurt you. I don't give a fuck. Like, if I'm getting ready for a fight, I'm trying to hurt you. You have hit you on because you need maximum protection, not because you're retarded. We wear bigger gloves because it's for fucking protection because you're, you're trying to hurt each other. You know what I mean? Like when you're getting for a yeah. raid for a fight, you're, you're you're fighting with the max protection you could have. Like you're not pulling punches, you're not doing all that bullshit. You're trying to hurt each other. Not exactly. There, you're not. You're not. You're there, you're there, you're there for one reason. One it's reason. It's like well, hey, when when people play football. You know what I mean? They don't have the fucking guys playing on fucking Xbox. Okay, just go through the movements, learning what you got to do. No, those motherfuckers are hitting each other on the field. You know what I mean? No, that's it. You're in a contact sport, you know, at the end of the day. You know, but that's they don't get. But you see, like I said, just like the football players, they're on the field hitting each other, blasting each other, like, no, nope, not, not simulating, you know, they're, they're fucking learning about it. And then, like, that's the funny thing with, like, you got a lot of these MMA fighters, oh, well, football, power, football players aren't as tough as us. Like, no, those motherfuckers are just as tough. It's just they take other hits. Let me see you guys get hit by, you know what I mean? Like, you got to respect everybody's sport with the dangers in them, you know what I mean? No, Everybody just wants to be the baddest dude. I'll tell you what, though, you're definitely one bad dude. We know you don't feel pain. If anyone who follows um, Stevan's, if anyone follows Stevan's um, page on Facebook or anything like that, you can see um, he's got hands of steel. Isn't that right, Stevan? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, everyone, everyone always thinks, like, oh, he's hurt. that's got to hurt. I'm like, no, nah. like, I don't feel it at all. Like, fuck, I, I figured it out. And it's like, I, tell I, I lock myself in the gym, and I just train, and I train, and I train. Like, like I hate going to LA Fitness. I hate going to other places. Because it, it's just it's just like it's a Kool-Aid. You know what I mean? If you got this good old glass of Kool-Aid, just got the right amount of sugar and everything, and now you're surrounded by it, you just load water, put more and more water in it, and it, it just waters it down. Now, the same thing happens when you go to these other gyms. It's like they, they teach this shit, and then you start to see it. And then, like I said, you, that, that fucking amazing taste of that, and the Kool-Aid is going to go away, and you're just going to get watered down with all the garbage you see. That, I completely agree with you, mate. No, hundred percent. You said it right there. So, with going going back back to yourself with your fighting career, then um, obviously you started very early in life, and you started on you started uh, you fought in a lot of different organizations as well. Was there any particular organization <laughs> you enjoyed the most at all, or like you had the best experiences from? If you can pick one, uh, out of all I, them. I, I guess it was just <laughs> working with with Zufa. You know what I mean? Like, everyone talks crap about the UFC. I'm like, you know, what? like the UFC or it was Zufa at the time. You know what I mean? Like. They, they 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 took care of fighters like I fought for Strike Force that was it was already owned by by Zufa, the UFC yeah. owned them, and that was good. There was good pay, and then even with the UFC, good pay. You know what I mean? Like to me, it's all about the pay. Like if one organization I'm gonna say I didn't like, I'll go with fucking uh, when I did the first bare knuckle fight I did with that that BKFC. I did not like Feldman. He was just that guy's just a turd. And then the more I look at him, the more I don't like him. Like. Like, like, when he tries to talk, he's like, oh, the way we get down in BKFC, it's like, dude, you don't get down. Like, you're a fucking promoter. But you try to talk like you're this big, bad dude. I'm like, okay, fucking, you're not that much older than me. Get in the ring, I'll fight you. Let's see how fucking bad you are. So that like, was, when he was talking, sorry. he was talking crap about the, uh, the, 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 the some guy fought out that, 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 the, the kid that just fought Bedford. 
Oh, and he was like, oh, the guy was running. He's like, we should take half his pay. I'm like, dude, shut the fuck up. You don't fight. Stop talking like you do it. So that was actually a question I was going to ask you. Um, obviously, I know you've had a bear knuckle, you had one of your bare fight knuckle fights in BKFC, which, as um, in regards to what, obviously, I'm not trying to disrespect what you're saying, but I'm going to say they are doing quite well. They seem to be getting popular. So I was, going to, I was wondering, um, you know, why did you make the change over to Valor? And I think you just answered my question. I, is that, is that the, main I just, the guy was a turd. Like, they, fuck, go go look at the their documentary. And I don't think they're doing that great. Like, I don't think they're doing that great at all. Like, they had a free. They had it free on a what was it on, on YouTube? It had twenty four thousand views, and it was free. Their last show. And then I, I, I one of the things like like I said with Dave, it's just the way he is. Like, I I didn't like the guy at all. Like. First off, like I said that, that the first fight I did, he didn't really even pay me shit. And then the fuck, he's like, oh, yeah, we're going to start paying you when we start bringing money. And then he still, he was underpaying me when he was paying guys just to come in and lose. He was paying them more than he paid me. I'm like, yeah, dude, fuck this. But I'll tell you, so how did it come across then with Valor? Then how did Valor come across? Like, how did they make, did they, did well, they I saw you? Valor and I was like, hey, I want to fight for you guys. And they fucking, oh, okay, well, our card's full. And then someone pulled out against Ishii Smith, and I'm like, they're like, hey, you want to fight him? And I was like, well, I know who he is. I, mean, I know he's a pro fighter, but that's like one thing people don't know. Like, I, that, that's all I do. Like, I'm a trainer, but I just, I'm online all day looking up fighters, looking up, like, everything. Like, fuck, like, I, I could give you, like, the rundown on Ishii Smith. Like, I tell everybody, if I'm, if I'm fighting you, I'm going to become obsessed with you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm your, your fucking stalker, like, and then fuck comes. Uh, then after the fight, I forget all about you. It's like okay, it's nice knowing you. It's just it's that one night stand. You know what I mean? Like you try everything to get it, and then you get it, and you're like, all right, nice to know you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were successful in your bare knuckle fight, weren't you? BKFC. You know? Oh yeah, I beat the shit out of that guy. Here, here, oh no, here, here's one of the things that pissed me off even more about Dave. Yeah. So my fight was supposed to be at 155. The morning of the fight. He calls me. Hey, he can't make 155. But uh, can, can you fight him at 158? I'm like, oh, fuck. I'll fight him at 158. I'm not going to show him beat the shit out of him. Then we get to the weigh-ins. 30 minutes before weigh-ins. Hey, Esteban, he can't make 158. Will you fight him at 165? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Did he even try to lose weight? You know what I mean? We were supposed to fight at 165, and now I'm fighting you at 165 when we were supposed to do 155. And then I was like, okay, well, I want his whole fucking purse. Oh, we can't do that. He's like, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll take care of you. Don't worry. So I got, they gave me an extra thousand dollars. You know, or they're like, we'll take care of you if you put on a show. I beat the shit out of that guy in less than a round. I knocked him out fucking before the round, the first round even ended. So in two minutes, he got knocked out. Wouldn't get up. And they gave me a thousand dollars. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? You know what I mean? Like, and I'm, I'm to me, I'm just like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, it's their first show. I'll let them do it. But then the second time he, uh, then when the second show, they they wanted me to come back and fight again, and he didn't really offer me anything more than what he already paid me. I'm like, dude, like you're you're paying fucking turds more than what you're paying me. I'm like, yeah, fuck that. Like the, the this. Do you, I, I get a lot of broken bones. Like there's there's damage I could take, and then what? So just so dicks like you can talk about how bad you are. Yeah, it's, it's a shame though. To be fair, it's a shame it ended like it did with you at Bare Knuckle Fighting Championship. But at the end of the day, you found a new calling in Valor, and you oh, obviously. Yeah. Ha, and how how um how obviously have you spoken with Ken Shamrock as well and met him? Uh no, he just messaged me on Facebook. You know. I, I know who Ken is, you know, I feel like he's a pioneer. And that, that's another thing that I, I enjoy of, of helping Ken, you know what I mean? You always see people talking about, oh, fighters, like, they get fucked over. And it's like, oh, okay, well, you know what, here's a pioneer of the sport who's helped build it. Now you guys can all help him by making his organization great, you know what I mean? By following his organization, not following Dave Feldman, some fucking dick who fucking claims all this shit. Like, oh, yeah, like, I'm the first person in the history of the world for bare knuckles. I'm like, dude, bare knuckles been going on for fucking years in the UK. You know what I mean? Like talking about all the the history of the world, we're the first to legalize. And like, dude, I can't stand that prick. <laughs> like, I fuck. I wish he would try to fucking. He since he says, like I said, he he's a bad dude. Fucking all how they get down in BKFC. Like, 
Well, okay, well, we'll, we'll fight. I'll fight you in your fucking own show then. Do, do you feel because like Ken Shamrock's had that career? You know, he's had that fight. Ken Shamrock's career. had a career. The guy, he's helped fucking build MMA. You know what I mean? He was one of the faces of MMA the start. He keep pushing it and pushing it. And like I said, it's it's the best thing anyone could do. Like, like if I, I've had trainers that would talk shit about Ken, and I'm like, you know what? I respect Ken. You know, the guy fucking, people were talking about how he's too old. And like I said, no, he wasn't too old. He just fought, it, you, you don't fucking stop till you want to stop. Fuck what the naysayers say. It's your life. You only have one of them, so live it. That's it, man. I, and um, I said, it's, it's good to see you found somewhere else, you know, where you feel like you compete and you feel like you're going to enjoy it more. You know, you're going to get on better with the owners and have a, a slightly a better career there. So what, what, is, what is your long-term sort of thing? Are you just going fight to fight at the moment or are you looking to try and stay active doing this sort of well, thing? Well, I, I stay active, fuck. I, I fight whenever yeah. people offer me yeah. fights. Like, I'm always fighting and just... Like I tell everybody, we don't get old because we play. We get old when we stop playing. That's it. It just... And then it's... Uh, I have a lot of... Like, there's another one I say. It's uh, I tell the kids, like... Uh, we don't get old, or no, not that one. Yeah, that, that one. We don't get old because we play. We get old when we stop playing. And I'm not, I'm not looking to stop anytime soon. Like, I enjoy doing it. A lot of people are like, oh, well, you're gonna get all these this brain damage and this and. And one of the things I tell people, I'm like, when they're like, when you get hit in the head, and I tell them, like, dude, you don't even understand what causes the damage. It's not so much getting hit in the head. I explained to him, it's your brain stem. It's the back of your head where it takes the damage. Like, think about when you get in a car accident, the whiplash. Now it's the same shit. Like, everyone talks about this this magic button in the chin. I'm like, there ain't no fucking magic button in the chin. The jaw is the hardest bone in the body. When you talk, you're working it. When you're chewing, you're working it. You know what I mean? Like, it's an ever working fuck. We're working around now talking. It's the whiplash of it. You know, you, you chop a tree down from the branch, from, from the, the bottom branch. Same thing with your fucking. Brainstem, you chop it down from the neck, it pushes everything back. You hit the head and the forehead, you know, you got all the weight to help fight it. Well, that's an interesting way actually you put it, to be fair. So I'm sitting here just picturing all these like um these these ways you're explaining it to be fair. And it, yeah, it makes complete sense, mate. And um no and you're right, and people just don't understand, you know, who keep making these comments about it and if you're gonna Oh yeah, a lot it, of people like 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 a lot of people don't understand, but then like when people come like like I I don't even really train any young people, I train older people like People like I have a guy who I trained at 72 years old. Wow. The doctors like him. And then I had the other lady, the, the 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 kid's grandma. Like doctors want to know what they're doing because their their health is changing, their lives are changing. You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, I can tell you, you don't get old because you play. You get old when you stop playing. Age is just a number, man. Look, Randy Couture thought he till he was like 48. You know what I mean? It was fighting oh, yeah. people like Brock Lesnar and stuff. Yeah, it didn't turn Fuck out the no, best. Dude, I looked up one of the oldest. Look up the oldest fuck. Bare knuckles. Some guy retired at 72 back in the day, what like was in his the 1800s. I don't know, but he was 72 years old when he retired. Wow, man. and that and back then as well. That's like past life well, expectancy. Well, it was back then. Like I said, now everything, everyone keeps getting softer and softer. It's like everyone's fucking entitled to something. Like, and fuck, who knows? They probably would have retired with all these commissions now. Like, oh well, you got to retire because you can't do this or this or that. It's like. You can tell me, or because you could, you could possibly <laughs> die in this fight. And it's like, well, you do realize when I went to Iraq, I possibly could have died, but you guys didn't stop me from going. You know what I mean? You guys send kids to war left and right. But that I choose that, okay, like, if I can die, like, that should be my choice. Okay, I could die. Fuck it. You know what I mean? I know you got like, these commissions and accept it and they'll follow the rules. That's it, mate. No, that's it. And that's what a lot of people might not know about you as well. See, a lot of people know you closely will. Is that, you know, you haven't always been a fighter. You know, you, you also, you fought in a cage and you fought on, you fought for your country. You know, and um, give us, if, if you don't mind talking about <laughs> I it, guess give, give us a little I, bit. It wasn't, so, it wasn't so much of fighting for my country. Like, I'm not that whole patriot American. Like, like I told you, but I grew up watching, like, fucking Platoon, Full Metal Jacket. And I was like, fuck, I want to see what war's like. Like, what's it like to kill someone? You know what I mean? Like, fuck. Well, you get away, do it for fucking where it's not illegal. You know what I mean? Well, and fair then enough. I went and did the fight, and I was like, and then it, it actually humbleizes you a lot. Like you see everybody the suffering, like you see what really goes on over there, and it's just like, like fuck. Like then after that, like I just like I just take out like care packages and give it to people because 
Yeah, you just want to help people instead. Like, like, I went in there wanting to fucking kill and give that all a try. Like, and then I was like, yeah, that's not for me. Like, I, I, I'd rather fucking help the people out. Did you find it really helped, like, make you appreciate in life what you really have and what people really don't have? Well, you, you, you never know. Like, 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 in America, we always talk about how all these countries are so poor and they don't have food. And it's like... You don't realize, like, and I learned that in one of my uh, my health classes I took at one of my colleges I was, I was going to. And they say, you know, like, we talk about how poor everyone is. But then a lot of other people, they look at us. We're poor. Because a lot of the food we eat is not food. It's just fucking chemicals. You know what I mean? Like, we can chemically engineer fucking food now. Like, it's not real food. Yeah, but everyone else is poor and they can't, they can't have food like we do. It's like, well, no, we don't have food. We have chemicals. It's one of the things like, I teach the kids. I, I train them. Like, make sure it's food. I'm like, if you can't kill it or grow it, it's not fucking. It's not really good for you. Uh, that's it, mate. You're right. And how can we also live in a world now where people still aren't eating with all the money around? Yep. You know. Yep. There's so much money in this world. How are people still drinking dirty water? It's the biggest oh, question, yeah. isn't it? But hey, man, that's where people like you are bringing like these younger generations in to get them away from getting into sort of any sort of criminal stuff or anything like that, and they're learning. They're learning a discipline. Oh shit! Sure. I, I told, I told these kids like everything. Like these kids, like like a lot of stuff. Like the way I teach them, like about sugar. Like I'm like, dude, that's a lot of fucking sugar. They're like, and they're like, uh, cause like in America, it's got we, they're like 33 grams of sugar, and I tell them, like, I understand what 33 grams are, and they're like, how do you know that? I was like. It's like, well, I, I wasn't always a good guy. Like, I used to sell drugs, and, like, yeah, that's a lot of sugar. <laughs> I was like, when you measure it out in grams, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm like, that's a lot. <laughs> and then I would show them, and they're like, but you know what I mean? Like, I put it in their heads, like, of what things really are. I don't sugarcoat it. I just tell them what it is. And they're like, oh, shit. Like, same thing, like, I tell them, like, I was like, yeah, dude, I used to fucking do coke. Hello? Hello, mate, I'm here. Yeah, I'm listening, man. Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I, I mean, I I'm just listening to your story, man. Yeah. I'm happily listening uh, in, man. Yeah, but I, I tell them, like, I used to do all that shit. And like, I tell them, I don't, I don't do the whole, like, oh, yeah, cocaine, this, it's bad, you know, slap the hand. Like, no, I tell them what it fucking does. I'm like, dude, I got a fucking hole burnt to my nose. Like, I can fit my whole pinky in my fucking nose. Like, I tell them, you know, what it, what it actually does to you. Not just, it's bad, it's bad. Like, no, and, like, they sit there like, oh, fuck that. Like, you know what I mean? Like, fuck, I got these kids afraid of sugar now. Like, they, they, they're, like, they, they tell, like, oh. One of the grandmas, she's like, yeah, he'll tell me, like, that's too much sugar. <laughs> it's got too much sugar. That's good, though, mate. You know, like, these people, these kids, sometimes they learn better off their... I know you don't like being called the master or sensei, you know, stuff like that, but at the end of the day... Well, it's just like you, are... you guys learn... They learn off of my mistakes. Like, yeah. I tell them, I teach people from my mistakes. It's like, you know how everyone always talks about, if I knew what I knew back in the day, I'd be a millionaire. And I tell everybody, like, okay, well, one of the guys, there's one family that did did that, they, and they got away with it. They took everything they knew from back in the day, and they became rich. And who is it? It's the fucking Mayweathers. Think about it. Those uncles, his dad, they took everything they knew about boxing, and they put it in fucking Floyd. And now yeah. look at them. Yeah. Like, I tell everybody, everyone talks about how dumb he is. I'm like, how can you call that guy dumb? He's fucking rich. Exactly. Oh, right. well, when he stuttered, when he reads. I'm like, well, guess what? Some kids, some people stutter when they read because they're, they're nervous. It's yeah. not so much he's got brain damage. He could probably have just been nervous. Yeah, look at Mike Tyson. He's got a stutter. Yeah, fuck you know Tyson. I mean? he's... But even with Mike Tyson, like people talk about how he was greater than Floyd. I'm like, I don't think Tyson was that great. Tyson, look at the, when he actually fought fighters that are well known. He lost to them. But if you look at the, everyone else on his record, like who the fuck were those guys? But everyone talks about how big and bad he was. To me, like I say, if you look at Floyd, Floyd fought everybody. Yeah. And then they were all bigger than him. Tyson, like I said, who did he fight? Evander Holyfield? He lost. Lennox Lewis? He lost. Fuck, he made Buster Douglas famous because he was knocking everybody out that he was supposed to knock out. And then when he fought someone that no one knew about, knocked, got knocked out. It's not what it's about, is it really, sort of thing. And um, also, another one who had a bit of a speech impediment was a famous British boxer, Chris Eubank. You know, and he was an incredible boxer as well. And his son's doing quite well as well at the moment, to be fair. Yeah. We've got some good British guys coming through slowly but surely. But, you know, what? Well, you're seeing a lot of boxers moving over to this bare knuckle thing as well. Like, look at Paulie, was it Malinagi? Is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah, Paulie, Paulie was a free, that, that was a shit fight. Like, I watched that fight, I'm like, come on, you guys, you're going to fucking fight? Like, people paid money for this, you know what I mean? Like, 
that's what I think. Like when people like, like if I'm fighting a fight where I know people are paying money, it's like I'm gonna entertain you. You know what I mean? Like I I know what I go to watch, but I, I to me like I said like I go to fight. I enjoy fighting, dancing around like people talking about footwork and this. I'm like, dude, just don't. If you're running, you're running. No, I, I, don't, I don't call it footwork. I'm just I'm inside moving. You know, I'm in the in the pocket, moving in and out like. Like, I don't, I don't try to label things. It just, to me, fighting is all about acting and reacting. That, that's what it's all about. So, what, what made you, what made you get into fighting initially? Like, wanting to actually compete in combat sports. What, what gave you that uh, initial push to do that? When I was a little kid, like, well, not a little kid, but when I was in high school, I was getting a lot of fights, and everyone was like, "Dude, why don't you fight? Like, you're really good at it." And then I ended up in the military, and uh, while I was in the military, I. They had it one day where they, they put gloves on and we were just ball boxing for our PE. And uh, the first guy I boxed, I'm just like beating up with no problem. And then there was another guy who uh, they're like, oh, he's like, I want to go with him next. And like he throws a punch at me and I duck it and I freaking just clobber him with one punch, knock him out. <laughs> and then uh, everyone's like, holy shit, that guy's good. And then, then the instructor and me boxed. I ended up boxing with the instructor and I ended up breaking his nose and they stopped it and we could never do it again. And then, uh, a couple of years go by, then I, 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 I just, you know, I'm, I'm on this military base and I'm just bored. And I'm yeah. like, fuck, like, like, I find a, what was that? I think it was a jiu-jitsu gym I found. That I started training there. And then this one kid came over and he's like, oh, yeah, uh, I'm at this boxing gym. It's right around the corner if you guys want to come, come check it out. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I go check it out that Monday. And then, fuck, next thing you know, Friday I'm fighting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool it. Cause I, I showed up to the gym Monday and I'm like, they're like, so what do you want to do? You want to get in shape? You want a six pack? I'm like, I already got one of those. Yeah. And I'm like, I just want to fight. They're like, what? I was like, I just want to fight. And they put me in the, the ring with this kid that won the golden gloves. And they're like, like, Oh fuck. Like this guy can fight. <laughs> and then, yeah, like I said, next thing you know, Friday I'm fighting. <laughs> Quality. That's what it like. It's lovely. It's great to hear. You know, so many people have different, um, backgrounds and how they get into it and stuff and you know you've you've gone through it all and do you think do you feel fighting in the military played a big part to your mentality of getting in the cage and fighting someone in the cage it seems like nothing compared to fighting in iraq no i don't want to say the military it's just like my whole general upbringing you know like in high school i said i started liking to fight a lot like yeah i'm really good at it and i just like i just enjoy it like I, I don't like fighting random guys on the street that don't know how to fight. I'm like, that's, that's not fun. You know what I mean? That's just dumb. Like, like I've had guys come up to me before and they'll try to fight me. And I'm like, I'm like, all right, give me $1,000. And when I beat you up, you can give me another $1,000. Like, why would I do that? I'm like, because that's the minimum amount I make for fucking fighting. Like, you know what I mean? I don't do this shit for free. I like doing it, but there's risks. Like I tell you, you can risk breaking your hand. You can risk freaking getting cut. Luckily, I got VAs. I can even if I got in a fight, I could get it taken care of. But yeah, it's not, I just don't want to put that fucking dilemma on anyone. No, exactly. I mean, normally be getting yeah, exactly that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, you're a fighter. You're paid to do this sort of thing. And yeah, you know it's I mean? profession. You... It's not fucking too bummed on the street. And I'll tell you what, though, what's interesting is um, why did you decide to go to bare knuckle fighting? If you mind me asking, from mixed martial arts. What what what, no, what, no. what what drew you towards it? I don't know. I'm just hitting someone. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's, to me, like it's hard, to me, it's all fighting. Like, okay. It's 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 it's, it's, it's like, like I buy bo- I do boxing. I do bare knuckle. I do MMA. I try to do kickboxing, but I couldn't find any anybody. And I tell you, I just enjoy fighting. Like it just it's like like it's an adrenaline rush. Like like think about people, there's people who smoke weed. Like I, I didn't really I never liked weed. Like it just put me to sleep. But when I would party, you know, I would do blow, and I'd be up all night fucking going crazy. Because, like, you know, it's like an adrenaline drug. But, yeah, I, and I guess that's, that's basically what I am. I'm just an adrenaline junkie. It's your natural high, as they say, yeah? Getting in that cage. Oh, yeah. That's like my, oh, shit. It's time to get down. That's it, mate. That's it, mate. You've obviously got the, definitely got the right mentality for it. You're not well, that, 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 who... One of the things, like, when I was going to school, too, I learned was... Uh, you, you ever know like, how people talk about how nervous they get right before they fight? Like, I'm so nervous, da 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 like the one thing, and I always tell it, and then people when they start to understand it, they're like, oh fuck, that's what that is, because you know you got those trainers like, oh, well, you're just nervous. It's it's because of the fight. Like, no, it's not called nervous. It's your fight or flight instinct. Because notice when they, everyone gets in the cage, that 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 nerve goes away, and it's like I said, it's not the nerve. It's you're in that fight mode. 
but before that, like I said during that fight or flight mode where you're like, okay, am I going to fight or am I going to fucking flight? I'm going to run. And then boom, like I said the fucking bell rings, fucking fun punches start flying and that nerve goes away because you're now in fight mode. No, oh, man, that's it. And um, so what, what is that? Is that like basically that, that's that, is that is that the mentality you just take going into every fight? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> No, that's it, man. That's it. That, that's the mentality everyone should have, and that 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 acts that that's that's probably a lot of people say that's nearly ninety percent of the fight game. You know, is getting in there and having the right mentality. You could. Well, you that's could, like I said. You, I really got to realize what, what what it really is. Like I said, thinking that it's not that I'm nervous, I'm worried. Like, no, you're not. It's just like I said, fight or flight. That's it, man. It's a very interesting way to put it, and it's a very good message to put out to people listening, and as well to your students. And what a great and just simple simple words, and what a great um. You know what I mean? A great message to put across to people. Fantastic. And um, to talk us about, like, obviously your next fight. Obviously, you'll take any fight. You'll fight anyone anywhere. But tell us a little bit about your next opponent, if if you know too much about him. Uh, he's a former world champion boxer, but he's lost his last three fights. You know, it's he's he's it's it's gonna be a good fight. Like, like but the thing I I tell him, he's oh, I'm a boxer. I'm like, bare knuckles a lot different than a boxing glove. You know, with a boxing glove, you can hit. And it's very hard to break your hand. But trust me, when you swing, you better make sure you're hitting right and landing right. And then that's the other thing that a lot of these guys don't realize. Like, oh, well, boxing. Like, like uh, if you watch my first bare knuckle fight, like, uh, I remember fucking Antonio Tarver. He's like, oh, he's holding the back of his head. I'm like, well, no shit. You're allowed to do that. You know what I mean? Like, this ain't boxing, buddy. We're fucking bare knuckle fighting. So what's so a lot of people see like it's what better look at bare knuckle fighting. And I think right. So is this better? Is it because it looks like boxing? Obviously, when people go down, they get a count. Obviously. So what is the difference between that bare knuckle, apart from obviously no gloves? Obviously, what is the main differences between bare knuckle fighting and normal boxing, like in style and technique? Uh like I said, fuck, I can hold the back of your head and punch you. Okay. I can hold like that. That's. And you're allowed to do that in BK, yeah? Yeah, we were allowed to do that. Freaking. Like you said, there's no gloves. Like the main thing is just like the 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 resting, the holding, and fucking grabbing. Like, but the thing I think that's one of the things where the, the, a lot of these guys, like the the, the boxers, I think they're gonna get, they, they don't understand like the holding part. Like I'm allowed to grab you. And then that's the thing with me is like I I'm, I come from MMA background, so I understand how to hold someone and hit them. You know what I mean? Manipulate your body while I'm hitting you. So what's the ruling then with the hot, with the clinching then? Because obviously in MMA you clinch up against the ropes and you can obviously you can only clinch for boxing. three seconds. Like the the, when the last time I did it, they said you're only allowed three seconds. Like if you weren't busy, they stopped it right away. Okay, break. Like I said, you could go watch my last one. Like they they would break us, but I'd be right on that guy's ass from fucking it within a second. Yeah, so this all forward pressure. So still a bit more learning for the referees and things like that as well. Oh, yeah. Maybe with the sport. But this sport is growing very quickly. Um, you've got these organisations popping up now, like BKFC really like opened up with obviously bringing people like Artemon and Chris Lieben and people like that. And then now, Valor is getting this huge name as well, especially with someone like Ken Shamrock backing it. Like, How lucky do you feel like to be involved in something like that? Or to, I know you like to do it for the money. You know, you'll fight anyone. It's for all the money and stuff like that. Obviously, you're still a fighter. Well, for me, like I said, I, I, I'm enjoying like, to help a, a pioneer like Ken. You know what I mean? Like I always hear people talking about oh, he has money problems or something, but to try to help him build an organization, and I'm pretty sure Cam will try to get it for the fighters. He'll try to do stuff for fighters because he comes from that background, understanding, you know, what it's like to suffer and fucking, but try to pursue your dream. Did I read somewhere? Or tell me if I'm wrong. Like I might be being say stupid. Is he competing in the organization himself as well? I don't know. I heard rumors about that too, but I don't think he is. You know. Kansas, it's time for him to ride off in the sunset. You know, you had a good career. You had a long career. Whether you win or lose on your last fight, you know, you, you go out on your, you're, you're going out on your own, on your own, you know. When you decide you want to stop, that's when you stop. It doesn't matter what anyone, oh, well, someone thinks this or that. Like, I don't care what you think. This is my life. Like, and I'm going to live it. No, that's fair enough, mate. It's fair enough. And is this your this is this your life now? Is this what you oh, want to yeah. do? Is 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 it gonna are you gonna stick with the bare the bare knuckle world or if an MMA fight opportunity comes you'll take that or K one? What what's what's your what's your like like your year plan at the moment? I don't make plans, I just live life as it goes. <laughs> that's it, man, that's it. But if it if it was up to you, would you like to continue just doing the bare knuckle stuff? Oh yeah, I feel like it's hard. I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna keep fighting. Yep. 
fighting teacher. But I tell you, like, I, I don't like doing that whole, oh, well, down the road, this, because that, 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 just, that just puts a, a okay. kink in everything. Like, when you plan too much, you start thinking about, like, oh, well, I'm going to retire at this. Like, well, now you're not, you're not living, you're not fucking, you know, trying things. Like, now you're just, you're setting this, this, this goal, like, and this is, this is as far as I'm going to go. This is all I'm going to do. Like, like, I tell everybody, if I'm telling myself, oh, yeah, I'm going to retire after this fight, guess what? I'm not going to fight because that's in the back of your head. Well, yeah. I'm gonna retire off this fight, so I'll just throw it. I'm like, no, fuck that. Like, that the thought of retirement would come at the end of a fight. Like, okay, but I'm I'm done with this shit, you know. And fuck, it, not even that. Like, it won't even be the fight when I decide I want to retire. It's gonna be like, yeah, fuck this. I don't want to cut weight no more. I don't want to do that no more. You know what I mean? I want the long hours. Like, but that's the thing. I tell you, I enjoy. Like, like I watch all these other guys. Like fucking wearing their sauna suits and fucking starving themselves and oh my god i haven't had water in so long I'm like what the fuck i drink like three gallons of water the fucking two days before weigh-ins i fucking had a steak dinner the day of after before weigh-ins you know what i mean like there's a lot of science and all this stuff but everyone always does the whole oh yeah it's all about having balls like i had a lot of trainers like that i talk about like having balls but these motherfuckers never had the balls to even fight but it's like, so So, where, where did you learn about the balls of fighting? No, oh, interesting. Interesting. What, what, um, it's fun. And I'm sure you're, hopefully your message is getting across to these people, man. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, fuck. Like, everyone's like, <laughs> everyone probably keeps wondering, like, how the hell does he keep getting fights? And it's like, I tell everybody, it's, everyone says, like, I talk a lot of shit. I'm like, no, it's like that saying, closed mouths don't get fed. No, I fucking open my mouth when I want something. Like, okay. And I, I I know how to get things like like everyone asks like who manages me, I'm like I do, I'm like fucking Facebook it's all fucking so social media you just go on there look things up and like oh, okay I'm gonna go talk to this person like you know what I mean I didn't have no manager who talked to Ken like I called fucking I messaged Ken I I looked up Balor I looked up some of the fucking contacts on there and I started messaging them all I don't fucking like I said when I fucking make my fight I don't have to give a percentage to anyone it's all mine. Well, like, well, what, well, like a lot of these dummies, like, they'll tell me with these MMA, these MMA guys, like, oh, well, such and such manages me. I'm like, they manage you, but you always get fucking hard fights. Hmm. You, are you really that? And now you got to give them a portion of your purse. I'm like, are you really that stupid? If you're just gonna get hard fights, it's easy to fucking, okay, just sign sign the contract, and then you don't have to give anybody any of your money. Like I said, if you have a good manager. They pay to get you good fights. Well, not even good fights. Like like with boxing, everyone thinks, oh, well, the, the guy was paid to throw off the fight. It's like, no, they're not paid to throw the fight. They're just guys who come in last minute notice. They're, they don't really train. They don't have a gym, you know what I mean? And they're just uh, fucking like, like I've been doing boxing too. And people don't realize like, it's hard. Like, fuck, I've done some of these fights where like people are like, the crowd where like they all said I won and I fucking lost. But it's because I'm brought in as a, the, the B side of the fighters. I'm not the A side. I'm the B side. I'm older, and I'm just doing it. And um, so, what what preparations are you making then, man, for this fight? Are you for this fight? Yeah, same uh, as always. Fucking same as everything. You know, just training. Fucking. I, I understand a little more. Like I say, like even though I'm out of school, I I, st- I kept a lot of the books. Like I, I rented them, but then I'm like, you know, what? I'm gonna keep these. Like, there's a lot of good knowledge in these books, and I read. Like I read. I intercept. I, I inter. I'm on the internet a lot, just looking up shit. Like, I'm not one of those guys, oh, shit, Facebook said this. I'm like, oh, okay, let me go research this real quick. <laughs> if it interests me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. You love your research. You said earlier, you stalk your fighters and you like to learn as much as you want, which oh, is yeah. good. Which is good. That's what the internet's there for. Use it. You know, it's available. Why the hell oh, yeah, not? Oh, yeah, don't understand that. Everyone fucking listens to the dumbest shit that people say, like, and they think it's true. But that was, I think, I think that was one of the good things I learned in school was, how to research and everything, you know, make sure everything was credible, the credibility on something. Like, I learned a lot about that. That's it, man. It's really, do you know, and it's really interesting hearing everything you're saying. It's very inspirational to many people listening to myself, and I'm sure a lot of your students are feeding it back to you, and you're seeing it in them and what they're turning out to be. Oh yeah, and... like, like the kids, some of the kids I train, like the 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 mom, the mom, the parents, they all come in. And they're like, they want to know what I'm doing because they all listen. Like, they're like, like these kids have all changed. Like. Like one of the parents, they they give the their, their, the kids the money to go do the grocery shopping because they, they they understand more about nutrition than the mom and dad. And then <laughs> yeah. just like it said, like in general, like they do now, they're doing really good in school, and it's because they tell them too, like they don't want to miss boxing because if they don't fucking 
if they don't do good in school, they can't come to train and they don't want to miss training. But then it's also another thing I tell, I, I explained to, to the two boys I trained last night. I was telling them like, what happens is your body learns to deal with stress. I'm like, when you work out, like you're just dealing with stress. Like when you start hitting that fatigue, you know what I mean? Like you learn to fight the fatigue and just work through it. Now that's the same thing now with, with schoolwork. Something's just stressing you out and you just keep drilling and drilling and trying to figure it out. But you're so used to that stress now from just the working out. The, the drilling of it in school, it doesn't even bother you anymore. You know what I mean? Like you're immune to it. And fuck, like the stress of working out, it's a lot more stressful than, you know, like, oh, fuck, I don't understand this. Like, cause that's, that's the only, that's the end of it. I don't understand this. When you're, you're that next rep, one more, one more, one more, like that stresses you out. But it's like, fuck, I don't understand this. Okay. What else? This, this, this. you know what I mean? It's, it's just easier. Yeah, man. yeah, man. It's interesting the way you put it as well, you know, and, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, mate, people, I, I've said it already in this podcast already, mate, but people need to listen to what you're saying because you're definitely giving the right messages out to people. You know, even if people are seeing you as someone who's doing bare knuckle fighting, it just shows just because you do bare knuckle fighting, you're there to earn a living and you're still giving the right messages back to people. Well, yeah, yeah. it's like everyone thinks like fighters, like we're done. Like I had teachers, like when I was going to school, the teachers would tell me like, dude, why do you fight? You're, you're very intelligent. And I was like, well, fuck if. If, if if being smart means you can, you're gonna be a millionaire, then why the fuck do you teach? Why aren't you a millionaire? You know what I mean? Like I'm like I fight because I enjoy it. I love doing it. I'm like as you know you you, you do what you love. Don't don't let something draw, draw you because it's gonna give you money, but you're not happy. Like I tell you, I'm happy at the end of the day training, training others, working, fuck fighting, like. So you gotta do what you love, mate. As you said, don't oh, feel yeah. like it's work. Don't don't you'll never work a day in your life, mate, if you do what oh, you yeah. love. And that's what's the most important thing. And you're still doing what you love. And from the way you're talking, you've got plenty of years left. And you don't listen to any of those people oh, saying yeah. you need to retire and stuff. You know when you're going to retire. It's as simple as that. If you put, I'm going to retire for my next fight, next fight, like you said, yeah. you're going to have that doubt in your mind. And you know what? Do what you've got to do, um, Stefan. And you know what? You've been doing it your whole career. You never let anything, any adversity knock you back. You know what I mean? And oh, you've yeah. always just pushed for anything, you know, from your losses to your great wins against fantastic fighters, mate. What a great experience your life's been. And, Best get the book ready, mate. Do you know what I mean? Well, it's all about learning. You just, it's just gather, learn, like life. It's just it's all about learning. And you pass, like you said, the way I'm passing it on to these new kids. Like, yeah. It, it's making life easier for them already. And that's how you evolve. Everybody worries. It, like, I, 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 I play these, these videos of Bruce Lee when he talks about how everybody wants tradition. Tradition. This is a traditional way of doing it. Well, guess what? When you have tradition, you no longer evolve because that's just not tradition. That's just not how you do it. No, man. No, that's it, mate. That's it. Well said, well said. And I'll tell you what thing here. One thing, last thing I want to ask you, mate, which is always important as well to me, <laughs> not as important as some of the stuff <clears throat> you said. Where did the nickname come from? I'm always interested to learn these things about you guys. Who gave the nickname? Did you come with it yourself? Uh, no, it was these old trainers I had. It just uh, it was because they would have me. Like, <laughs> I was just <laughs> some guy off the street. Like, I just got out of the military, and I showed up to this gym. And then I literally just started beating the shit out of all his UFC fighters. But I mean, guys that outweighed me by two, that guys that were fighting at 205, 185, and they they just hated to spar me because like I'm gonna fight, like you know what I mean? Like I said, like if we're mm. sparring, like you're trying to hurt me and I'm gonna try to hurt you. So if yeah. I said if you got in there, I'm gonna do terrible things to you. I didn't so where care. Did, where did El Terrible or El Terrible come from then? <laughs> Well, that's that's what basically was from. I'm gonna do that's terrible it. things to who, you. Who, who, who you get in there with me. Who, I'm gonna do terrible to things you? to you. Did someone give uh, it to you in particular? One of my old trainers. Yeah. It's it was yeah. I said I don't, I don't even like to associate with those guys anymore. I just. No worries. But no, I, but still I, though, you kept the nickname that? though. You kept the nickname though. That's the main. Oh thing. yeah, it's just it's just like everyone knew me by that now. That's it, mate. And I'll tell you what, you're doing. You're definitely doing devastating things in your fights as well. And I can't wait to see your next fight with Valor. You know, I love Ken Shamrock. Uh, I've, I remember watching him when I was a kid in WWF. For God's sake, you uh, know, the yeah. fake stuff. You know, doing the doing the ankle lock. Still the well, world's most terrible. dangerous man. Say that, I'm like, yeah, they're not trying to hurt each other, but I'm like, you guys don't realize like the fucking danger that it is. Like, did you watch King Velasquez his last wrestling match? I did, mate. Fair play to him. He's quite athletic for a big guy. He, he did good, but that's here's here's the thing I tell everybody. Like, this is where, like, with 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 um, Kane, it's like, how does he have all these injuries that they talk about? But you see some of the shit he was doing. Yeah, I'm like, man. dude, how do you have those injuries? But you're doing all this high flying stuff. And as I said, it's not that that he's getting old or he's injured or hurt. It's just he's got bullshit training he's doing. 
to me, I like when I look at AKA, I look at them. It's what are they known for? DC, Cain Velasquez, and what do those guys do though? They're fucking wrestlers, but it's called American Kickboxing Academy. <laughs> it's an interesting way to put it. Just like, well, well, that's that. a, it's it's just a point. Nobody looks at it that way. People look at it like like dummies. People, they're 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 sheep. They 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 fucking they do what they're told. You know, the sheep boy. But yeah, like I said, just think about how I put you that way. You're like, oh shit! Like you've got a point there. Yeah. They go to American Kickboxing Academy, but they're known for their wrestling. <laughs> Saying it as it is, man. That's it. But look, 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 that's the same thing too. Look at Cain Velasquez. Like that's how you know those guys don't know what the fuck they're doing. Kane's last UFC fight. What the fuck is he doing throwing kicks? Everyone's talking about how bad his knees are, and this motherfucker's throwing kicks to start the fight off. Now tell me that's not bad trainers. <laughs> I see what you mean. See, you're like, holy shit, like that makes that makes sense. <laughs> but the, the way so see, this is the way everybody else will take it. Like, oh well, he's just talking shit. I'm like, no, it, it makes sense. Like, I just, you don't, you can't even argue with me. You're like. Fuck, this guy's got a point. Yeah, no, I'm sitting here like and thinking, yeah, right, this actually guy's right. <laughs> <laughs> but no one, no one like speechless. Everyone's like, oh well, it was AK. Like they're known for fucking the fighters. Like, well, their fighters haven't been doing that good. The only one's doing good right now is DC. But same thing. What does DC do? He does uses his wrestling. How many head kicks have you seen DC throw? <laughs> you know what yes. I mean? We'll see what happens this weekend again. You know, be interesting to yeah. see what happens it's this really weekend. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting fights. Like. I like Steppy, you know, he's a good guy, uh, he's respectable. Eh, DC, you know what I mean, he's, I used to like him back in the day, but I just, I just became not a fan as much. Ah, uh, fuck, John, John Jones, John Jones knocking the fuck out again, I think. <laughs> John Jones just has his number. Like, it's like a type of that mental thing, like, in his head, it's in his head that John Jones got his number. And he's, he's done. <laughs> You'll no, never beat is, John Jones. That is a problem, yeah, you're right. That is the issue, unfortunately. But he won't fight John Jones again. He'll fight Stipe and retire, I reckon. He's not going to get Brock Lesnar, which is what he really wants, which is big money. But he'll get Stipe. Hey, hey, that's all he's looking if, for. If he wins, he'll retire and do his commentary stuff, I think. Definitely. Hey, he might become a bare-knuckle fighter. You never know. I don't see him bare-knuckle fighting because he broke his hand. I think he broke, didn't he break both his hands when he fought fucking... He broke his hands when he, he fought a couple times. He broke his hand when he fought uh, Josh Barnett in Strike Force. He broke his hand when he fought fucking, uh, who the hell else did he fight? I thought he broke his hand once in the UFC too, didn't he? I can't remember off the top of my head who it was against, though, but I think, yeah, he did break his hand. But I can't remember who it was against. But and was see, after he started breaking his hands more and more, he stopped fucking punching. He, he didn't punch as much as he used to. And he just started using his wrestling more. No, that's it. So yeah, maybe maybe not the bare knuckle fight boxing world, but I tell you what, his last knockout was he did was it clinched the back of the head, the bit of dirty boxing. <laughs> he got yeah. it. One, he got it with one of them. But we'll see no, if he'll be able to we'll do that what again. Was the last fight. Not his last fight. Sorry, the one before. But his last fight was Stipe. No, no, he fought someone after Stipe. Then he fought the. No, no, yeah, he fought someone off Stipe. He fought um, oh, God, the black um, guy. What's his name? Uh, the Black Beast. Derek Lewis. Um, Derek Lewis. That's yeah, it. yeah, Derek Lewis. Yes, there you go. So there's, there's not much competition for him really too much at the moment, but we have to wait and see what happens with well, that. Well, it's know? just like, like, like from a competition wise, like you got to think like at a heavyweight, like everyone talks about how the baddest man heavyweight, like no, there's not very men that are that big. Like the men that are that big, the the, the prime athletes that are heavyweights, guess where they're at? They're in the NFL making millions. They're in the fucking NBA making millions. They're not fucking worried about getting beat up and getting paid a couple bucks here and there. You know what I mean? The prime athletes are making millions. And then, fuck, the leftovers trickle down into boxing, trickle down into, like, our sports, you know what I mean? Trickle down into fighting. A lot of people don't like fighting. No, that's the problem. You Especially know, the is... roads. Like, the roads you got to pave to do it. Like, like people don't understand. Like, with boxers, a lot of boxers. Fuck, look at Lomachenko. I don't know if it was, like, 396 and one. It's crazy. It, it just... You, you get the road you got to pay, and a lot of guys don't want to fucking deal with that. Like, okay, I'll, I'll play football instead. I'll play basketball. Like, that's where yeah, like, prime athletes are it's, ours, it's, you know? It's like, yeah, man, it's like in the UK, you know, football soccer players are getting like, some of them are getting like, oh, the highest paid one, sometimes getting like a million pound a week. Yeah. You know, that's like, it's crazy. Fuck, I'm going to go play soccer shit. 
Yeah, mate, just, just, just get tapped on the ankle, roll around and cry for an hour, and then sit on the bench for the season and get paid yeah. 300 grand a week. Happy days. What a show. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm retiring. I'm going to come out there and yeah. do a bare knuckle fight and then. They, yeah, we'll man, they the all... soccer team. We'll try out for the soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, well, mate, the American girls won the World Cup, mate. Fair play to them. You know, so it's getting yeah. bigger over there. But I, I'll tell you what, it's, uh, um, Stefan, mate, it's, it's been great chatting to you, mate. It's actually. Um, Actually, I can't believe how much time's gone by, mate. It's been great. I've been really lost in what you've been saying, and it's really interesting, inspirational, um, the way your output is on fight. And I really wish, hope people, when they listen to this, they realise that just because you're a fighter, a bare-knuckle fighter, it doesn't mean that you're not sending out the right message to all the, pe- the younger generation coming through and also other people you're training, and that you are just a normal person like every other fighter out there, you know? And that's oh, what yeah. it's all about, man. So I'll tell you what, mate, I'll give you an opportunity now. Just give a shout out to any people you know that have maybe helped you get to where you are, any sponsors, and where people can follow you on social networks as well, mate, and see what you're getting up to. Eh, I'm good. I don't have really any sponsors. I just do it on my own. You know, I have just struggles and pains, and I guess that's it. Well, no, but, and where can people follow you on your social networks and stuff? Because I know you put some funny videos out there and funny pictures. Oh, shit, I don't know. I have a Facebook and an Instagram you know, I don't even know what my Instagram name is but my Facebook it's just my fight name is Seven Pion but yeah I don't, I don't really know like, I'm <laughs> I, I can I can put, post stupid shit I understand some of the things but I don't understand what I do have the time just just do it <laughs> well I find it entertaining man do you know what I mean I love seeing you punching poles and showing all that stuff it's great <laughs> lovely to see you. I find it very funny and interesting to watch man no pain man it's just great you know you have no, a good yeah. feed of things you can, you, you're not you're being very modest mate you put some interesting entertaining stuff up I think you do anyway so I encourage people to follow him and have a little look at what he does it's, it's good it's good stuff to see and also make sure they follow your gym and you know and I hope they listen to the good things you do and it helps and it promotes more people to come down and see you mate alright <laughs> Cool, well thank you very much and I really look forward to seeing you next fight. Alright, talk to you later. Cool, thank you again for your time, really appreciate it mate. Alright, bye.